Chapter One of North and South. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. First published in serial form in Household Words in 1854 to 1855, and in volume form in 1855. On its appearance in Household Words, this tale was obliged to conform to the conditions imposed by the requirements of a weekly publication, and likewise to confine itself within certain advertised limits, in order that faith might be kept with the public. Although these conditions were made as light as they well could be, the author found it impossible to develop the story in the manner originally intended, and, more especially, was compelled to hurry on events with an improbable rapidity towards the close. In some degree to remedy this obvious defect, various short passages have been inserted, and several new chapters added. With this brief explanation, the tale is commended to the kindness of the reader. Beseeking him lowly, of mercy and pity, of its rude making to have compassion. CHAPTER One, HASTE TO THE WEDDING Wooed and married in A. Edith? said Margaret gently. Edith. But as Margaret half suspected, Edith had fallen asleep. She lay curled up on the sofa in the back drawing-room in Harley Street, looking very lovely in her white muslin and blue ribbons. If Titana had ever been dressed in white muslin and blue ribbons, and had fallen asleep on a crimson damask sofa in the back drawing-room, Edith might have been taken for her. Margaret was struck afresh by her cousin's beauty. They had grown up together from childhood, and all along Edith had been remarked upon by everyone, except Margaret, for her prettiness. But Margaret had never thought about it, until the last few days, when the prospect of soon losing her companion seemed to give force to every sweet quality and charm which Edith possessed. They had been talking about wedding dresses, and wedding ceremonies, and Captain Lennox, and what he had told Edith about her future life at Corfu, where his regiment was stationed and the difficulty of keeping a piano in good tune, a difficulty which Edith seemed to consider as one of the most formidable that could befall her in her married life, and what gowns she should want in the visits to Scotland, which would immediately succeed her marriage. But the whispered tone had lately become more drowsy, and Margaret, after a pause of a few minutes, found, as she fancied, that in spite of the buzz in the next room, Edith had rolled herself up into a soft ball of muslin and ribbon and silken curls, and gone off into a peaceful little after-dinner nap. Margaret had been on the point of telling her cousin of some of the plans and visions which she entertained as to her future life in the country parsonage, where her father and mother lived, and where her bright holidays had always been passed, though for the past ten years her Aunt Shaw's house had been considered as her home. But in default of a listener, she had to brood over the change in her life silently, as heretofore. It was a happy brooding, although tinged with regret at being separated for an indefinite time from her gentle aunt and dear cousin. As she thought of the delight of filling the important post of only daughter in Helston Parsonage, pieces of the conversation out of the next room came upon her ears. Her aunt Shaw was talking to the five or six ladies who had been dining there, and whose husbands were still in the dining-room. They were the familiar acquaintances of the house, neighbors whom Mrs. Shaw called friends, because she happened to dine with them more frequently than with any other people, and because if she or Edith wanted anything from them, or they from her, they did not scruple to make a call at each other's houses before luncheon. These ladies and their husbands were invited, in their capacity of friends, to eat a farewell dinner in honor of Edith's approaching marriage. Edith had rather objected to this arrangement, for Captain Lennox was expected to arrive by a late train this very evening, but, although she was a spoiled child, she was too careless and idle to have a very strong will of her own, and gave way when she found that her mother had absolutely ordered those extra delicacies of the season which are always supposed to be efficacious against immoderate grief at farewell dinners. She contented herself by leaning back in her chair, merely playing with the food on her plate, and looking grave and absent, while all around her were enjoying the mots of Mr. Gray the gentleman who always took the bottom of the table at Mrs. Shaw's dinner-parties, and asked Edith to give them some music in the drawing-room. 
Mr. Gray was particularly agreeable over this farewell dinner, and the gentlemen stayed downstairs longer than usual. It was very well they did, to judge from the fragments of conversation which Margaret overheard. I suffered too much myself, not that I was not extremely happy with the poor dear general, but still disparity of age is a drawback, one that I was resolved Edith should not have to encounter. Of course, without any maternal partiality, I foresaw that the dear child was likely to marry early. Indeed, I have often said that I was sure she would be married before she was nineteen. I had quite a prophetic feeling when Captain Lennox, and here the voice dropped into a whisper, but Margaret could easily supply the blank. The course of true love in Edith's case had run remarkably smooth. Mrs. Shaw had given way to the presentiment, as she expressed it, and had rather urged on the marriage, although it was below the expectations which many of Edith's acquaintances had formed for her, a young and pretty heiress. But Mrs. Shaw said that her only child should marry for love, and sighed emphatically, as if love had not been her motive in marrying the general. Mrs. Shaw enjoyed the romance of the present engagement rather more than her daughter. Not but that Edith was very thoroughly and properly in love. Still, she would certainly have preferred a good house in Belgravia to all the picturesqueness of the life which Captain Lennox described at Corfu. The very parts which made Margaret glow as she listened, Edith pretended to shiver and shudder at, partly for the pleasure she had in being coaxed out of her dislike by her fond lover, and partly because anything of a gypsy or makeshift life was really distasteful to her. Yet had any one come with a fine house, and a fine estate, and a fine title to boot, Edith would still have clung to Captain Lennox while the temptation lasted. When it was over, it is possible that she might have had little qualms of ill-concealed regret that Captain Lennox could not have united in his person everything that was desirable. In this she was but her mother's child, who, after deliberately marrying General Shaw with no warmer feeling than respect for his character and establishment, was constantly, though quietly, bemoaning her hard lot in being united to one whom she could not love. "'I have spared no expense in her trousseau,' were the next words Margaret heard. "'She has all the beautiful Indian shawls and scarves that the General gave to me, but which I shall never wear again.' "'She is a lucky girl,' replied another voice, which Margaret knew to be that of Mrs. Gibson, a lady who was taking a double interest in the conversation from the fact of one of her daughters having been married within the last few weeks. Helen had set her part upon an Indian shawl, but really when I found what an extravagant price was asked, I was obliged to refuse her. She will be quite envious when she hears of Edith having Indian shawls. What kind are they, Delhi, with the lovely little borders? Margaret heard her aunt's voice again, but this time it was as if she had raised herself up from her half-recumbent position, and were looking into the more dimly lighted back drawing-room. "'Edith! Edith!' cried she, and then she sank as if wearied by the exertion. Margaret stepped forward. "'Edith is asleep, Aunt Shaw. Is there anything I can do?' All the ladies said, "'Poor child!' on receiving this distressing intelligence about Edith, and the minute lapdog in Mrs. Shaw's arms began to bark, as if excited by the burst of pity. "'Hush, Tiny! You naughty little girl! You will waken your mistress! It was only to ask Edith if she would tell Newton to bring down her shawls. Perhaps you would go, Margaret, dear.' Margaret went up into the old nursery at the very top of the house, where Newton was busy getting up some laces which were required for the wedding. While Newton went— not without a muttered grumbling, to undo the shawls, which had already been exhibited four or five times that day. Margaret looked round upon the nursery, the first room in the house with which she had become familiar nine years ago, when she was brought, all untamed from the forest, to share the home, the play, and the lessons of her cousin Edith. She remembered the dark, dim look of the London nursery, presided over by an austere and ceremonious nurse, who was terribly particular about clean hands and torn frocks. She recollected the first tea up there, separate from her father and aunt, who were dining somewhere down below an infinite depth of stairs, for unless she were up in the sky, the child thought, they must be deep down in the bowels of the earth. At home, before she came to live in Harley Street, her mother's dressing-room had been her nursery, and, as they kept early hours in the country parsonage, Margaret had always had her meals with her father and mother. Oh, 
well did the tall stately girl of eighteen remember the tears shed with such wild passion of grief by the little girl of nine as she hid her face under the bedclothes in that first night and how she was bidden not to cry by the nurse because it would disturb miss edith and how she had cried as bitterly but more quietly till her newly seen grand pretty aunt had come softly upstairs with mr hale to show him his little sleeping daughter then the little margaret had hushed her sobs and tried to lie quiet as if asleep for fear of making her father unhappy by her grief which she dared not express before her aunt and which she rather thought it was wrong to feel at all after the long hoping and planning and contriving they had gone through at home before her wardrobe could be arranged so as to suit her grander circumstances and before papa could leave his parish to come up to london even for a few days now she had got to love the old nursery though it was but a dismantled place and she looked all around with a kind of cat-like regret at the idea of leaving it for ever in three days ah newton said she i think we shall all be sorry to leave this dear old room indeed miss i shan't for one my eyes are not so good as they were and the light here is so bad that i can't see to mend laces except just at the window where there's always a shocking draught enough to give one one's death of cold well i dare say you will have both good light and plenty of warmth at naples you must keep as much of your darning as you can till then thank you newton i can take them down you're busy so margaret went down laden with shawls and snuffing up their spicy eastern smell her aunt asked her to stand as a sort of lay figure on which to display them as edith was still asleep no one thought about it but margaret's tall finely made figure in the black silk dress which she was wearing as mourning for some distant relative of her father's set off the long beautiful folds of the gorgeous shawls that would have half smothered edith margaret stood right under the chandelier quite silent and passive while her aunt adjusted the draperies occasionally as she was turned round she caught a glimpse of herself in the mirror over the chimney-piece and smiled at her own appearance there the familiar features in the usual garb of a princess she touched the shawls gently as they hung around her and took a pleasure in their soft feel and their brilliant colours and rather liked to be dressed in such splendour enjoying it much as a child would do with a quiet pleased smile on her lips just then the door opened and mr henry lennox was suddenly announced some of the ladies started back as if half ashamed of their feminine interest in dress mrs shaw held out her hand to the newcomer margaret stood perfectly still thinking she might yet be wanted as a sort of block for the shaws but looking at mr lennox with a bright amused face as if sure of his sympathy in her sense of the ludicrousness at being thus surprised her aunt was so much absorbed in asking mr henry lennox who had not been able to come to dinner all sorts of questions about his brother the bridegroom his sister the bridesmaid coming with the captain from scotland for the occasion and various other members of the lennox family that margaret saw she was no more wanted as shawl-bearer and devoted herself to the amusement of the other visitors whom her aunt had for the moment forgotten almost immediately edith came in from the back drawing-room winking and blinking her eyes at the stronger light shaking back her slightly ruffled curls and altogether looking like the sleeping beauty just startled from her dreams even in her slumber she had instinctively felt that a lennox was worth rousing herself for and she had a multitude of questions to ask about dear janet the future unseen sister-in-law for whom she professed so much affection that if margaret had not been very proud she might have almost felt jealous of the mushroom rival as margaret sank rather more into the background on her aunt's joining the conversation she saw henry lennox directing his look towards a vacant seat near her and she knew perfectly well that as soon as edith released him from her questioning he would take possession of that chair she had not been quite sure from her aunt's rather confused account of his engagements whether he would come that night it was almost a surprise to see him and now she was sure of a pleasant evening he liked and disliked pretty nearly all the same things that she did margaret's face was lightened up into an honest open brightness by and by he came she received him with a smile which had not a tinge of shyness or self-consciousness in it well i suppose you are all in the depths of business ladies business i mean very different to my business which is the real true law business 
Playing with shaws is very different work to drawing up settlements. Ah, I knew how you would be amused to find us all so occupied in admiring finery. But really, Indian shaws are very perfect things of their kind. I have no doubt they are. Their prices are very perfect, too. Nothing wanting. The gentlemen came dropping in one by one, and the buzz and noise deepened in tone. This is your last dinner party, is it not? There are no more before Thursday. No, I think after this evening we shall feel at rest, which I am sure I have not done for many weeks. At least, that kind of rest when the hands have nothing more to do, and all the arrangements are complete for an event which must occupy one's head and heart. I shall be glad to have time to think, and I am sure Edith will. I am not so sure about her, but I can fancy that you will. Whenever I have seen you lately, you have been carried away by a whirlwind of some other person's making. Yes, said Margaret, rather sadly, remembering the never-ending commotion about trifles that had been going on for more than a month past. I wonder if a marriage must always be preceded by what you call a whirlwind, or whether in some cases there might not rather be a calm and peaceful time just before it. Cinderella's godmother ordering the trousseau, the wedding breakfast, writing the notes of invitation, for instance, said Mr. Lennox, laughing. But are all these quite necessary troubles? asked Margaret, looking up straight at him for an answer. A sense of indescribable weariness of all the arrangements for a pretty effect, in which Edith had been busied as supreme authority for the last six weeks, oppressed her just now and she really wanted some one to help her to a few pleasant, quiet ideas connected with a marriage. "'Oh, of course,' he replied, with a change to gravity in his tone. "'There are forms and ceremonies to be gone through, not so much to satisfy oneself as to stop the world's mouth, without which stoppage there would be very little satisfaction in life. But how would you have a wedding arranged?' "'Oh, I have never thought much about it, only I should like it to be a very fine summer morning, and I should like to walk to church, through the shade of trees, and not to have so many bridesmaids, and to have no wedding breakfast. I dare say I am resolving against the very things that have given me the most trouble just now. No, I don't think you are. The idea of stately simplicity accords well with your character. Margaret did not quite like this speech. She winced away from it more from remembering former occasions on which he had tried to lead her into a discussion, in which he took the complimentary part, about her own character and ways of going on. She cut his speech rather short by saying, "'It is natural for me to think of Hellstone Church, and the walk to it, rather than of driving up to a London church in the middle of a paved street.' "'Tell me about Hellstone. You have never described it to me. I should like some idea of the place you will be living in, when ninety-six Harley Street will be looking dingy and dirty, and dull, and shut up. Is Helstone a village, or a town, in the first place? Oh, only a hamlet. I don't think I could call it a village at all. There's the church, and a few houses near it on the green. Cottages, rather, with roses growing all over them. And flowering all the year round, especially at Christmas. Make your picture complete, said he. No replied Margaret, somewhat annoyed. I am not making a picture. I am trying to describe Hellstone as it really is. You should not have said that. I am penitent, he answered. Only it really sounded like a village in a tale, rather than in real life. And so it is, replied Margaret, eagerly. All the other places in England that I have seen seem so hard and prosaic-looking after the new forest. Hellstone is like a village in a poem in one of Tennyson's poems. But I won't try and describe it any more. You would only laugh at me if I told you what I think of it, what it really is. Indeed, I would not. But I see you are going to be very resolved. Well, then, tell me that which I should like still better, to know what the parsonage is like. Oh, I can't describe my home. It is home, and I can't put its charm into words. I submit. You are rather severe to-night, Margaret. How? said she, turning her large, soft eyes round full upon him. I did not know I was. Why, because I made an unlucky remark, you will neither tell me what Hellstone is like, nor will you say anything about your home, 
though I have told you how much I want to hear about both, the latter especially. But indeed, I cannot tell you about my own home. I don't quite think it is a thing to be talked about, unless you knew it. Well, then, pausing for a moment, tell me what you do there. Here you read, have lessons, or otherwise improve your mind, till the middle of the day, take a walk before lunch, go a drive with your aunt after, and have some kind of engagement in the evening. There, now fill up your day at Hellstone. Shall you ride, drive, or walk? Walk, decidedly. We have no horse, not even for Papa. He walks to the very extremity of his parish. The walks are so beautiful, it would be a shame to drive, almost a shame to ride. Shall you garden much? That, I believe, is a proper employment for young ladies in the country. I don't know. I am afraid I shan't like such hard work. Archery parties? Picnics? Race balls? Hunt balls? Oh, no, she said, laughing. Papa's living is very small, and even if we were near such things, I doubt if I should go to them. I see. You won't tell me anything. You will only tell me that you are not going to do this and that. Before the vacation ends, I think I shall pay you a call and see what you really do employ yourself in. I hope you will. Then you will see for yourself how beautiful Hellstone is. Now I must go. Edith is sitting down to play, and I know just enough of music to turn over the leaves for her. And besides, Aunt Shaw won't like us to talk. Edith played brilliantly. In the middle of the piece the door half opened, and Edith saw Captain Lennox hesitating whether to come in. She threw down her music and rushed out of the room, leaving Margaret standing confused and blushing to explain to the astonished guests what vision had shown itself to cause Edith's sudden flight. Captain Lennox had come earlier than was expected. Or was it really so late? They looked at their watches, were duly shocked, and took their leave. Then Edith came back, glowing with pleasure, half shyly, half proudly leading in her tall, handsome captain. His brother shook hands with him, and Mrs. Shaw welcomed him in her gentle, kindly way, which had always something plaintive in it arising from the long habit of considering herself a victim to an uncongenial marriage. Now that, the general being gone, she had every good of life, with as few drawbacks as possible, she had been rather perplexed to find an anxiety, if not a sorrow. She had, however, of late settled upon her own health as a source of apprehension. She had a nervous little cough whenever she thought about it, and some complacent doctor had ordered her just what she desired a winter in Italy. Mrs. Shaw had as strong wishes as most people, but she never liked doing anything from the open and acknowledged motive of her own good will and pleasure. She preferred being compelled to gratify herself by some other person's command or desire. She really did persuade herself that she was submitting to some hard external necessity, and thus she was able to moan and complain in her soft manner, all the time she was in reality doing just what she liked. It was in this way she began to speak of her own journey to Captain Lennox, who assented, as in duty bound, to all his future mother-in-law said, while his eyes sought Edith, who was busying herself in rearranging the tea-table, and ordering up all sorts of good things, in spite of his assurances that he had dined within the last two hours. Mr. Henry Lennox stood leaning against the chimney-piece, amused with the family scene. He was close by his handsome brother, he was the plain one in a singularly good-looking family. But his face was intelligent, keen, and mobile. And now and then Margaret wondered what it was that he could be thinking about, while he kept silence, but was evidently observing, with an interest that was slightly sarcastic, all that Edith and she were doing. The sarcastic feeling was called out by Mrs. Shaw's conversation with his brother. It was separate from the interest which was excited by what he saw. He thought it a pretty sight to see two cousins so busy in their little arrangements about the table. Edith chose to do most herself. She was in a humor to enjoy showing her lover how well she could behave as a soldier's wife. She found out that the water in the urn was cold, and ordered up the kitchen tea-kettle, the only consequence of which was that when she met it at the door and tried to carry it in, it was too heavy for her, and she came in pouting, with a black mark on her muslin gown, and a little round white hand indented by the handle, which she took to show Captain Lennox, just like a hurt child, and, of course, the remedy was the same in both cases. 
margaret's quickly adjusted spirit lamp was the most efficacious contrivance though not so like the gypsy encampment which edith in some of her moods chose to consider the nearest resemblance to a barrack life after this evening all was bustle till the wedding was over End of chapter 1「Chapter Two Roses and Thorns By the soft green light in the woody glade, On the banks of moss where thy childhood played, By the household tree through which thine eye First looked in love to the summer sky. Mrs. Hemans Margaret was once more in her morning dress, travelling quietly home with her father, who had come up to assist at the wedding. Her mother had been detained at home by a multitude of half-reasons, none of which anybody fully understood, except Mr. Hale, who was perfectly aware that all his arguments in favour of a grey satin gown, which was midway between oldness and newness, had proved unavailing, and that, as he had not the money to equip his wife afresh, from top to toe, she would not show herself at her only sister's only child's wedding. If Mrs. Shaw had guessed at the real reason why Mrs. Hale did not accompany her husband, she would have showered down gowns upon her, but it was nearly twenty years since Mrs. Shaw had been the poor, pretty Miss Beersford, and she had really forgotten all grievances, except that of the unhappiness arising from disparity of age in married life, on which she could descant by the half-hour. Dearest Maria had married the man of her heart, only eight years older than herself, with the sweetest temper and that blue-black hair one so seldom sees. Mr. Hale was one of the most delightful preachers she had ever heard, and a perfect model of a parish priest. Perhaps it was not quite a logical deduction from all these premises, but it was still Mrs. Shaw's characteristic conclusion, as she thought over her sister's lot. Married for love— what can dearest Maria have to wish for in this world? Mrs. Hale, if she spoke truth, might have answered with a ready-made list. A silver-gray glace silk, a white chip bonnet, oh, dozens of things for the wedding, and hundreds of things for the house. Margaret only knew that her mother had not found it convenient to come, and she was not sorry to think that their meeting and greeting would take place at Helstone Parsonage, rather than, during the confusion of the last two or three days, in the house in Harley Street, where she herself had had to play the part of Figaro, and was wanted everywhere at one and the same time. Her mind and body ached now with the recollection of all she had done and said within the last forty-eight hours. The farewell so hurriedly taken, amongst all the other good-byes, of those she had lived with so long, oppressed her now with a sad regret for the times that were no more. It did not signify what those times had been. They were gone, never to return. Margaret's heart felt more heavy than she could have ever thought it possible in going to her own dear home, the place and the life she had longed for for years, at that time of all times for yearning and longing, just before the sharp senses lose their outlines in sleep. She took her mind away with a wrench from the recollection of the past, to the bright serene contemplation of the hopeful future. Her eyes began to see, not visions of what had been, but the sight actually before her, her dear father leaning back asleep in the railway carriage. His blue-black hair was grey now, and lay thinly over his brows. The bones of his face were plainly to be seen, too plainly for beauty, if his features had been less finely cut. As it was, they had a grace if not a comeliness of their own. The face was in repose, but it was rather rest after weariness than the serene calm of the countenance of one who led a placid, contented life. Margaret was painfully struck by the worn, anxious expression, and she went back over the open and avowed circumstances of her father's life, to find the cause for the lines that spoke so plainly of habitual distress and depression. "'Poor Frederick,' thought she, sighing. "'Oh!' If Frederick had but been a clergyman, instead of going into the navy, and been lost to us all. I wish I knew all about it. I never understood it from Aunt Shaw. I only knew that he could not come back to England because of that terrible affair. Poor dear Papa! 
how sad he looks i am so glad i am going home to be at hand to comfort him and mamma she was ready with a bright smile in which there was not a trace of fatigue to greet her father when he awakened he smiled back again but faintly as if it were an unusual exertion his face returned into its lines of habitual anxiety he had a trick of half opening his mouth as if to speak which constantly unsettled the form of the lips and gave the face an undecided expression but he had the same large soft eyes as his daughter eyes which moved slowly and almost grandly round in their orbits and were well veiled by their transparent white eyelids margaret was more like him than like her mother sometimes people wondered that parents so handsome should have a daughter who was so far from regularly beautiful not beautiful at all was occasionally said her mouth was wide no rosebud that could only open just enough to let out a yes and no and a and please you sir but the wide mouth was one soft curve of rich red lips and the skin if not white and fair was of an ivory smoothness and delicacy if the look on her face was in general too dignified and reserved for one so young now talking to her father it was bright as the morning full of dimples and glances that spoke of childish gladness and boundless hope in the future it was the latter part of july when margaret returned home the forest trees were all one dark full dusky green the fern below them caught all the slanting sunbeams the weather was sultry and broodingly still margaret used to tramp along by her father's side crushing down the fern with a cruel glee as she felt it yield under her light foot and send up the fragrance peculiar to it out on the broad commons into the warm scented light seeing multitudes of wild free living creatures revelling in the sunshine and the herbs and flowers it called forth this life at least these walks realized all margaret's anticipations she took a pride in her forest its people were her people she made hearty friends with them learned and delighted in using their peculiar words took up her freedom amongst them, nursed their babies, talked or read with slow distinctness to their old people, carried dainty messes to their sick, resolved before long to teach at the school, where her father went every day, as to an appointed task, but she was continually tempted off to go and see some individual friend, man, woman, or child, in some cottage in the green shade of the forest. Her out-of-doors life was perfect, her indoors life had its drawbacks, with the healthy shame of a child she blamed herself for her keenness of sight in perceiving all that was not as it should be there her mother her mother always so kind and tender towards her seemed now and then so much discontented with their situation thought that the bishop strangely neglected his episcopal duties in not giving mr hale a better living and almost reproached her husband because he could not bring himself to say that he wished to leave the parish and undertake the charge of a larger he would sigh aloud as he answered that if he could do what he ought in little hellstone he should be thankful but every day he was more overpowered the world became more bewildering at each repeated urgency of his wife that he would put himself in the way of seeking some preferment margaret saw that her father shrank more and more and she strove at such times to reconcile her mother to hellstone mrs hale said that the near neighbourhood of so many trees affected her health and margaret would try to tempt her forth on to the beautiful broad upland sun-streaked cloud-shadowed common for she was sure that her mother had accustomed herself too much to an indoors life seldom extending her walks beyond the church the school and the neighbouring cottages this did good for a time but when the autumn drew on and the weather became more changeable her mother's idea of the unhealthiness of the place increased and she repined even more frequently that her husband who was more learned than mr hume a better parish priest than mr hounsworth should not have met with the preferment that these two former neighbours of theirs had done this marring of the peace of home by long hours of discontent was what margaret was unprepared for she knew and had rather revelled in the idea that she should have to give up many luxuries which had only been troubles and trammels to her freedom in harley street her keen enjoyment of every sensuous pleasure was balanced finely if not overbalanced by her conscious pride in being able to do without them all if need were 
but the cloud never came in that quarter of the horizon from which we watch for it. There had been slight complaints and passing regrets on her mother's part over some trifle connected with Hellstone and her father's position there, when Margaret had been spending her holidays at home before. But in the general happiness of the recollection of those times she had forgotten the small details which were not so pleasant. In the latter half of September the autumnal rains and storms came on, and Margaret was obliged to remain more in the house than she had hitherto done. Hellstone was at some distance from any neighbours of their own standard of cultivation. "'It is undoubtedly one of the most out-of-the-way places in England,' said Mrs. Hale, in one of her plaintive moods. "'I can't help regretting constantly that Papa has really no one to associate with here. He is so thrown away, seeing no one but farmers and labourers from week's end to week's end.' If only we lived at the other side of the parish, it would be something. There we should be almost within walking distance of the Stansfields. Certainly the Gormans would be within a walk. Gormans, said Margaret, are those the Gormans who made their fortunes in trade at Southampton? Oh, I'm glad we don't visit them. I don't like shoppy people. I think we are far better off knowing only cottagers and labourers and people without pretense. "'You must not be so fastidious, Margaret, dear,' said her mother, secretly thinking of a young and handsome Mr. Gorman, whom she had once met at Mr. Hume's. "'No. I call mine a very comprehensive taste. I like all people whose occupations have to do with land. I like soldiers and sailors, and the three learned professions, as they call them. I'm sure you don't want me to admire butchers and bakers and candlestick-makers, do you, Mamma? but the Gormans were neither butchers nor bakers, but very respectable coach-builders. Very well. Coach-building is a trade all the same, and I think a much more useless one than that of butchers or bakers. Oh, how tired I used to be of the drives every day in Aunt Shaw's carriage, and how I longed to walk! And walk Margaret did, in spite of the weather. She was so happy out of doors, at her father's side, that she almost danced, and with the soft violence of the west wind behind her, as she crossed some heath, she seemed to be borne onwards, as lightly and easily as the fallen leaf that was wafted along by the autumnal breeze. But the evenings were rather difficult to fill up agreeably. Immediately after tea her father withdrew into his small library, and she and her mother were left alone. Mrs. Hale had never cared much for books, and had discouraged her husband, very early in their married life, in his desire of reading aloud to her while she worked. At one time they had tried backgammon as a resource, but as Mr. Hale grew to take an increasing interest in his school and his parishioners, he found that the interruptions which arose out of these duties were regarded as hardships by his wife, not to be accepted as the natural condition of his profession, but to be regretted and struggled against by her as they severally arose. So he withdrew, while the children were yet young, into his library, to spend his evenings, if he were at home, in reading the speculative and metaphysical books which were his delight. When Margaret had been here before, she had brought down with her a great box of books, recommended by masters or governess, and had found the summer's day all too short to get through the reading she had to do before her return to town. Now there were only the well-bound, little-read English classics, which were weeded out of her father's library to fill up the small bookshelves in the drawing-room. Thompson's Seasons, Haley's Cowper, Middleton's Cicero, were by far the lightest, newest, and most amusing. The bookshelves did not afford much resource. Margaret told her mother every particular of her London life, to all of which Mrs. Hale listened with interest, sometimes amused and questioning, at others a little inclined to compare her sister's circumstances of ease and comfort with the narrower means at Hellstone Vicarage. On such evenings Margaret was apt to stop talking rather abruptly, and listen to the drip, drip of the rain upon the leads of the little bow window. Once or twice Margaret found herself mechanically counting the repetition of the monotonous sound, while she wondered if she might venture to put a question on a subject very near to her heart, and ask where Frederick was now, what he was doing, how long it was since they had heard from him. But a consciousness that her mother's delicate health and positive dislike to Hellstone, all dated from the time of the mutiny in which Frederick had been engaged, the full account of which Margaret had never heard, and which now seemed doomed to be buried in sad oblivion, made her pause and turn away from the subject each time she approached it. 
When she was with her mother, her father seemed the best person to apply to for information, and when with him, she thought that she could speak more easily to her mother. Probably there was nothing much to be heard that was new. In one of the letters she had received before leaving Harley Street, her father had told her that they had heard from Frederick. He was still at Rio, and very well in health, and sent his best love to her, which was dry bones, but not the living intelligence she longed for. Frederick was always spoken of, in the rare times when his name was mentioned, as poor Frederick. His room was kept exactly as he had left it, and was regularly dusted, and put into order by Dixon, Mrs. Hale's maid, who touched no other part of the household work, but always remembered the day when she had been engaged by Lady Beersford, as lady's maid, to Sir John's wards, the pretty Miss Beersford's, the bells at Rutlandshire. Dixon had always considered Mr. Hale as the blight which had fallen upon her young lady's prospects in life. If Miss Beersford had not been in such a hurry to marry a poor country clergyman, there was no knowing what she might have become. But Dixon was too loyal to desert her in her affliction and downfall, alias her married life. She remained with her, and was devoted to her interests, always conducting herself as the good and protecting fairy, whose duty it was to baffle the malignant giant, Mr. Hale. Mr. Frederick had been her favorite and pride, and it was with a little softening of her dignified look and manner that she went in weakly to arrange the chamber as carefully as if he might be coming home that very evening. Margaret could not help believing that there had been some late intelligence of Frederick, unknown to her mother, which was making her father anxious and uneasy. Mrs. Hale did not seem to perceive any alteration in her husband's looks or ways. His spirits were always tender and gentle, readily affected by any small piece of intelligence concerning the welfare of others. He would be depressed for many days after witnessing a deathbed or hearing of any crime. But now Margaret noticed an absence of mind, as if his thoughts were preoccupied by some subject, the oppression of which could not be relieved by any daily action, such as comforting the survivors, or teaching at the school in hope of lessening the evils in the generation to come. Mr. Hale did not go out among his parishioners as much as usual. He was more shut up in his study, was anxious for the village postman, whose summons to the household was a rap on the back kitchen window-shutter, a signal which at one time had often to be repeated before any one was sufficiently alive to the hour of the day to understand what it was and attend to him. Now Mr. Hale loitered about the garden if the morning was fine, and if not, stood dreamily by the study window until the postman had called, or gone down the lane, giving a half-respectful, half-confidential shake of the head to the parson, who watched him away beyond the sweetbriar hedge, and past the great arbutus, before he turned into the room to begin his day's work, with all the signs of a heavy heart and an occupied mind. But Margaret was at an age when any apprehension, not absolutely based on a knowledge of facts, is easily banished for a time by a bright sunny day, or some happy outward circumstance. And when the brilliant fourteen fine days of October came on, her cares were all blown away as lightly as thistledown, and she thought of nothing but the glories of the forest. The fern harvest was over, and now that the rain was gone, many a deep glade was accessible, into which Margaret had only peeped in July and August weather. She had learnt drawing with Edith, and she had sufficiently regretted, during the gloom of the bad weather, her idle revelling in the beauty of the woodlands, while it had yet been fine, to make her determined to sketch what she could before the winter fairly set in. Accordingly she was busy preparing her board one morning, when Sarah, the housemaid, threw wide open the drawing-room door, and announced, Mr. Henry Lennox. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter 3 The More Haste, The Worse Speed Learn to win a lady's faith nobly, as the thing is high, bravely, as for life and death, with a loyal gravity. Lead her from the festive boards, point her to the starry skies, guard her by your truthful words, pure from courtship's flatteries. Mrs. Browning Mr. Henry Lennox, 
Margaret had been thinking of him only a moment before, and remembering his inquiry into her probable occupations at home. It was Parle du Soleil et Léon et Voye les Rions, and the brightness of the sun came over Margaret's face as she put down her board and went forward to shake hands with him. "'Tell Mamma, Sarah,' said she. "'Mamma and I want to ask you so many questions about Edith. I am so much obliged to you for coming.' "'Did I not say that I should?' asked he, in a lower tone than that in which she had spoken. "'But I heard of you so far away in the Highlands that I never thought Hampshire could come in.' "'Oh,' he said, more lightly, "'our young couple were playing such foolish pranks, running all sorts of risks, climbing this mountain, sailing that lake, that I really thought they needed a mentor to take care of them. And indeed they did. They were quite beyond my uncle's management.' and kept the old gentleman in a panic for sixteen hours out of the twenty-four. Indeed, when once I saw how unfit they were to be trusted alone, I thought it my duty not to leave them till I had seen them safely embarked at Plymouth. "'Have you been at Plymouth? Oh, Edith never named that. To be sure, she has written in such a hurry lately. Did they really sail on Tuesday?' "'Really sailed, and relieved me from many responsibilities.' Edith gave me all sorts of messages for you. I believe I have a little diminutive note somewhere. Yes, here it is. Oh, thank you, exclaimed Margaret, and then, half wishing to read it alone and unwatched, she made the excuse of going to tell her mother again, Sarah surely had made some mistake, that Mr. Lennox was there. When she had left the room, he began in his scrutinizing way to look about him, the little drawing-room was looking its best in the streaming light of the morning sun. The middle window in the bow was opened, and clustering roses and the scarlet honeysuckle came peeping round the corner. The small lawn was gorgeous with verbenas and geraniums of all bright colours. But the very brightness outside made the colours within seem poor and faded. The carpet was far from new. The chintz had been often washed. The whole apartment was smaller and shabbier than he had expected as background and framework for Margaret, herself so queenly. He took up one of the books lying on the table. It was the Paradiso of Dante, in the proper old Italian binding of white vellum and gold. By it lay a dictionary, and some words copied out in Margaret's handwriting. They were a dull list of words, but somehow he liked looking at them. He put them down with a sigh. The living is evidently as small as she said. It seems strange, for the Beersfords belong to a good family. Margaret, meanwhile, had found her mother. It was one of Mrs. Hale's fitful days, when everything was a difficulty and a hardship, and Mr. Lennox's appearance took this shape, although secretly she felt complimented by his thinking it worth while to call. "'It is most unfortunate. We are dining early to-day, and having nothing but cold meat, in order that the servants may get on with their ironing. And yet— of course, we must ask him to dinner, Edith's brother-in-law and all. And your papa is in such low spirits this morning about something. I don't know what. I went into the study just now, and he had his face on the table, covering it with his hands. I told him I was sure Hellstone Air did not agree with him any more than it did with me, and he suddenly lifted up his head, and begged me not to speak a word more against Hellstone. He could not bear it. If there was one place he loved on earth it was Hellstone. But I am sure, for all that, it is the damp and relaxing air. Margaret felt as if a thin cold cloud had come between her and the sun. She had listened patiently, in hopes that it might be some relief to her mother to unburden herself, but now it was time to draw her back to Mr. Lennox. Papa likes Mr. Lennox. They got on together famously at the wedding breakfast. I dare say his coming will do Papa good. And never mind the dinner, dear Mamma. Cold meat will do capitally for a lunch, which is the light in which Mr. Lennox will most likely look upon a two o'clock dinner. But what are we to do with him till then? It is only half-past ten now. I'll ask him to go out sketching with me. I know he draws, and that will take him out of your way, Mamma. Only do come in now. He will think it so strange if you don't. Mrs. Hale took off her black silk apron and smoothed her face. She looked a very pretty ladylike woman, as she greeted Mr. Lennox with the cordiality due to one who was almost a relation. 
he evidently expected to be asked to spend the day and accepted the invitation with a glad readiness that made mrs hale wish she could add something to the cold beef he was pleased with everything delighted with margaret's idea of going out sketching together would not have mr hale disturbed for the world with the prospect of so soon meeting him at dinner margaret brought out her drawing materials for him to choose from and after the paper and brushes had been duly selected the two set out in the merriest spirits in the world now please just stop here for a minute or two said margaret these are the cottages that haunted me so during the rainy fortnight reproaching me for not having sketched them before they tumble down and were seen no more truly if they are to be sketched and they are very picturesque we had better not put it off till next year but where shall we sit oh you might have come straight from the chambers in the temple instead of having been two months in the highlands look at this beautiful trunk of a tree which the woodcutters have left just in the right place for the light i will put my plaid over it and it will be a regular forest throne with your feet in that puddle for a regal footstool stay i will move and then you can come nearer this way who lives in these cottages they were built by squatters fifty or sixty years ago one is uninhabited the foresters are going to take it down as soon as the old man who lives in the other is dead poor old fellow look there he is i must go and speak to him he is so deaf you will hear all our secrets the old man stood bareheaded in the sun leaning on his stick in the front of his cottage his stiff features relaxed into a slow smile as margaret went up and spoke to him mr lennox hastily introduced the two figures into his sketch and finished up the landscape with a subordinate reference to them as margaret perceived when the time came for getting up putting away water and scraps of paper and exhibiting to each other their sketches she laughed and blushed mr lennox watched her countenance now i call that treacherous said she i little thought you were making old isaac and me into subjects when you told me to ask him the history of these cottages it was irresistible you can't know how strong a temptation it was i hardly dare tell you how much i shall like this sketch he was not quite sure whether she heard this latter sentence before she went to the brook to wash her palette she came back rather flushed but looking perfectly innocent and unconscious he was glad of it for the speech had slipped from him unawares a rare thing in the case of a man who premeditated his actions so much as henry lennox the aspect of home was all right and bright when they reached it the clouds on her mother's brow had cleared off under the propitious influence of a brace of carp most opportunely presented by a neighbour mr hale had returned from his morning's round and was awaiting his visitor just outside the wicket gate that led into the garden he looked a complete gentleman in his rather threadbare coat and well-worn hat margaret was proud of her father she had always a fresh and tender pride in seeing how favorably he impressed every stranger still her quick eye sought over his face and found there traces of some unusual disturbance which was only put aside not cleared away mr hale asked to look at their sketches i think you have made the tints on the thatch too dark have you not as he returned margaret's to her and held out his hand for mr lennox's which was withheld from him one moment no more no papa i don't think i have the house leek and stone crop have grown so much darker in the rain is it not like papa she said peeping over his shoulder as he looked at the figures in mr lennox's drawing yes very like your figure and way of holding yourself is capital and it is just poor isaac's stiff way of stooping his long rheumatic back what is this hanging from the branch of the tree not a bird's nest surely oh no that is my bonnet i can never draw with my bonnet on it makes my head so hot i wonder if i could manage figures there are so many people about here whom i should like to sketch i should say that a likeness you very much wish to take you would always succeed in said mr lennox i have great faith in the power of will i think myself i have succeeded pretty well in yours mr hale had preceded them into the house while margaret was lingering to pluck some roses with which to adorn her morning gown for dinner a regular london girl would understand the implied meaning of that speech thought mr lennox she would be up to looking through every speech that a young man made her for the ariarpensi of a compliment but i don't believe margaret stay exclaimed he 
let me help you and he gathered for her some velvety cremoisy roses that were above her reach and then dividing the spoil he placed two in his buttonhole and sent her in pleased and happy to arrange her flowers the conversation at dinner flowed on quietly and agreeably there were plenty of questions to be asked on both sides the latest intelligence which each could give of mrs shaw's movements in italy to be exchanged and in the interest of what was said the unpretending simplicity of parsonage ways above all in the neighbourhood of margaret mr lennox forgot the little feeling of disappointment with which he had first perceived that she had spoken but the simple truth when she had described her father's living as very small margaret my child you might have gathered us some pears for our dessert said mr hale as the hospitable luxury of a freshly decanted bottle of wine was placed on the table mrs hale was hurried it seemed as if desserts were impromptu and unusual things at the parsonage whereas if mr hale would only have looked behind him he would have seen biscuits and marmalade and what not all arranged in formal order on the sideboard but the idea of pears had taken possession of mr hale's mind and was not to be got rid of there are a few brown buries against the south wall which are worth all foreign fruits and preserves run margaret and get us some i propose that we adjourn into the garden and eat them there said mr lennox nothing is so delicious as to set one's teeth into the crisp juicy fruit warm and scented by the sun the worst is the wasps are impudent enough to dispute it with one even at the very crisis and summit of enjoyment he rose as if to follow margaret who had disappeared through the window he only awaited mrs hale's permission she would rather have wound up the dinner in the proper way and with all the ceremonies which had gone on so smoothly hitherto especially as she and dixon had got out the finger-glasses from the storeroom on purpose to be as correct as became general shaw's widow's sister but as mr hale got up directly and prepared to accompany his guest she could only submit i shall arm myself with a knife said mr hale the days of eating fruit so primitively as you describe are over with me i must pare it and quarter it before i can enjoy it margaret made a plate for the pears out of a beet-root leaf which threw up their brown cold colour admirably mr lennox looked more at her than at the pears but her father inclined to cull fastidiously the very zest and perfection of the hour he had stolen from his anxiety chose daintily the ripest fruit and sat down on the garden bench to enjoy it at his leisure margaret and mr lennox strolled along the little terrace walk under the south wall where the bees still hummed and worked busily in their hives what a perfect life you seem to live here i have always felt rather contemptuously toward the poets before with their wishes mine be a cot beside a hill and that sort of thing but now i am afraid that the truth is i have been nothing better than a cockney just now i feel as if twenty years hard study of law would be amply rewarded by one year of such exquisite serene life as this such skies looking up such crimson and amber foliage so perfectly motionless as that pointing to some of the great forest trees which shut in the garden as if it were a nest you must please to remember that our skies are not always as deep a blue as they are now we have rain and our leaves do fall and get sodden though i think hellstone is about as perfect a place as any in the world recollect how you rather scorned my description of it one evening in harley street a village in a tale scorned margaret that's a rather hard word perhaps it is only i know i should have liked to have talked to you of what i was very full at the time and you what must i call it then spoke disrespectfully of hellstone as a mere village in a tale i will never do so again said he warmly they turned the corner of the walk i could almost wish margaret he stopped and hesitated it was so unusual for the fluent lawyer to hesitate that margaret looked up at him in a little state of questioning wonder but in an instant from what about him she could not tell she wished herself back with her mother her father anywhere away from him for she was sure that he was going to say something to which she should not know what to reply in another moment the strong pride that was in her came to conquer her sudden agitation which she hoped he had not perceived of course she could answer and answer the right thing and it was poor and despicable of her to shrink from hearing any speech 
as if she had not power to put an end to it with her high maidenly dignity margaret said he taking her by surprise and getting sudden possession of her hand so that she was forced to stand still and listening despising herself for the fluttering at her heart all the time margaret i wish you did not like hellstone so much did not seem so perfectly calm and happy here i have been hoping for these three months past to find you regretting london and london friends a little enough to make you listen more kindly for she was quietly but firmly striving to extricate her hand from his grasp to one who has not much to offer it is true nothing but prospects in the future but who does love you margaret almost in spite of himself margaret have i startled you too much speak for he saw her lips quivering almost as if she were going to cry she made a strong effort to be calm she would not speak till she had succeeded in mastering her voice and then she said i was startled i did not know that you cared for me in that way i have always thought of you as a friend and please i would rather go on thinking of you so i don't like to be spoken to as you have been doing i cannot answer you as you want me to do and yet i should feel so sorry if i vexed you margaret said he looking into her eyes which met his with their open straight look expressive of the utmost good faith and reluctance to give pain do you he was going to say love any one else but it seemed as if this question would be an insult to the pure serenity of those eyes forgive me i have been too abrupt i am punished only let me hope give me the poor comfort of telling me you have never seen any one whom you could again a pause he could not end his sentence margaret reproached herself acutely as the cause of his distress ah if you had but never got this fancy into your head it was such a pleasure to think of you as a friend but i may hope may i not margaret that some time you will think of me as a lover not yet i see there is no hurry but some time she was silent for a minute or two trying to discover the truth as it was in her own heart before replying then she said i have never thought of you but as a friend i like to think of you so but i am sure i could never think of you as anything else pray let us both forget all this disagreeable she was going to say but stopped short conversation has taken place he paused before he replied then in his habitual coldness of tone he answered of course as your feelings are so decided and as this conversation has been so evidently unpleasant to you it had better not be remembered that is all very fine in theory that plan of forgetting whatever is painful but it will be somewhat difficult for me at least to carry it into execution you are vexed she said sadly yet how can i help it she looked so truly grieved as she said this that he struggled for a moment with his real disappointment and then answered more cheerfully but still with a little hardness in his tone you should make allowances for the mortification not only of a lover margaret but of a man not given to romance in general prudent worldly as some people call me who has been carried out of his usual habits by the force of a passion well we will say no more of that but in the one outlet which he has formed for the deeper and better feelings of his nature he meets with rejection and repulse i shall have to console myself with scorning my own folly a struggling barrister to think of matrimony margaret could not answer this the whole tone of it annoyed her it seemed to touch on and call out all the points of difference which had often repelled her in him while yet he was the pleasantest man the most sympathizing friend the person of all others who understood her best in harley street she felt a tinge of contempt mingle itself with her pain at having refused him her beautiful lip curled in slight disdain it was well that having made the round of the garden they came suddenly upon mr hale whose whereabouts had been quite forgotten by them he had not yet finished the pair 
which he had delicately peeled in one long strip of silver paper thinness, and which he was enjoying in a deliberate manner. It was like the story of the eastern king, who dipped his head into a basin of water, at the magician's command, and ere he instantly took it out went through the experience of a lifetime. Margaret felt stunned, and unable to recover her self-possession enough to join in the trivial conversation that ensued between her father and Mr. Lennox. She was grave, and little disposed to speak, full of wonder when Mr. Lennox would go, and allow her to relax into thought on the events of the last quarter of an hour. He was almost as anxious to take his departure as she was for him to leave. But a few minutes' light and careless talking, carried on at whatever effort, was a sacrifice which he owed to his mortified vanity, or his self-respect. He glanced from time to time at her sad and pensive face. "'I am not so indifferent to her as she believes,' he thought to himself. "'I do not give up hope.' Before a quarter of an hour was over, he had fallen into a way of conversing with quiet sarcasm, speaking of life in London and life in the country, as if he were conscious of his second mocking self, and afraid of his own satire. Mr. Hale was puzzled. His visitor was a different man to what he had seen him before at the wedding breakfast, and at dinner to-day. A lighter, cleverer, more worldly man, and, as such, dissonant to Mr. Hale. It was a relief to all three when Mr. Lennox said that he must go directly if he meant to catch the five o'clock train. They proceeded to the house to find Mrs. Hale and wish her good-bye. At the last moment Henry Lennox's real self broke through the crust. "'Margaret, don't despise me. I have a heart, notwithstanding this good-for-nothing way of talking. As proof of it, I believe I love you more than ever, if I do not hate you, for the disdain with which you have listened to me during this last half-hour. Good-bye, Margaret. Margaret. End of chapter 3《 ORIGIN OF CHAPTER IV of North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter IV Doubts and Difficulties. Cast me upon some naked shore, where I may track only the print of some sad wreck. If thou be there, though the seas roar, I shall no gentler calm implore. Havington. He was gone. The house was shut up for the evening. No more deep blue skies or crimson and amber tints. Margaret went up to dress for the early tea, finding Dixon in a pretty temper from the interruption which a visitor had naturally occasioned on a busy day. She showed it by brushing away viciously at Margaret's hair, under pretense of being in a great hurry to go to Mrs. Hale. Yet, after all, Margaret had to wait a long time in the drawing-room before her mother came down. She sat by herself at the fire, with unlighted candles on the table behind her, thinking over the day, the happy walk, happy sketching, cheerful pleasant dinner, and the uncomfortable, miserable walk in the garden. How different men were to women! Here was she disturbed and unhappy, because her instinct had made anything but a refusal impossible, while he, not many minutes after he had met with a rejection of what ought to have been the deepest, holiest proposal of his life, could speak as if briefs, success, and all its superficial consequences of a good house, clever and agreeable society, were the sole avowed objects of his desires. Oh, dear! How she could have loved him, if he had but been different, with a difference which she felt, on reflection, to be one that went low, deep down. Then she took it into her head that, after all, his lightness might be but assumed, to cover a bitterness of disappointment which would have been stamped on her own heart if she had loved and been rejected. Her mother came into the room before this whirl of thoughts was adjusted into anything like order. Margaret had to shake off the recollections of what had been done and said through the day, and turn a sympathizing listener to the account of how Dixon had complained that the ironing blanket had been burnt again and how Susan Lightfoot had been seen with artificial flowers in her bonnet, thereby giving evidence of a vain and giddy character. Mr. Hale sipped his tea in abstracted silence. Margaret had the responses all to herself. 
she wondered how her father and mother could be so forgetful so regardless of their companion through the day as never to mention his name she forgot that he had not made them an offer after tea mr hale got up and stood with his elbow on the chimney-piece leaning his head on his hand musing over something and from time to time sighing deeply mrs hale went out to consult with dixon about some winter clothing for the poor margaret was preparing her mother's worsted work and rather shrinking from the thought of the long evening and wishing bedtime were come that she might go over the events of the day again margaret said mr hale at last in a sort of sudden desperate way that made her start is that tapestry thing of immediate consequence i mean can you leave it and come into my study i want to speak to you about something very serious to us all very serious to us all mr lennox had never had the opportunity of having any private conversation with her father after her refusal or else that would indeed have been a very serious affair in the first place margaret felt guilty and ashamed of having grown so much into a woman as to be thought of in marriage and secondly she did not know if her father might not be displeased that she had taken upon herself to decline mr lennox's proposal but she soon felt it was not about anything which having only lately and suddenly occurred could have given rise to any complicated thoughts that her father wished to speak to her he made her take a chair by him he stirred the fire snuffed the candles and sighed once or twice before he could make up his mind to say and it came out with a jerk after all margaret i am going to leave hellstone leave hellstone papa but why mr hale did not answer for a minute or two he played with some papers on the table in a nervous and confused manner opening his lips to speak several times but closing them again without having the courage to utter a word margaret could not bear the sight of the suspense which was even more distressing to her father than to herself but why dear papa do tell me he looked up at her suddenly and then said with a slow and enforced calmness because i must no longer be a minister in the church of england margaret had imagined nothing less than that some of the preferments which her mother so much desired had befallen her father at last something that would force him to leave beautiful beloved helstone and perhaps compel him to go and live in some of the stately and silent closes which margaret had seen from time to time in cathedral towns they were grand and imposing places but if to go there it was necessary to leave helstone as a home for ever that would have been a sad long lingering pain but nothing to the shock she received from mr hale's last speech what could he mean it was all the worse for being so mysterious the aspect of piteous distress on his face almost as imploring a merciful and kind judgment from his child gave her a sudden sickening could he have been implicated in anything frederick had done frederick was an outlaw had her father out of natural love for his son connived at any oh what is it do speak papa tell me all why can you no longer be a clergyman surely if the bishop were told all we know about frederick and the hard unjust it is nothing about frederick the bishop would have nothing to do with that it is all myself margaret i will tell you about it i will answer any questions this once but after to-night let us never speak of it again i can meet the consequences of my painful miserable doubts but it is an effort beyond me to speak of what has caused me so much suffering doubts papa doubts as to religion asked margaret more shocked than ever no not doubts as to religion not the slightest injury to that he paused margaret sighed as if standing on the verge of some new horror he began again speaking rapidly as if to get over a set task you could not understand it all if i told you my anxiety for years past to know whether i had any right to hold my living my efforts to quench my smouldering doubts by the authority of the church oh margaret how i love the holy church from which i am to be shut out he could not go on for a moment or two 
Margaret could not tell what to say. It seemed to her as terribly mysterious as if her father were about to turn Mahometan. "'I have been reading to-day of the two thousand who were ejected from their churches,' continued Mr. Hale, smiling faintly, "'trying to steal some of their bravery. But it is of no use. No use. I cannot help feeling it acutely.' "'But, Papa, have you well considered? Oh, it seems so terrible, so shocking,' said Margaret, suddenly bursting into tears. The one staid foundation of her home, of her idea of her beloved father, seemed reeling and rocking. What could she say? What was to be done? The sight of her distress made Mr. Hale nerve himself, in order to try and comfort her. He swallowed down the dry, choking sobs which had been heaving up from his heart hitherto, and going to his bookcase he took down a volume, which he had often been reading lately, and from which he thought he had derived strength to enter upon the course in which he was now embarked. "'Listen, dear Margaret,' said he, putting one arm round her waist. She took his hand in hers and grasped it tight, but she could not lift up her head nor indeed could she attend to what he read, so great was her internal agitation. This is the soliloquy of one who was once a clergyman in a country parish, like me. It was written by a Mr. Oldfield, minister of Carsington, in Derbyshire, a hundred and sixty years ago, or more. His trials are over. He fought the good fight. These last two sentences he spoke low, as if to himself. Then he read aloud, whence thou canst no longer continue in thy work without dishonour to God, discredit to religion, foregoing thy integrity, wounding conscience, spoiling thy peace, and hazarding the loss of thy salvation, in a word, when the conditions upon which thou must continue, if thou wilt continue, in thy employments are sinful, and unwarranted by the word of God, thou mayest, yea, thou must believe that God will turn thy very silence, suspension, deprivation, and laying aside, to his glory, and the advancement of the gospel's interest. When God will not use thee in one kind, yet he will in another. A soul that desires to serve and honor him shall never want opportunity to do it, nor must thou so limit the Holy One of Israel, as to think he hath but one way in which he can glorify himself by thee. He can do it by thy silence, as well as by thy preaching." thy laying aside as well as thy continuance in thy work. It is not pretense of doing God the greatest service, or performing the weightiest duty, that will excuse the least sin, though that sin capacitated, or gave us opportunity for doing that duty. Thou wilt have little thanks, O my soul, if, when thou art charged with corrupting God's worship, falsifying thy vows, thou pretendest a necessity for it in order to a continuance in the ministry. As he read this, and glanced at much more which he did not read, he gained resolution for himself, and felt as if he too could be brave and firm in doing what he believed to be right. But as he ceased, he heard Margaret's low, convulsive sob, and his courage sunk down under the keen sense of suffering. "'Margaret, dear,' said he, drawing her close, "'think of the early martyrs. Think of the thousands who have suffered.' father said she suddenly lifting up her flushed tear-wet face the early martyrs suffered for the truth while you oh dear dear papa i suffer for conscience's sake my child said he with a dignity that was only tremulous from the acute sensitiveness of his character i must do what my conscience bids I have borne long with self-reproach that would have roused any mind less torpid and cowardly than mine. He shook his head as he went on. Your poor mother's fond wish, gratified at last in the mocking way in which over-fond wishes are too often fulfilled. Sodom apples as they are, has brought on this crisis, for which I ought to be, and I hope I am, thankful. It is not a month since the bishop offered me another living— if I had accepted it, I should have had to make a fresh declaration of conformity to the liturgy at my institution. Margaret, I tried to do it, 
I tried to content myself with simply refusing the additional preferment and stopping quietly here, strangling my conscience now, as I had strained it before. God forgive me. He rose and walked up and down the room, speaking low words of self-reproach and humiliation, of which Margaret was thankful to hear but few. At last he said, Margaret, I return to the old sad burden. We must leave Hellstone. Yes, I see. But when? I have written to the bishop. I dare say I have told you so, but I forgot things just now, said Mr. Hale, collapsing into his depressed manner as soon as he came to talk of hard, matter-of-fact details, informing him of my intention to resign this vicarage. He has been most kind. He has used arguments and expostulations. All in vain. In vain. They are but what I tried upon myself, without avail. I shall have to take my deed of resignation, and wait upon the bishop myself, to bid him farewell. That will be a trial. But worse, far worse, will be the parting from my dear people. There is a curate appointed to read prayers, a Mr. Brown. He will come to stay with us to-morrow. Next Sunday I preach my farewell sermon. Was it to be so sudden, then, thought Margaret? And yet perhaps it was as well. Lingering would only add stings to the pain. It was better to be stunned into numbness by hearing of all these arrangements, which seemed to be nearly completed before she had been told. "'What does Mamma say?' asked she, with a deep sigh. To her surprise, her father began to walk about again before he answered. At length he stopped and replied, "'Margaret, I am a poor coward, after all. I cannot bear to give pain. I know so well your mother's married life has not been all she hoped, all she had a right to expect, and this will be such a blow to her that I have never had the heart, the power, to tell her. She must be told, though, now,' he said, looking wistfully at his daughter, Margaret was almost overpowered with the idea that her mother knew nothing of it all, and yet the affair was so far advanced. "'Yes, indeed she must,' said Margaret. "'Perhaps, after all, she may not. Oh, yes, she will. She must be shocked.' As the force of the blow returned upon herself in trying to realize how another would take it. "'Where are we to go to?' she said at last struck with a fresh wonder as to their future plans, if plans indeed her father had. "'To Milton Northern,' he answered, with a dull indifference, for he had perceived that, although his daughter's love had made her cling to him, and for a moment strive to soothe him with her love, yet the keenness of pain was as fresh as ever in her mind. "'Milton Northern? The manufacturing town in Darkshire?' "'Yes.' said he, in the same despondent, indifferent way. "'Why there, papa?' asked she. "'Because there I can earn bread for my family. Because I know no one there, and no one knows Hellstone, or can ever talk to me about it.' "'Bread for your family? I thought you and Mamma had—' And then she stopped, checking her natural interest regarding their future life, as she saw the gathering gloom on her father's brow. But he, with his quick, intuitive sympathy, read in her face, as in a mirror, the reflections of his own moody depression, and turned it off with an effort. "'You shall be told all, Margaret. Only help me to tell your mother. I think I could do anything but that. The idea of her distress turns me sick with dread. If I tell you all, perhaps you could break it to her to-morrow. I am going out for the day.' to bid Farmer Dobson and the poor people on Brace Common good-bye. Would you dislike breaking it to her very much, Margaret? Margaret did dislike it, did shrink from it more than from anything she had ever had to do in her life before. She could not speak, all at once. Her father said, You dislike it very much, don't you, Margaret? Then she conquered herself and said, with a bright strong look on her face, it is a painful thing, but it must be done, and I will do it as well as ever I can. You must have many painful things to do. 
Mr. Hale shook his head despondingly. He pressed her hand in token of gratitude. Margaret was nearly upset again into a burst of crying. To turn her thoughts, she said, "'Now tell me, Papa, what our plans are. You and Mamma have some money, independent of the income from the living, have not you? Aunt Shaw has, I know.' "'Yes, I suppose we have about a hundred and seventy pounds a year of our own. Seventy of that has always gone to Frederick, since he has been abroad. I don't know if he wants it all,' he continued in a hesitating manner. "'He must have some pay for serving with the Spanish army.' "'Frederick must not suffer,' said Margaret decidedly, "'in a foreign country, so unjustly treated by his own. "'A hundred is left. "'Could not you and I and Mamma live on a hundred a year "'in some very cheap, very quiet part of England? "'Oh, I think we could.' "'No,' said Mr. Hale. "'That would not answer. "'I must do something. "'I must make myself busy to keep off morbid thoughts. "'Besides,' In a country parish I should be so painfully reminded of Hellstone, and my duties here. I could not bear it, Margaret. And a hundred a year would go a very little way, after the necessary wants of housekeeping are met, towards providing your mother with all the comforts she has been accustomed to, and ought to have. No, we must go to Milton. That is settled. I can always decide better by myself, and not influenced by those whom I love, said he, as a half-apology for having arranged so much before he had told any one of his family of his intentions. "'I cannot stand objections. They make me so undecided.' Margaret resolved to keep silence. After all, what did it signify where they went, compared to the one terrible change? Mr. Hale continued. "'A few months ago, when my misery of doubt became more than I could bear without speaking, I wrote to Mr. Bell.' "'You remember Mr. Bell, Margaret?' "'No, I never saw him, I think. "'But I know who he is. "'Frederick's godfather. "'Your old tutor at Oxford, don't you mean?' "'Yes. "'He is a fellow of Plymouth College there. "'He is a native of Milton Northern, I believe. "'At any rate, he has property there, "'which has very much increased in value "'since Milton has become such a large manufacturing town. "'Well, I had reason to suspect.' to imagine. I had better say nothing about it, however, but I felt sure of sympathy for Mr. Bell. I don't know that he gave me much strength. He has lived an easy life in his college all his days, but he has been as kind as can be, and it is owing to him we are going to Milton. How? said Margaret. Why, he has tenants, and houses, and mills there, so, though he dislikes the place, too bustling for one of his habits. He is obliged to keep up some sort of connection, and he tells me that he hears there is a good opening for a private tutor there. A private tutor, said Margaret, looking scornful. What in the world do manufacturers want with the classics, or literature, or the accomplishments of a gentleman? Oh, said her father, some of them seem really to be fine fellows, conscious of their own deficiencies, which is more than many a man at Oxford is. Some want resolutely to learn, though they have come to man's estate. Some want their children to be better instructed than they themselves have been. At any rate, there is an opening, as I have said, for a private tutor. Mr. Bell has recommended me to a Mr. Thornton, a tenant of his, and a very intelligent man, as far as I can judge from his letters. And in Milton, Margaret, I shall find a busy life, if not a happy one, and people in scenes so different that I shall never be reminded of Hellstone. There was a secret motive, as Margaret knew from her own feelings. It would be different, discordant as it was, with almost a detestation for all she had ever heard of the north of England, the manufacturers, the people, the wild and bleak country. There was this one recommendation. It would be different from Hellstone, and could never remind them of that beloved place. "'When do we go?' asked Margaret, after a short silence. "'I do not know exactly. I wanted to talk it over with you. You see, your mother knows nothing about it yet. But I think, in a fortnight, after my deed of resignation is sent in, I shall have no right to remain.' Margaret was almost stunned. "'In a fortnight?' 
no no not exactly to a day nothing is fixed said her father with anxious hesitation as he noticed the filmy sorrow that had come over her eyes and the sudden change in her complexion but she recovered herself immediately yes papa it had better be fixed soon and decidedly as you say only mamma to know nothing about it it is that that is the great perplexity poor maria replied mr hale tenderly poor poor maria oh if i were not married if i were but myself in the world how easy it would be as it is margaret i dare not tell her no said margaret sadly i will do it give me till to-morrow evening to choose my time oh papa cried she with sudden passionate entreaty say tell me it is a nightmare a horrid dream not the real waking truth you cannot mean that you are really going to leave the church to give up hellstone to be for ever separate from me from mamma led away by some delusion some temptation you do not really mean it mr hale sat in rigid stillness while she spoke then he looked her in the face and said in a slow hoarse measured way i do mean it margaret you must not deceive yourself into doubting the reality of my words my fixed intention and resolve he looked at her in the same steady stony manner for some moments after he had done speaking she too gazed back with pleading eyes before she would believe that it was irrevocable then she arose and went without another word or look towards the door as her fingers were on the handle he called her back he was standing by the fireplace shrunk and stooping but as she came near he drew himself up to his full height and placing his hands on her head he said solemnly the blessing of god be upon thee my child and may he restore you to his church responded she out of the fullness of her heart the next moment she feared lest this answer to his blessing might be irreverent wrong might hurt him as coming from his daughter and she threw her arms round his neck he held her to him for a minute or two she heard him murmur to himself the martyrs and confessors had even more pain to bear i will not shrink they were startled by hearing mrs hale inquiring for her daughter they started asunder in the full consciousness of all that was before them mr hale hurriedly said go margaret go i shall be out all to-morrow before night you will have told your mother yes she replied and she returned to the drawing-room in a stunned and dizzy state end of chapter four Chapter Five of North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter Five, Decision. I ask thee for a thoughtful love, through constant watching, wise, to meet the glad with joyful smiles and to wipe the weeping eyes, and a heart at leisure from itself to soothe and sympathize. Anonymous. Margaret made a good listener to all her mother's little plans for adding some small comforts to the lot of the poor parishioners. She could not help listening, though each new project was a stab to her heart. By the time the frost had set in, they should be far away from Helstone. Old Simon's rheumatism might be bad and his eyesight worse. There would be no one to go and read to him, and comfort him with little porringers of broth and good red flannel or if there was it would be a stranger and the old man would watch in vain for her mary domville's little crippled boy would crawl in vain to the door and look for her coming through the forest these poor friends would never understand why she had forsaken them and there were many others besides papa has always spent the income he derived from his living in the parish i am perhaps encroaching upon the next dues but the winter is likely to be severe, and our poor old people must be helped. "'Oh, Mamma, let us do all we can,' said Margaret eagerly, not seeing the prudential side of the question, 
only grasping at the idea that they were rendering such help for the last time. We may not be here long. "'Do you feel ill, my darling?' asked Mrs. Hale, anxiously, misunderstanding Margaret's hint of the uncertainty of their stay at Hellstone. "'You look pale and tired. It is this soft, damp, unhealthy air.' "'No, no, mamma, it is not that. It is delicious air. It smells of the freshest, purest fragrance after the smokiness of Harley Street. But I am tired. It surely must be near bedtime.' not far off it is half past nine you had better go to bed at once dear ask dixon for some gruel i will come and see you as soon as you are in bed i am afraid you have taken cold or the bad air from some of the stagnant ponds oh mamma said margaret faintly smiling as she kissed her mother i am quite well don't alarm yourself about me i am only tired margaret went upstairs to soothe her mother's anxiety she submitted to a basin of gruel. She was lying languidly in bed when Mrs. Hale came up to make some last inquiries and kiss her before going to her own room for the night. But the instant she heard her mother's door locked, she sprang out of bed, and throwing her dressing-gown on, she began to pace up and down the room until the creaking of one of the boards reminded her that she must make no noise. She went and curled herself up on the window-seat in the small, deeply recessed window. That morning when she had looked out, her heart had danced at seeing the bright, clear lights on the church-tower, which foretold of a fine and sunny day. This evening, sixteen hours at most had passed by. She sat down, too full of sorrow to cry, but with a dull, cold pain, which seemed to have pressed the youth and buoyancy out of her heart, never to return. Mr. Henry Lennox's visit, his offer, was like a dream, a thing beside her actual life. The hard reality was that her father had so admitted tempting doubts into his mind as to become a schismatic, an outcast. All the charges consequent upon this grouped themselves around that one great blighting fact. She looked out upon the dark grey lines of the church tower, square and straight in the centre of the view cutting against the deep blue transparent depths beyond, into which she gazed, and felt that she might gaze for ever, seeing at every moment some farther distance, and yet no sign of God. It seemed to her at the moment as if the earth was more utterly desolate than if girt in by an iron dome, beyond which there might be the ineffable peace and glory of the Almighty, those never-ending depths of space, in their still serenity, were more mocking to her than any material bounds could be, shutting in the cries of earth's sufferers, which now might ascend into that infinite splendor of vastness and be lost, lost for ever, before they reached his throne. In this mood her father came in unheard. The moonlight was strong enough to let him see his daughter in her unusual place and attitude. He came to her and touched her shoulder before she was aware that he was there. Margaret, I heard you were up. I could not help coming in to ask you to pray with me, to say the Lord's Prayer. That will do good to both of us. Mr. Hale and Margaret knelt by the window seat. He looking up, she bowed down in humble shame. God was there, close around them, hearing her father's whispered words. Her father might be a heretic, but had not she in her despairing doubts not five minutes before, shown herself a far more utter sceptic. She spoke not a word, but stole to bed after her father had left her, like a child ashamed of its fault. If the world was full of perplexing problems, she would trust, and only ask to see the one step needful for the hour. Mr. Lennox, his visit, his proposal— the remembrance of which had been so rudely pushed aside by the subsequent events of the day, haunted her dreams that night. He was climbing up some tree of fabulous height to reach the branch whereon was slung her bonnet. He was falling, and she was struggling to save him, but held back by some invisible powerful hand. He was dead, and yet, with the shifting of the scene, she was once more in the Harley Street drawing-room, talking to him as of old, and still with a consciousness all the time that she had seen him killed by that terrible fall. Miserable, 
unresting night, ill preparation for the coming day. She awoke with a start, unrefreshed, and conscious of some reality worse than her feverish dreams. It all came back upon her, not merely the sorrow, but the terrible discord in the sorrow. Where, to what distance apart, had her father wandered, led by doubts which were to her temptations of the evil one? She longed to ask, and yet would not have heard for all the world. The fine crisp morning made her mother feel particularly well and happy at breakfast time. She talked on, planning village kindnesses, unheeding the silence of her husband, and the monosyllabic answers of Margaret. Before the things were cleared away, Mr. Hale got up. He leaned one hand on the table, as if to support himself. "'I shall not be at home at all till evening. I am going to Bracy Common, and will ask Farmer Dobson to give me something for dinner. I shall be back to tea at seven. He did not look at either of them, but Margaret knew what he meant. By seven the announcement must be made to her mother. Mr. Hale would have delayed making it till half-past six, but Margaret was of different stuff. She could not bear the impending weight on her mind all the day long. Better to get the worst over. The day would be too short to comfort her mother. But while she stood by the window, thinking how to begin, and waiting for the servant to have left the room, her mother had gone upstairs to put on her things to go to the school. She came down ready equipped, in a brisker mood than usual. "'Mother, come round the garden with me this morning. Just one turn,' said Margaret, putting her arm round Mrs. Hale's waist. They passed through the open window. Mrs. Hale spoke, said something, Margaret could not tell what. Her eye caught on a bee entering a deep-belled flower. When that bee flew forth with his spoil she would begin. That should be the sign. Out he came. Mama, Papa's going to leave Hellstone, she blurted forth. He is going to leave the church, and live in Milton Northern. There were the three hard facts, hardly spoken. What makes you say so? asked Mrs. Hale in a surprised, incredulous voice. "'Who has been telling you such nonsense?' "'Papa himself,' said Margaret, longing to say something gentle and consoling, but literally not knowing how. They were close to a garden bench. Mrs. Hale sat down and began to cry. "'I don't understand you,' she said. "'Either you have made some great mistake, or I don't quite understand you.' "'No, mother, I have made no mistake. Papa has written to the bishop, saying that he has such doubts that he cannot conscientiously remain a priest of the Church of England, and that he must give up Hellstone. He has also consulted Mr. Bell, Frederick's godfather, you know, mamma, and it is arranged that we go to live in Milton Northern.' Mrs. Hale looked up in Margaret's face all the time she was speaking these words. The shadow on her countenance told that she, at least, believed in the truth of what she said. "'I don't think it can be true,' said Mrs. Hale, at length. "'He would surely have told me before it came to this.' It came strongly upon Margaret's mind that her mother ought to have been told, that whatever her faults of discontent and repining might have been, it was an error in her father to have left her to learn his change of opinion and his approaching change of life from her better-informed child. Margaret sat down by her mother, and took her unresisting head on her breast, bending her own soft cheeks down caressingly to touch her face. "'Dear, darling mamma, we were so afraid of giving you pain. Papa felt so acutely. You know you are not strong, and there must have been such terrible suspense to go through. When did he tell you, Margaret? Yesterday? "'Only yesterday,' replied Margaret, detecting the jealousy which prompted the inquiry. "'Poor Papa,' trying to divert her mother's thoughts into compassionate sympathy for all her father had gone through. Mrs. Hale raised her head. "'What does he mean by having doubts?' she asked. "'Surely he does not mean that he thinks differently, that he knows better than the church.' Margaret shook her head, and the tears came into her eyes as her mother touched the bare nerve of her own regret. "'Can't the bishop set him right?' asked Mrs. Hale, half impatiently. 
"'I am afraid not,' said Margaret. "'But I did not ask. "'I could not bear to hear what he might answer. "'It is all settled, at any rate. "'He is going to leave Helstone in a fortnight. "'I am not sure if he did not say "'he had sent in his deed of resignation.' "'In a fortnight!' exclaimed Mrs. Hale. "'I do think this is very strange. "'Not right at all. "'I call it very unfeeling,' said she, "'beginning to take relief in tears. "'He has doubts, you say, "'and gives up his living, "'and all without consulting me. "'I dare say, "'if he had told me his doubts at the first, "'I could have nipped them in the bud.' "'Mistaken as Margaret felt her father's conduct to have been, "'she could not bear to hear it blamed by her mother.' She knew that his very reserve had originated in a tenderness for her, which might be cowardly, but was not unfeeling. "'I almost hoped you might have been glad to leave Helstone, Mamma," she said, after a pause. "'You have never been well in this air, you know.' "'You can't think the smoky air of a manufacturing town, whole chimneys and dirt like Milton Northern, would be better than this air, which is pure and sweet, if it is too soft and relaxing.' fancy living in the middle of factories and factory people though of course if your father leaves the church we shall not be admitted into society anywhere it will be such a disgrace to us poor dear sir john it is well he is not alive to see what your father has come to every day after dinner when i was a girl living with your aunt shaw at beersford court sir john used to give for the first toast church and king and down with the rump. Margaret was glad that her mother's thoughts were turned away from the fact of her husband's silence to her on the point which must have been so near his heart. Next to the serious vital anxiety as to the nature of her father's doubts, this was the one circumstance of the case that gave Margaret the most pain. You know, we have very little society here, Mamma. The Gormans, who are our nearest neighbors, to call society and we hardly ever see them, have been in trade just as much as these Milton Northern people. "'Yes,' said Mrs. Hale, almost indignantly. "'But, at any rate, the Gormans made carriages for half the gentry of the county, and were brought into some kind of intercourse with them. But these factory people! Who on earth wears cotton that can afford linen?' "'Well, Mamma, I give up the cotton spinners. I am not standing up for them.' any more than for any other tradespeople, only we shall have little enough to do with them. Why on earth has your father fixed on Milton Northern to live in? Partly, said Margaret, sighing, because it is so different from Halstone, partly because Mr. Bell says there is an opening there for a private tutor. Private tutor in Milton? Why can't he go to Oxford and be a tutor to gentlemen? You forget, Mamma. He is leaving the church on account of his opinions. His doubts would do him no good at Oxford. Mrs. Hale was silent for some time, quietly crying. At last she said, "'And the furniture! How in the world are we to manage the removal? I never removed in my life, and only a fortnight to think about it.' Margaret was inexpressibly relieved to find that her mother's anxiety and distress was lowered to this point, so insignificant to herself and on which she could do so much to help. She planned and promised, and led her mother on to arrange fully as much as could be fixed before they knew somewhat more definitely what Mr. Hale intended to do. Throughout the day Margaret never left her mother, bending her whole soul to sympathize in all the various turns her feelings took, towards evening especially, as she became more and more anxious that her father should find a soothing welcome home awaiting him after his return from his day of fatigue and distress. She dwelt upon what he must have borne in secret for so long. Her mother could only reply coldly that he ought to have told her, and that then, at any rate, he would have had an adviser to give him counsel. And Margaret turned, faint at heart, when she heard her father's step in the hall. She dared not go to meet him, and tell him what she had done all day, for fear of her mother's jealous annoyance. She heard him linger, as if awaiting her, or some sign of her, and she dared not stir. She saw by her mother's twitching lips and changing color that she too was aware that her husband had returned. Presently he opened the room door and stood there uncertain whether to come in. His face was gray and pale, 
he had a timid fearful look in his eyes something almost pitiful to see in a man's face but that look of despondent uncertainty of mental and bodily languor touched his wife's heart she went to him and threw herself on his breast crying out oh richard richard you should have told me sooner and then in tears margaret left her as she rushed upstairs to throw herself on her bed and hide her face in the pillows to stifle the hysteric sobs that would force their way at last after the rigid self-control of the whole day how long she lay thus she could not tell she heard no noise though the housemaid came in to arrange the room the affrighted girl stole out again on tiptoe and went and told mrs dixon that miss hale was crying as if her heart would break she was sure she would make herself deadly ill if she went on at that rate in consequence of this margaret felt herself touched and started up into a sitting posture she saw the accustomed room the figure of dixon in shadow as the latter stood holding the candle a little behind her for fear of the effect on miss hale's startled eyes swollen and blinded as they were oh dixon i did not hear you come into the room said margaret resuming her trembling self-restraint is it very late she continued lifting herself languidly off the bed yet letting her feet touch the ground without fairly standing down as she shaded her wet ruffled hair off her face and tried to look as if nothing were the matter as if she had only been asleep i hardly can tell what time it is replied dixon in an aggrieved tone of voice since your mamma told me of this terrible news when i dressed her for tea i've lost all count of time i'm sure i don't know what is to become of us all when charlotte told me just now you were sobbing miss hale i thought no wonder poor thing and master thinking of turning dissenter at his time of life when if it is not to be said he's done well in the church he's not done badly after all i had a cousin miss who turned methodist preacher after he was fifty years of age and a tailor all his life but then he had never been able to make a pair of trousers to fit for as long as he had been in trade so it was no wonder but for master as i said to missus what would poor st john have said he never liked your marrying mr hale but if he could have known it would have come to this he would have sworn worse oaths than ever if that was possible dixon had been so much accustomed to comment upon mr hale's proceedings to her mistress who listened to her or not as she was in the humour that she never noticed margaret's flashing eye and dilating nostril to hear her father talked of in this way by a servant to her face dixon she said in the low tone she always used when much excited which had a sound in it as of some distant turmoil or threatening storm breaking far away dixon you forget to whom you are speaking she stood upright and firm on her feet now confronting the waiting-maid and fixing her with her steady discerning eye i am mr hale's daughter go you have made a strange mistake and one that i am sure your own good feeling will make you sorry for when you think about it dixon hung irresolutely about the room for a minute or two margaret repeated you may leave me dixon i wish you to go dixon did not know whether to resent these decided words or to cry either course would have done with her mistress but as she said to herself miss margaret has a touch of the old gentleman about her as well as poor master frederick i wonder where they get it from and she who would have resented such words from any one less haughty and determined in manner was subdued enough to say in a half humble half injured tone may i unfasten your gown miss and do your hair no not to-night thank you and margaret gravely lighted her out of the room and bolted the door from henceforth dixon obeyed and admired margaret she said it was because she was so like poor master frederick but the truth was that dixon as do many others liked to feel herself ruled by a powerful and decided nature margaret needed all dixon's help in action and silence in words for for some time the latter thought it her duty to show her sense of affront by saying as little as possible to her young lady so the energy came out in doing rather than in speaking 
a fortnight was a very short time to make arrangements for so serious a removal as dixon said any one but a gentleman indeed almost any other gentleman but catching a look at margaret's straight stern brow just here she coughed the remainder of the sentence away and meekly took the whorehound drop that margaret offered to her to stop the little tickle at my chest miss but almost any one but mr hale would have had practical knowledge enough to see that in so short a time it would be difficult to fix on any house in milton northern or indeed elsewhere to which they could remove the furniture that had of necessity to be taken out of helston vicarage mrs hale overpowered by all the troubles and necessities for immediate household decisions that seemed to come upon her at once became really ill and margaret almost felt it as a relief when her mother fairly took to her bed and let the management of affairs to her dixon true to her post of bodyguard attended most faithfully to her mistress and only emerged from mrs hale's bedroom to shake her head and murmur to herself in a manner which margaret did not choose to hear for the one thing clear and straight before her was the necessity of leaving helstone mr hale's successor in the living was appointed and at any rate after her father's decision there must be no lingering now for his sake as well as from every other consideration for he came home every evening more and more depressed after the necessary leave-taking which he had resolved to have with every individual parishioner margaret inexperienced as she was in all the necessary matter-of-fact business to be got through did not know to whom to apply for advice the cook and charlotte worked away with willing arms and stout hearts at all the moving and packing and as far as that went margaret's admirable sense enabled her to see what was best and to direct how it should be done but where were they to go in a week they must be gone straight to milton or where so many arrangements depended on this decision that margaret resolved to ask her father one evening in spite of his evident fatigue and low spirits he answered my dear i really have too much to think about to settle this what does your mother say what does she wish poor maria he met with an echo even louder than his sigh dixon had just come into the room for another cup of tea for mrs hale and catching mr hale's last words and protected by his presence from margaret's upbraiding eyes made bold to say my poor mistress you don't think her worse to-day said mr hale turning hastily i'm sure i can't say sir it's not for me to judge the illness seems so much more on the mind than on the body mr hale looked infinitely distressed you had better take mamma her tea while it is hot dixon said margaret in a tone of quiet authority oh i beg your pardon miss my thoughts was otherwise occupied in thinking of my poor of mrs hale papa said margaret it is this suspense that is bad for both of you of course mamma must feel your change of opinions we can't help that she continued softly but now the course is clear at least to a certain point and i think papa that i can get mamma to help me in planning if you could tell me what to plan for she has never expressed any wish in any way and only thinks of what can't be helped are we to go straight to milton have you taken a house there no he replied i suppose we must go into lodgings and look about for a house and pack up the furniture so that it can be left at the railway station till we have met with one i suppose so do what you think is best only remember we shall have much less money to spend they had never had much superfluity as margaret knew she felt that it was a great weight suddenly thrown upon her shoulders four months ago all the decisions she needed to make were what dress she would wear for dinner and to help edith to draw out the lists of who should take down whom in the dinner parties at home nor was the household in which she lived one that called for much decision except in the one grand case of captain lennox's offer everything went on with the regularity of clockwork once a year there was a long discussion between her aunt and edith as to whether they should go to the isle of wight abroad or to scotland but at such times margaret herself was secure of drifting without any exertion of her own into the quiet harbour of home now since that day when mr lennox came and startled her into a decision 
every day brought some question momentous to her and to those whom she loved to be settled her father went up after tea to sit with his wife margaret remained alone in the drawing-room suddenly she took a candle and went into her father's study for a great atlas and lugging it back into the drawing-room she began to pore over the map of england she was ready to look up brightly when her father came downstairs i have hit upon such a beautiful plan look here in darkshire hardly the breadth of my finger from milton is heston which i have often heard of from people living in the north as such a pleasant little bathing place now don't you think we could get mamma there with dixon while you and i go and look after houses and get one all ready for her in milton she would get a breath of sea air to set her up for the winter and be spared all the fatigue and dixon would enjoy taking care of her is dixon to go with us asked mr hale in a kind of helpless dismay oh yes said margaret dixon quite intends it and i don't know what mamma would do without her but we shall have to put up with a very different way of living i am afraid everything is so much dearer in a town i doubt if dixon can make herself comfortable to tell you the truth margaret i sometimes feel as if that woman gave herself airs to be sure she does papa replied margaret and if she has to put up with a different style of living we shall have to put up with her airs which will be worse but she really loves us all and would be miserable to leave us i am sure especially in this change so for mamma's sake and for the sake of her faithfulness i do think she must go very well my dear go on i am resigned how far is heston from milton the breath of one of your fingers does not give me a very clear idea of distance well then i suppose it is thirty miles that is not much not in distance but in never mind if you really think it will do your mother good let it be fixed so this was a great step now margaret could work and act and plan in good earnest and now mrs hale could rouse herself from her languor and forget her real suffering in thinking of the pleasure and delight of going to the seaside her only regret was that mr hale could not be with her all the fortnight she was to be there as he had been for a whole fortnight once when they were engaged and she was staying with sir john and lady beersford at torquay end of chapter five Chapter Six of North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter Six. Farewell. Unwatched, the garden bough shall sway, the tender blossom flutter down. Unloved, that beech will gather brown, the maple burn itself away. Unloved, the sunflower, shining fair, ray round with flames her disk of seed and many a rose carnation feed with summer spice the humming air till from the garden and the wild a fresh association blow and year by year the landscape grow familiar to the stranger's child as year by year the laborer tills his wonted glebe or lops the glades and year by year our memory fades from all the circle of the hills tennyson the last day came the house was full of packing cases which were being carted off at the front door to the nearest railway station even the pretty lawn at the side of the house was made unsightly and untidy by the straw that had been wafted upon it through the open door and windows the rooms had a strange echoing sound in them and the light came harshly and strongly in through the uncurtained windows seeming already unfamiliar and strange mrs hale's dressing-room was left untouched to the last and there she and dixon were packing up clothes and interrupting each other now and then to exclaim at and turn over with fond regard some forgotten treasure in the shape of some relic of the children while they were yet little they did not make much progress with their work downstairs margaret stood calm and collected ready to counsel or advise the men who had been called in to help the cook and charlotte these two last crying between the wiles wondered how the young lady could keep up so this last day and settled it between them that she was not likely to care much for helstone 
having been so long in London. There she stood, very pale and quiet, with her large grave eyes observing everything, up to every present circumstance, however small. They could not understand how her heart was aching all the time, with a heavy pressure that no size could lift off or relieve, and how constant exertion from her perceptive faculties was the only way to keep herself from crying out with pain. Moreover, if she gave way, who was to act? Her father was examining papers, books, registries, what not, in the vestry with the clerk, and when he came in, there were his own books to pack up, which no one but himself could do to his satisfaction. Besides, was Margaret one to give way before strange men, or even household friends like the cook and Charlotte? Not she. But at last the four packers went into the kitchen to their tea, and Margaret moved stiffly and slowly away from the place in the hall where she had been standing so long, out through the bare echoing drawing-room, into the twilight of an early November evening. There was a filmy veil of soft, dull mist obscuring, but not hiding, all objects, giving them a lilac hue, for the sun had not yet fully set. A robin was singing. Perhaps, Margaret thought, the very robin that her father had so often talked of as his winter pet, and for which he had made, with his own hands, a kind of robin-house by his study window. The leaves were more gorgeous than ever. The first touch of frost would lay them all low on the ground. Already one or two kept constantly floating down, amber and golden, in the low slanting sun-rays. Margaret went along the walk under the pear-tree wall. She had never been along it since she paced it at Henry Lennox's side. Here, at this bed of time, he began to speak of what she must not think of now. Her eyes were on that late-blowing rose as she was trying to answer, and she had caught the idea of the vivid beauty of the feathery leaves of the carrot in the middle of his last sentence. Only a fortnight ago, and all so changed. Where was he now? In London, going through the old round, dining with the old Harley Street set, or with gayer young friends of his own. Even now, while she walked sadly through that damp and drear garden in the dusk, with everything falling and fading, and turning to decay around her, he might be gladly putting away his law-books after a day of satisfactory toil, and freshening himself up, as he had told her he often did, by a run in the temple gardens, taking in the while the grand inarticulate mighty roar of tens of thousands of busy men, nigh at hand, but not seen, and catching ever, at his quick turns, glimpses of the lights of the cities coming up out of the depths of the river. He had often spoken to Margaret of these hasty walks, snatched in the intervals between study and dinner. At his best times and in his best moods he had spoken of them, and the thought of them had struck upon her fancy. Here there was no sound. The robin had gone away into the vast stillness of night. Now and then a cottage door in the distance was opened and shut, as if to admit the tired laborer to his home, but that sounded very far away. A stealthy, creeping, cranching sound among the crisp fallen leaves of the forest, beyond the garden, seemed almost close at hand. Margaret knew it was some poacher. Sitting up in her bedroom this past autumn, with the light of her candle extinguished, and purely reveling in the solemn beauty of the heavens and the earth, she had many a time seen the light, noiseless leap of the poachers over the garden fence, their quick tramp across the dewy moonlit lawn, their disappearance in the black still shadow beyond. The wild, adventurous freedom of their life had taken her fancy. She felt inclined to wish them success. She had no fear of them. But to-night she was afraid. She knew not why. She heard Charlotte shutting the windows and fastening up for the night, unconscious that any one had gone out into the garden. A small branch, it might be of rotten wood, or it might be broken by force, came heavily down in the nearest part of the forest. Margaret ran, swift as Camilla, down to the window, and rapped at it with a hurried, tremulousness which startled Charlotte within. "'Let me in! Let me in! It's only me, Charlotte!' Her heart did not still its flutter till she was safe in the drawing-room, with the windows fastened and bolted, and the familiar walls hemming her round, and shutting her in. She had sat down upon a packing-case, cheerless. Chill was the dreary and dismantled room. 
no fire nor other light, but Charlotte's long, unsnuffed candle. Charlotte looked at Margaret with surprise, and Margaret, feeling it rather than seeing it, rose up. "'I was afraid you were shutting me out altogether, Charlotte,' said she, half-smiling, "'and then you would never have heard me in the kitchen, and the doors into the lane in the churchyard are locked long ago. "'Oh, miss, I should have been sure to have missed you soon. The men would have wanted you to tell them how to go on, and I have put tea in Master's study as being the most comfortable room, so to speak. "'Thank you, Charlotte. You are a kind girl. I shall be sorry to leave you. You must try and write to me, if I can ever give you any little help or good advice. I shall always be glad to get a letter from Helstone, you know. I shall be sure to send you my address when I know it. The study was all ready for tea. There was a good blazing fire and unlighted candles on the table. Margaret sat down on the rug, partly to warm herself, for the dampness of the evening hung about her dress, and over-fatigue had made her chilly. She kept herself balanced by clasping her hands together round her knees. Her head dropped a little towards her chest. The attitude was one of despondency, whatever her frame of mind might be. But when she heard her father's step on the gravel outside, she started up, and hastily shaking her heavy black hair back, and wiping a few tears away that came on her cheeks she knew not how, she went out to open the door for him. He showed far more depression than she did. She could hardly get him to talk, although she tried to speak on subjects that would interest him, at the cost of an effort every time which she thought would be her last. "'Have you been on a very long walk to-day?' she asked, on seeing his refusal to touch food of any kind. "'As far as Fordham Beaches. I went to see Willow Maltby. She is sadly grieved at not having wished you good-bye. She says little Susan has kept watch down the lane for days past.' "'Nay, Margaret, what is the matter, dear?' The thought of the little child watching for her, and continually disappointed, from no forgetfulness on her part, but from sheer inability to leave home, was the last drop in poor Margaret's cup, and she was sobbing away as if her heart would break. Mr. Hale was distressingly perplexed. He rose, and walked nervously up and down the room. Margaret tried to check herself, but would not speak until she could do so with firmness. She heard him talking, as if to himself. I cannot bear it. I cannot bear to see the sufferings of others. I think I could go through with my own patience. Oh, is there no going back? No, father, said Margaret, looking straight at him, and speaking low and steadily. It is bad to believe you in error. It would be infinitely worse to have known you a hypocrite. She dropped her voice at the last few words, as if entertaining the idea of hypocrisy for a moment in connection with her father savoured of irreverence. Besides, she went on, it is only that I am tired to-night. Don't think that I am suffering from what you have done, dear papa. We can't either of us talk about it to-night, I believe, said she, finding that tears and sobs would come in spite of herself. I had better go and take mamma up this cup of tea, she had hers very early, when I was too busy to go to her, and I'm sure she will be glad of another now. Railroad time inexorably wrenched them from lovely, beloved Hellstone the next morning. They were gone. They had seen the last of the long, low parsonage home, half covered with china roses and pyracanthus, more homelike than ever in the morning sun that glittered on its windows, each belonging to some well-loved room. Almost before they had settled themselves into the car, sent from Southampton to fetch them to the station, they were gone away to return no more. A sting at Margaret's heart made her strive to look out, to catch the last glimpse of the old church tower, at the turn where she knew it might be seen above a wave of the forest trees. But her father remembered this too, and she silently acknowledged his greater right to the one window from which it could be seen. She leant back and shut her eyes and the tears welled forth, and hung glittering for an instant on the shadowing eyelashes, before rolling slowly down her cheeks, and dropping, unheeded, on her dress. They were to stop in London all night at some quiet hotel. Poor Mrs. Hale had cried in her way nearly all day long, and Dixon showed her sorrow by extreme crossness, 
and a continual irritable attempt to keep her petticoats from even touching the unconscious Mr. Hale, whom she regarded as the origin of all this suffering. They went through the well-known streets, past houses which they had often visited, past shops in which she had lounged, impatiently, by her aunt's side, while that lady was making some important and interminable decision, nay, absolutely past acquaintances in the streets, for though the morning had been of an incalculable length to them, and they felt as if it ought long ago to have closed in for the repose of the darkness, it was the very busiest time of a London afternoon in November when they arrived there. It was long since Mrs. Hale had been in London, and she roused up, almost like a child, to look about her at the different streets, and to gaze after and exclaim at the shops and carriages. "'Oh, there's Harrison's, where I bought so many of my wedding things. Dear, how altered! They've got immense plate-glass windows, larger than Crawford's in Southampton. Oh, and there, I declare. No, it is not. Yes, it is. Margaret, we have just passed Mr. Henry Lennox. Where can he be going, among all these shops? Margaret started forwards, and as quickly fell back, half smiling at herself for the sudden motion. They were a hundred yards away by this time, but he seemed like a relic of Helstone. He was associated with a bright morning, an eventful day, and she should have liked to have seen him, without his seeing her, without the chance of their speaking. The evening, without employment, passed in a room high up in a hotel, was long and heavy. Mr. Hale went out to his booksellers, and to call on a friend or two. Everyone they saw, either in the house or out in the streets, appeared hurrying to some appointment, expected by or expecting somebody. They alone seemed strange and friendless, and desolate. Yet within a mile, Margaret knew of house after house, where she for her own sake, and her mother for her Aunt Shaw's, would be welcome, if they came in gladness, or even in peace of mind. If they came sorrowing, and wanting sympathy in a complicated trouble like the present, then they would be felt as a shadow in all these houses of intimate acquaintances, not friends. London life is too whirling and full to admit of even an hour of that deep silence of feeling which the friends of Job showed, when they sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and none spake a word unto him, for they saw that his grief was very great. End of chapter 6《Chapter Seven of North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter Seven New Scenes and Faces. Mist clogs the sunshine, smoky dwarf houses have we round on every side. Matthew Arnold. The next afternoon, about twenty miles from Milton Northern, they entered on the little branch railway that led to Heston. Heston itself was one long straggling street, running parallel to the seashore. It had a character of its own, as different from the little bathing places in the south of England as they again from those of the continent. To use a Scotch word, everything looked more purpose-like. The country carts had more iron and less wood and leather about the horse gear. The people in the streets, although on pleasure bent, had yet a busy mind. The colors looked grayer, more enduring, not so gay and pretty. There were no smock-frocks, even among the country folk. They retarded motion, and were apt to catch on machinery, and so the habit of wearing them had died out. In such towns in the south of England, Margaret had seen the shopmen, when not employed in their business, lounging a little at their doors, enjoying the fresh air, and then look up and down the street. Here, if they had any leisure from customers, they made themselves business in the shop even, Margaret fancied, to the unnecessary unrolling and re-rolling of ribbons. All these differences struck upon her mind, as she and her mother went out next morning to look for lodgings. Their two nights at hotels had cost more than Mr. Hale had anticipated, and they were glad to take the first clean, cheerful rooms they met with that were at liberty to receive them. There, for the first time in many days, did Margaret feel at rest. There was a dreaminess in the rest, too which made it still more perfect and luxurious to repose in. 
the distant sea lapping the sandy shore with measured sound the nearer cries of the donkey boys the unusual scenes moving before her like pictures which she cared not in her laziness to have fully explained before they passed away the stroll down the beach to breathe the sea air soft and warm on that sandy shore even to the end of november the great long misty sea-line touching the tender-coloured sky the white sail of a distant boat turning silver in some pale sunbeam it seemed as if she could dream her life away in such luxury of pensiveness in which she made her present all in all from not daring to think of the past or wishing to contemplate the future but the future must be met however stern and iron it be one evening it was arranged that margaret and her father should go the next day to milton northern and look out for a house mr hale had received several letters from mr bell and one or two from mr thornton and he was anxious to ascertain at once a good many particulars respecting his position and chances of success there which he could only do by an interview with the latter gentleman margaret knew that they ought to be removing but she had a repugnance to the idea of a manufacturing town and believed that her mother was receiving benefit from heston air so she would willingly have deferred the expedition to milton for several miles before they reached milton they saw a deep lead-coloured cloud hanging over the horizon in the direction in which it lay it was all the darker from contrast with the pale blue-gray of the wintry sky for in heston there had been the earliest signs of frost nearer to the town the air had a faint taste and smell of smoke perhaps after all more a loss of the fragrance of grass and herbage than any positive taste or smell quick they were whirled over long straight hopeless streets of regularly built houses all small and of brick here and there a great oblong many-windowed factory stood up like a hen among her chickens puffing out black unparliamentary smoke and sufficiently accounting for the cloud which margaret had taken to foretell rain as they drove through the larger and wider streets from the station to the hotel they had to stop constantly great loaded lorries blocked up the not overwide thoroughfares margaret had now and then been into the city in her drives with her aunt but there the heavy lumbering vehicles seemed various in their purposes and intents here every van every wagon and truck bore cotton either in the raw shape in bags or the woven shape in bales of calico people thronged the footpaths most of them well dressed as regarded the material but with a slovenly looseness which struck margaret as different from the shabby threadbare smartness of a similar class in london new street said mr hale this i believe is the principal street in milton bell has often spoken to me about it it was the opening of this street from a lane into a great thoroughfare thirty years ago which caused his property to rise so much in value mr thornton's mill must be somewhere not very far off for he is mr bell's tenant but i fancy he dates from his warehouse where is our hotel papa close to the end of this street i believe shall we have lunch before or after we have looked at the houses we marked in the milton times oh let us get our work done first very well then i will only see if there is any note or letter for me from mr thornton who said he would let me know anything he might hear about these houses and then we will set off we will keep the cab it will be safer than losing ourselves and being too late for the train this afternoon there were no letters awaiting him they set out on their house hunting thirty pounds a year was all they could afford to give but in hampshire they could have met with a roomy house and a pleasant garden for the money here even the necessary accommodation of two sitting-rooms and four bedrooms seemed unattainable they went through their list rejecting each as they visited it then they looked at each other in dismay we must go back to the second i think that one in crampton don't they call the suburb there there were three sitting-rooms don't you remember how we laughed at the number compared with the three bedrooms but i have planned it all the front room downstairs is to be your study and our dining-room poor papa for you know we settled mamma is to have as cheerful a sitting-room as we can get and that front room upstairs with the atrocious blue and pink paper and heavy cornice had really a pretty view over the plain with a great bend of a river or a canal or whatever it is down below 
then i could have the little bedroom behind in that projection at the head of the first flight of stairs over the kitchen you know and you and mamma the room behind the drawing-room and that closet in the roof will make you a splendid dressing-room but dixon and the girl we are to have to help oh wait a minute i am overpowered by the discovery of my own genius for management dixon is to have let me see i had it once the back sitting-room i think she will like that she grumbles so much about the stairs at heston and the girl is to have that sloping attic over your room and mamma's won't that do i dare say it will but the papers what taste and the overloading such a house with colour and such heavy cornices never mind papa surely you can charm the landlord into repapering one or two of the rooms the drawing-room and your bedroom for mamma will come in most contact with them and your bookshelves will hide a great deal of that gaudy paper in the dining-room then you think it best if so i had better go at once and call on this mr donkin to whom the advertisement refers me i will take you back to the hotel where you can order lunch and rest and by the time it is ready i shall be with you i hope i shall be able to get new papers margaret hoped so too though she said nothing she had never come fairly in contact with the taste that loves ornament however bad more than plainness and simplicity which are of themselves the framework of elegance her father took her through the entrance of the hotel and leaving her at the foot of the staircase went to the address of the landlord of the house they had fixed upon just as margaret had her hand on the door of their sitting-room she was followed by a quick-stepping waiter i beg your pardon ma'am the gentleman was gone so quickly i had no time to tell him mr thornton called almost directly after you left and as i understood from what the gentleman said you would be back in an hour i told him so and he came again five minutes ago and said he would wait for mr hale he is in your room now ma'am thank you my father will return soon and then you can tell him margaret opened the door and went in with the straight fearless dignified presence habitual to her she felt no awkwardness she had too much the habits of society for that here was a person come on business to her father and as he was one who had shown himself obliging she was disposed to treat him with a full measure of civility mr thornton was a good deal more surprised and discomfited than she instead of a quiet middle-aged clergyman a young lady came forward with frank dignity a young lady of a different type to most of those he was in the habit of seeing her dress was very plain a close straw bonnet of the best material and shape trimmed with white ribbon a dark silk gown without any trimmings or flounce a large indian shawl which hung about her in long heavy folds and which she wore as an empress wears her drapery he did not understand who she was as he caught the simple straight unabashed look which showed that his being there was of no concern to the beautiful countenance and called up no flush of surprise to the pale ivory of the complexion he had heard that mr hale had a daughter but he had imagined that she was a little girl mr thornton i believe said margaret after a half instant's pause during which his unready words would not come will you sit down my father brought me to the door not a minute ago but unfortunately he was not told that you were here and he has gone away on some business but he will come back almost directly i am sorry you have had the trouble of calling twice mr thornton was in habits of authority himself but she seemed to assume some kind of rule over him at once he had been getting impatient at the loss of his time on a market day the moment before she appeared yet now he calmly took a seat at her bidding do you know where it is that mr hale has gone to perhaps i might be able to find him he has gone to mr donkin's in canute street he is the landlord of the house my father wishes to take in crampton mr thornton knew the house he had seen the advertisement and been to look at it in compliance with the request of mr bell's that he would assist mr hale to the best of his power and also instigated by his own interest in the cause of a clergyman who had given up his living under circumstances such as those of mr hale mr thornton had thought that the house in crampton was really just the thing but now that he saw margaret with her superb ways of moving and looking he began to feel ashamed of having imagined that it would do very well for the hales 
in spite of a certain vulgarity in it which had struck him at the time of his looking it over. Margaret could not help her looks, but the short curled upper lip, the round, massive, upturned chin, the manner of carrying her head, her movements, full of a soft feminine defiance, always gave strangers the impression of haughtiness. She was tired now, and would rather have remained silent, and taken the rest her father had planned for her. But, of course, she owed it to herself to be a gentlewoman, and to speak courteously from time to time to this stranger. Not over-brushed, nor over-polished, it must be confessed, after his rough encounter with Milton streets and crowds. She wished that he would go, as he had once spoken of doing, instead of sitting there, answering with curt sentences all the remarks she made. She had taken off her shawl, and hung it over the back of her chair. She sat facing him, and facing the light. Her full beauty met his eye. Her round, white, inflexible throat, rising out of the full, yet lithe figure. Her lips, moving so slightly as she spoke, not breaking the cold, serene look of her face with any variation from the one lovely, haughty curve. Her eyes, with their soft gloom, meeting his with quiet, maiden freedom. He almost said to himself that he did not like her, before their conversation ended. He tried so to compensate himself for the mortifying feeling that while he looked upon her with an admiration he could not repress, she looked at him with proud indifference, taking him, he thought, for what, in his irritation, he told himself he was, a great rough fellow, with not a grace or a refinement about him. Her quiet coldness of demeanour he interpreted into contemptuousness, and resented it in his heart to the pitch of almost inclining him to get up and go away, and have nothing more to do with these hails, and their superciliousness. Just as Margaret had exhausted her last subject of conversation, and yet conversation that could hardly be called which consisted of so few and such short speeches, her father came in, and with his pleasant, gentlemanly courteousness of apology, reinstated his name and family in Mr. Thornton's good opinion. Mr. Hale and his visitor had a good deal to say respecting their mutual friend, Mr. Bell, and Margaret, glad that her part of entertaining the visitor was over, went to the window to try and make herself more familiar with the strange aspect of the street. She got so much absorbed in watching what was going on outside that she hardly heard her father when he spoke to her, and he had to repeat what he said. "'Margaret, the landlord will persist in admiring that hideous paper, and I am afraid we must let it remain.' "'Oh, dear, I am sorry,' she replied, and began to turn over in her mind the possibility of hiding part of it, at least, by some of her sketches, but gave up the idea at last, as likely only to make bad worse. Her father, meanwhile, with his kindly country hospitality, was pressing Mr. Thornton to stay to luncheon with them. It would have been very inconvenient to him to do so, yet he felt that he should have yielded, if Margaret by word or look had seconded her father's invitation. He was glad she did not, and yet he was irritated at her for not doing it. She gave him a low, grave bow when he left, and he felt more awkward and self-conscious in every limb than he had ever done in all his life before. "'Well, Margaret, now to luncheon, as fast as we can. Have you ordered it?' "'No, Papa. That man was here when I came home, and I have never had an opportunity. Then we must take anything we can get. He must have been waiting a long time, I'm afraid. It seemed exceedingly long to me. I was just at the last gasp when you came in. He never went on with any subject, but gave little, short, abrupt answers. Very much to the point, though, I should think. He is a clear-headed fellow. He said, Did you hear, that Crampton is on gravelly soil, and by far the most healthy suburb in the neighbourhood of Milton. When they returned to Heston, there was the day's account to be given to Mrs. Hale, who was full of questions which they answered in the intervals of tea-drinking. "'And what is your correspondent, Mr. Thornton, like?' "'Ask Margaret,' said her husband. "'She and he had a long attempt at conversation, while I was away speaking to the landlord.' "'Oh, I hardly know what he is like,' said Margaret, lazily too tired to tax her powers of description much, and then rousing herself, she said, "'He is a tall, broad-shouldered man, about—how old, Papa?' "'I should guess about thirty. "'About thirty, 
with a face that is neither exactly plain nor yet handsome, nothing remarkable, not quite a gentleman, but that was hardly to be expected. "'Not vulgar or common, though,' put in her father, rather jealous of any disparagement of the sole friend he had in Milton. "'Oh, no,' said Margaret, with such an expression of resolution and power, no face, however plain in feature, could be either vulgar or common. I should not like to have to bargain with him. He looks very inflexible. Altogether a man who seems made for his niche, Mamma, Sagacious, and strong, as becomes a great tradesman. "'Don't call the Milton manufacturers tradesmen, Margaret,' said her father. "'They are very different.' "'Are they? I apply the word to all who have something tangible to sell. But if you think the term is not correct, Papa, I won't use it. But, oh, Mamma, speaking of vulgarity and commonness, you must prepare yourself for our drawing-room paper, pink and blue roses with yellow leaves, and such a heavy cornice round the room. But when they removed to their new house in Milton, the obnoxious papers were gone. The landlord received their thanks very composedly, and let them think, if they liked, that he had relented from his expressed determination not to repaper. There was no particular need to tell him that what he did not care to do for a reverend Mr. Hale, unknown in Milton, he was only too glad to do at the one short, sharp remonstrance of Mr. Thornton, the wealthy manufacturer. End of chapter 7Chapter Eight of North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter Eight, Homesickness. And it's hame, 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 hame. Fain would I be. It needed the pretty light papering of the rooms to reconcile them to Milton. It needed more, more that could not be had. The thick yellow November fogs had come on, and the view of the plain in the valley, made by the sweeping bend of the river, was all shut out when Mrs. Hale arrived at her new home. Margaret and Dixon had been at work for two days, unpacking and arranging, but everything inside the house still looked in disorder, and outside a thick fog crept up to the very windows and was driven in to every open door in choking white wreaths of unwholesome mist. Oh! "'Margaret, are we to live here?' asked Mrs. Hale in blank dismay. Margaret's heart echoed the dreariness of the tone in which the question was put. She could scarcely command herself enough to say, "'Oh, the fogs in London are sometimes far worse.' "'But then you knew that London itself, and friends, lay behind it. Here, well, we are desolate. Oh, Dixon, what a place this is!' "'Indeed, ma'am. I'm sure it will be your death before long, and then all know who'll—' "'Stay, Miss Hale. That's far too heavy for you to lift.' "'Not at all. Thank you, Dixon,' replied Margaret coldly. "'The best thing we can do for Mamma is to get her room quite ready for her to go to bed, while I go and bring her a cup of coffee.' Mr. Hale was equally out of spirits, and equally came upon Margaret for sympathy. "'Margaret! I do believe this is an unhealthy place. Only suppose that your mother's health, or yours, should suffer. I wish I had gone to some country place in Wales. This is really terrible," said he, going up to the window. There was no comfort to be given. They were settled in Milton, and must endure smoke and fogs for a season. Indeed, all other life seemed shut out from them by as thick a fog of circumstance. Only the day before Mr. Hale had been reckoning up with dismay how much their removal and fortnight at Heston had cost, and he found it had absorbed nearly all his little stock of ready money. No, here they were, and here they must remain. At night, when Margaret realized this, she felt inclined to sit down in a stupor of despair. The heavy, smoky air hung about her bedroom, which occupied the long, narrow projection at the back of the house. The window, placed at the side of the oblong, looked to the blank wall of a similar projection, not above ten feet distant. It loomed through the fog like a great barrier to hope. Inside the room everything was in confusion. All their efforts had been directed to make her mother's room comfortable. 
Margaret sat down on a box, the direction card upon which struck her as having been written at Helstone. Beautiful, beloved Helstone. She lost herself in dismal thought, but at last she determined to take her mind away from the present, and suddenly remembered that she had a letter from Edith which she had only half read in the bustle of the morning. It was to tell of their arrival at Corfu, their voyage along the Mediterranean, their music and dancing on board ship, the gay new life opening upon her, her house with its trellised balcony and its views over white cliffs and deep blue sea. Edith wrote fluently and well, if not graphically. She could not only seize the salient and characteristic points of a scene, but she could enumerate enough of the indiscriminate particulars for Margaret to make it out for herself. Captain Lennox and another lately married officer shared a villa, high up on the beautiful, precipitous rocks overhanging the sea. Their days, late as it was in the year, seemed spent in boating or land picnics, all out of doors, pleasure-seeking and glad. Edith's life seemed like the deep vault of blue sky above her, free, utterly free, from fleck or cloud. Her husband had to attend drill, and she, the most musical officer's wife there, had to copy the new and popular tunes out of the most recent English music for the benefit of the bandmaster. Those seemed their most severe and arduous duties. She expressed an affectionate hope that, if the regiment stopped another year at Corfu, Margaret might come out and pay her a long visit. She asked Margaret if she remembered the day twelve-month on which she, Edith, wrote, how it rained all day long in Harley Street, and how she would not put on her new gown to go to a stupid dinner, and get it all wet and splashed in going to the carriage, and how at that very dinner they had first met Captain Lennox. Yes, Margaret remembered it well. Edith and Mrs. Shaw had gone to dinner. Margaret had joined the party in the evening. The recollection of the plentiful luxury of all the arrangements, the stately handsomeness of the furniture, the size of the house, the peaceful, untroubled ease of the visitors, all came vividly before her, in strange contrast to the present time. The smooth sea of that old life closed up, without a mark left to tell where they had all been. The habitual dinners, the calls, the shopping, the dancing evenings, were all going on, going on for ever, though her Aunt Shaw and Edith were no longer there, and she, of course, was even less missed. She doubted if any one of that old set ever thought of her, except Henry Lennox. He, too, she knew, would strive to forget her, because of the pain she had caused him. She had heard him often boast of his power of putting any disagreeable thought far away from him. Then she penetrated farther into what might have been. If she had cared for him as a lover, and had accepted him, and this change in her father's opinions and consequent station had taken place, she could not doubt but that it would have been impatiently received by Mr. Lennox. It was a bitter mortification to her, in one sense, but she could bear it patiently, because she knew her father's purity of purpose, and that strengthened her to endure his errors, grave and serious, though in her estimation they were. But the fact of the world esteeming her father degraded, in its rough wholesale judgment, would have oppressed and irritated Mr. Lennox. As she realized what might have been, she grew to be thankful for what was— they were at the lowest now. They could not be worse. Edith's astonishment and her Aunt Shaw's dismay would have to be met bravely when their letters came. So Margaret rose up and began slowly to undress herself, feeling the full luxury of acting leisurely, late as it was, after all the past hurry of the day. She fell asleep, hoping for some brightness, either internal or external. But if she had known how long it would be before the brightness came, her heart would have sunk low. The time of the year was most unpropitious to health as well as to spirits. Her mother caught a severe cold, and Dixon herself was evidently not well, although Margaret could not insult her more than by trying to save her or by taking any care of her. They could hear of no girl to assist her. All were at work in the factories. At least, those who applied were well scolded by Dixon, for thinking such as they could ever be trusted to work in a gentleman's house. So they had to keep a charwoman in almost constant employ. Margaret longed to send for Charlotte, but, besides the objection of her being a better servant than they could now afford to keep, 
the distance was too great. Mr. Hale met with several pupils, recommended to him by Mr. Bell, or by the more immediate influence of Mr. Thornton. They were mostly of the age when many boys would be still at school, but, according to the prevalent and apparently well-founded notions of Milton, to make a lad into a good tradesman he must be caught young and acclimated to the life of the mill, or office, or warehouse. If he were sent even to the Scotch universities, he came back unsettled for commercial pursuits. How much more so if he went to Oxford or Cambridge, where he could not be entered until he was eighteen? So most of the manufacturers placed their sons in sucking situations at fourteen or fifteen years of age, unsparingly cutting away all offshoots in the direction of literature or high mental cultivation, in hopes of throwing the whole strength and vigor of the plant into commerce. Still there were some wiser parents, and some young men, who had sense enough to perceive their own deficiencies and strive to remedy them. Nay, there were a few no longer used, but men in the prime of life, who had the stern wisdom to acknowledge their own ignorance, and to learn late what they should have learnt early. Mr. Thornton was perhaps the oldest of Mr. Hale's pupils. He was certainly the favourite. Mr. Hale got into the habit of quoting his opinions so frequently, and with such regard, that it became a little domestic joke to wonder what time, during the hour appointed for instruction, could be given to absolute learning, so much of it appeared to have been spent in conversation. Margaret rather encouraged this light, merry way of viewing her father's acquaintance with Mr. Thornton, because she felt that her mother was inclined to look upon this new friendship of her husband's with jealous eyes. As long as his time had been solely occupied with his books and his parishioners, as at Helstone, she had appeared to care little whether she saw much of him or not. But now that he looked eagerly forward to each renewal of his intercourse with Mr. Thornton, she seemed hurt and annoyed as if he were slighting her companionship for the first time. Mr. Hale's overpraise had the usual effect of overpraise upon his auditors. They were a little inclined to rebel against Aristides being always called the just. After a quiet life in a country parsonage for more than twenty years, there was something dazzling to Mr. Hale in the energy which conquered immense difficulties with ease, the power of the machinery of Milton, the power of the men of Milton, impressed him with a sense of grandeur which he yielded to without caring to inquire into the details of its exercise. But Margaret went less abroad, among machinery and men, saw less of power in its public effect, and, as it happened, she was thrown with one or two of those who, in all measures affecting masses of people, must be acute sufferers for the good of many. The question always is, has everything been done to make the sufferings of these exceptions as small as possible? Or, in the triumph of the crowded procession, have the helpless been trampled on, instead of being gently lifted aside out of the roadway of the conqueror, whom they have no power to accompany on his march? It fell to Margaret's share, to have to look out for a servant to assist Dixon, who had at first undertaken to find just the person she wanted to do all the rough work of the house, but Dixon's ideas of helpful girls were founded on the recollection of tidy elder scholars at Helstone School, who were only too proud to be allowed to come to the parsonage on a busy day, and treated Mrs. Dixon with all the respect, and a good deal more of fright, which they paid to Mr. and Mrs. Hale. Dixon was not unconscious of this odd reverence which was given to her, nor did she dislike it. It flattered her as much as Louis the Fourteenth was flattered by his courtiers shading their eyes from the dazzling light of his presence. But nothing short of her faithful love for Mrs. Hale could have made her endure the rough independent way in which all the Milton girls, who made application for the servant's place, replied to her inquiries respecting their qualifications. They even went to the length of questioning her back again, having doubts and fears of their own, as to the solvency of a family who lived in a house of thirty pounds a year, and yet gave themselves airs and kept two servants, one of them so very high and mighty. Mr. Hale was no longer looked upon as vicar of Helstone, but as a man who only spent at a certain rate. Margaret was weary and impatient of the accounts which Dixon perpetually brought to Mrs. Hale of the behaviour of these would-be servants. Not but what Margaret was repelled by the rough, uncourteous manners of these people— not but what she shrunk with fastidious pride from their hail-fellow accost, and severely resented their unconcealed curiosity as to the means and position of any family who lived in Milton, and yet were not engaged in trade of some kind. 
but the more margaret felt impertinence the more likely she was to be silent on the subject and at any rate if she took upon herself to make inquiry for a servant she could spare her mother the recital of all her disappointments and fancied or real insults margaret accordingly went up and down to butchers and grocers seeking for a non pareil of a girl and lowering her hopes and expectations every week as she found the difficulty of meeting with any one in the manufacturing town who would not prefer the better wages and greater independence of working in a mill it was something of a trial to margaret to go out by herself in this busy bustling place mrs shaw's ideas of propriety and her own helpless dependence on others had always made her insist that a footman should accompany edith and margaret if they went beyond harley street or the immediate neighbourhood the limits by which this rule of her aunt's had circumscribed margaret's independence had been silently rebelled against at the time and she had doubly enjoyed the free walks and rambles of her forest life from the contrast which they presented she went along there with a bounding fearless step that occasionally broke out into a run if she were in a hurry and occasionally was stilled into perfect repose as she stood listening to or watching any of the wild creatures who sang in the leafy courts or glanced out with their keen bright eyes from the low brushwood or tangled firs it was a trial to come down from such motion or such stillness only guided by her own sweet will to the even and decorous pace necessary in streets but she could have laughed at herself for minding this change if it had not been accompanied by what was a more serious annoyance the side of town on which crampton lay was especially a thoroughfare for the factory people in the back streets around them there were many mills out of which poured streams of men and women two or three times a day until margaret had learnt the times of their ingress and egress she was very unfortunate in constantly falling in with them they came rushing along with bold fearless faces and loud laughs and jests particularly aimed at all those who appeared to be above them in rank or station the tones of their unrestrained voices and their carelessness of all common rules of street politeness frightened margaret a little at first the girls with their rough but not unfriendly freedom would comment on her dress even touch her shawl or gown to ascertain the exact material nay once or twice she was asked questions relative to some article which they particularly admired there was such a simple reliance on her womanly sympathy with their love of dress and on her kindliness that she gladly replied to these inquiries as soon as she understood them and half smiled back at their remarks she did not mind meeting any number of girls loud-spoken and boisterous though they might be but she alternately dreaded and fired up against the workmen who commented not on her dress but on her looks in the same open fearless manner she who had hitherto felt that even the most refined remark on her personal appearance was an impertinence had to endure undisguised admiration from these outspoken men but the very outspokenness marked their innocence of any intention to hurt her delicacy as she would have perceived if she had been less frightened by the disorderly tumult out of her fright came a flash of indignation which made her face scarlet and her dark eyes gather flame as she heard some of their speeches yet there were other sayings of theirs which when she reached the quiet safety of home amused her even while they irritated her for instance one day after she had passed a number of men several of whom had paid her the not unusual compliment of wishing she was their sweetheart one of the lingerers added your bonny face my lass makes the day look brighter and another day as she was unconsciously smiling at some passing thought she was addressed by a poorly dressed middle-aged workman with you may well smile my lass many a one would smile to have such a bonny face this man looked so careworn that margaret could not help giving him an answering smile glad to think that her looks such as they were should have had the power to call up a pleasant thought he seemed to understand her acknowledging glance and a silent recognition was established between them whenever the chances of the day brought them across each other's paths they had never exchanged a word nothing had been said but that first compliment yet somehow margaret looked upon this man with more interest than upon any one else in milton once or twice on sundays she saw him walking with a girl evidently his daughter and if possible still more unhealthy than he was himself 
one day margaret and her father had been as far as the fields that lay around the town it was early spring and she had gathered some of the hedge and ditch flowers dog violets lesser celadines and the like with an unspoken lament in her heart for the sweet profusion of the south her father had left her to go into milton upon some business and on the road home she met her humble friends the girl looked wistfully at the flowers and acting on a sudden impulse margaret offered them to her her pale blue eyes lighted up as she took them and her father spoke for her thank you miss bess you'll think a deal o them flowers that who will and i shall think a deal o your kindness you're not of this country i reckon no said margaret half sighing i came from the south from hampshire she continued a little afraid of wounding the consciousness of ignorance if she used a name which he did not understand that's beyond london i reckon and i come for burly ways and forty miles to the north and yet you'll see north and south has both met and made kind of friends in this big smoky place margaret had slackened her pace to walk alongside of the man and his daughter whose steps were regulated by the feebleness of the latter she now spoke to the girl and there was a sound of tender pity in the tone of her voice as she did so that went right to the heart of the father i am afraid you are not very strong no said the girl nor never will be spring is coming said margaret as if to suggest pleasant hopeful thoughts spring nor summer will do me good said the girl quietly margaret looked up at the man almost expecting some contradiction from him or at least some remark that would modify his daughter's utter hopelessness but instead he added i'm afeard who speaks the truth i'm afeard who's too far gone in a waste i shall have a spring where i'm bound to and flowers and amaranths and shining robes besides poor lass poor lass said her father in a low tone i'm none so sure o that but it's a comfort to thee poor lass poor lass poor father it'll be soon margaret was shocked by his words shocked but not repelled rather attracted and interested where do you live i think we must be neighbours we meet so often on this road we put up at nine francis street second turn to the left after you've passed the golden dragon and your name i must not forget that i'm none ashamed of my name it's nicholas higgins who's called bessie higgins what are you asking for margaret was surprised at this last question for at helstone it would have been an understood thing after the inquiry she had made that she intended to come and call upon any poor neighbour whose name and habitation she had asked for i thought i meant to come and see you she suddenly felt rather shy of offering the visit without having any reason to give for her wish to make it beyond a kindly interest in a stranger it seemed all at once to take the shape of an impertinence on her part she read this meaning too in the man's eyes i'm none so fond of having strange folk in my house but then relenting as he saw her heightened colour he added you're a foreigner as one may say and maybe don't know many folk here and you've given my wench here flowers out of your own hand you may come if you like margaret was half amused half nettled at this answer she was not sure if she would go where permission was given so like a favour conferred but when they came to the town into francis street the girl stopped a minute and said you'll not forget you're to come and see us ay ay said the father impatiently who'll come who's a bit set up now because who thinks i might have spoken more civilly but who'll think better on it and come i can read her proud bonny face like a book come along bess there's the mill bell ringin margaret went home wondering at her new friends and smiling at the man's insight into what had been passing in her mind from that day milton became a brighter place to her it was not the long bleak sunny days of spring nor yet was it that time was reconciling her to the town of her habitation it was that she had found a human interest End of chapter eight Chapter nine of North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. 
Chapter Nine, Dressing for Tea. Let China's earth, enriched with coloured stains, pencilled with gold and streaked with azure veins, the grateful flavour of the Indian leaf or Moko's sunburnt berry glad receive. Mrs. Barbald. The day after this meeting with Higgins and his daughter, Mr. Hale came upstairs into the little drawing room at an unusual hour. He went up to different objects in the room, as if examining them, but Margaret saw that it was merely a nervous trick, a way of putting off something he wished, yet feared to say. Out it came at last. "'My dear, I've asked Mr. Thornton to come to tea to-night.' Mrs. Hale was leaning back in her easy-chair, with her eyes shut, and an expression of pain on her face which had become habitual to her of late, but she roused up into querulousness at this speech of her husband's. "'Mr. Thornton, and to-night! What in the world does the man want to come here for? And Dixon is washing my muslins and laces, and there is no soft water with all these horrid east winds, which I suppose we shall have all the year round in Milton.' "'The wind is veering round, my dear,' said Mr. Hale, looking out at the smoke, which drifted right from the east only he did not yet understand the points of the compass, and rather arranged them ad libitum according to circumstances. "'Don't tell me,' said Mrs. Hale, shuddering up, and wrapping her shawl about her still more closely. "'But, east or west wind, I suppose this man comes.' "'Oh, mamma, that shows you never saw Mr. Thornton. He looks like a person who would enjoy battling with every adverse thing he could meet with, enemies winds or circumstances the more it rains and blows the more certain we are to have him but i'll go and help dixon i'm getting to be a famous clear starcher and he won't want any amusement beyond talking to papa papa i am really longing to see phytheus to your daemon you know i never saw him but once and then we were so puzzled to know what to say to each other that we did not get on particularly well i don't know that you would ever like him or think him agreeable, Margaret. He's not a ladies' man. Margaret wreathed her throat in a scornful curve. I don't particularly admire ladies' men, Papa, but Mr. Thornton comes here as your friend, as one who has appreciated you. The only person in Milton, said Mrs. Hale. So we will give him a welcome, and some cocoa nut cakes. Dixon will be flattered if we ask her to make some, and I will undertake to iron your caps, Mamma. Many a time that morning did Margaret wish Mr. Thornton far enough away. She had planned other employments for herself, a letter to Edith, a good piece of Dante, a visit to the Higginses, but, instead, she ironed away, listening to Dixon's complaints, and only hoping that by an excess of sympathy she might prevent her from carrying the recital of her sorrows to Mrs. Hale. Every now and then Margaret had to remind herself of her father's regard for Mr. Thornton, to subdue the irritation of weariness that was stealing over her, and bringing on one of the bad headaches to which she had lately become liable. She could hardly speak when she sat down at last, and told her mother that she was no longer Peggy the laundry-maid, but Margaret Hale the lady. She meant this speech for a little joke, and was vexed enough with her busy tongue when she found her mother taking it seriously. "'Yes, if any one had told me, when I was Miss Beersford, and one of the bells of the county, that a child of mine would have to stand half a day in a little pokey kitchen, working away like any servant, that we might prepare properly for the reception of a tradesman, and that this tradesman should be the only— Oh, mamma," said Margaret, lifting herself up, don't punish me so for a careless speech. I don't mind ironing, or any kind of work, for you and papa. I am myself a born and bred lady through it all and even though it comes to scouring a floor or washing dishes. I am tired now, just for a little while, but in half an hour I shall be ready to do the same over again, and as to Mr. Thornton's being in trade, why, he can't help that now, poor fellow. I don't suppose his education would fit him for much else. Margaret lifted herself slowly up and went to her own room, for just now she could not bear much more. In Mr. Thornton's house, at this very same time, a similar, yet different, scene was going on. A large-boned lady, long past middle age, 
sat at work in a grim, handsomely furnished dining-room. Her features, like her frame, were strong and massive, rather than heavy. Her face moved slowly from one decided expression to another equally decided. There was no great variety in her countenance, but those who looked at it once generally looked at it again. Even the passers-by in the street half turned their heads to gaze an instant longer at the firm, severe, dignified woman, who never gave way in street courtesy, or paused in her straight onward course to the clearly defined end which she proposed to herself. She was handsomely dressed in stout black silk, of which not a thread was worn or discoloured. She was mending a large, long tablecloth of the finest texture, holding it up against the light occasionally to discover thin places which required her delicate care. There was not a book about in the room, with the exception of Matthew Henry's Bible commentaries, six volumes of which lay in the centre of the massive sideboard, flanked by a tea-urn on one side and a lamp on the other. In some remote apartment there was exercise upon the piano going on. Someone was practising up a morceau de salon, playing it very rapidly, every third note, on an average, being either indistinct or wholly missed out, and the loud chords at the end being half of them false, but not the less satisfactory to the performer. Mrs. Thornton heard a step, like her own in its decisive character, pass the dining-room door. "'John, is that you?' Her son opened the door and showed himself. "'What has brought you home so early? I thought you were going to tea with that friend of Mr. Bell's, that Mr. Hale. So I am, mother. I came home to dress. Dress? Huh! When I was a girl, young men were satisfied with dressing once in a day. Why should you dress to go and take a cup of tea with an old parson? Mr. Hale is a gentleman, and his wife and daughter are ladies. Wife and daughter? Do they teach, too? What do they do? You have never mentioned them. No, mother because I have never seen Mrs. Hale, and I have only seen Miss Hale for half an hour. "'Take care you don't get caught by a penniless girl, John.' "'I am not easily caught, mother, as I think you know. But I must not have Miss Hale spoken of in that way, which, you know, is offensive to me. I never was aware of any young lady trying to catch me yet, nor do I believe that any one has ever given themselves that useless trouble.' Mrs. Thornton did not choose to yield the point to her son, or else she had, in general, pride enough for her sex. Well, I only say, take care. Perhaps our Milton girls have too much spirit and good feeling to go angling after husbands, but this Miss Hale comes out of the aristocratic counties, where, if tales be true, rich husbands are reckoned prizes. Mr. Thornton's brow contracted, and he came a step forward into the room. Mother, with a short scornful laugh, you will make me confess. The only time I saw Miss Hale, she treated me with a haughty civility which had a strong flavour of contempt in it. She held herself aloof from me as if she had been a queen, and I her humble, unwashed vassal. Be easy, mother. No, I am not easy, nor content either. What business had she, her renegade clergyman's daughter, to turn up her nose at you. I would dress for none of them, a saucy set, if I were you. As he was leaving the room, he said, Mr. Hale is good, and gentle, and learned. He is not saucy. As for Mrs. Hale, I will tell you what she is like to-night, if you care to hear. He shut the door, and was gone. Despise my son. Treat him as a vassal, indeed. Huh! I should like to know where she could find such another. Boy and man, he is the noblest, stoutest heart I ever knew. I don't care if I am his mother. I can see what's what, and not be blind. I know what Fanny is, and I know what John is. Despise him. I hate her. End of chapter 9 Chapter Ten of North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Ten, Wrought Iron and Gold. 
We are the trees whom shaking fastens more. George Herbert Mr. Thornton left the house without coming into the dining-room again, and walked rapidly out to Crampton. He was anxious not to slight his new friend by any disrespectful unpunctuality. The church clock struck half-past seven as he stood at the door awaiting Dixon's slow movements, always doubly tardy when she had to degrade herself by answering the doorbell. He was ushered into the little drawing-room, and kindly greeted by Mr. Hale, who led him up to his wife, whose pale face and shawl-draped figure made a silent excuse for the cold languor of her greeting. Margaret was lighting the lamp when he entered, for the darkness was coming on. The lamp threw a pretty light into the centre of the dusky room, from which, with country habits, they did not exclude the night skies and the outer darkness of air. Somehow that room contrasted itself with the one he had lately left. Handsome, ponderous, with no sign of feminine habitation, except in the one spot where his mother sat, and no convenience for any other employment than eating and drinking. To be sure, it was a dining-room, his mother preferred to sit in it, and her will was a household law. But the drawing-room was not like this. It was twice, twenty times as fine, not one quarter as comfortable. Here were no mirrors, not even a scrap of glass to reflect the light, and answer the same purpose as water in a landscape. No gilding, a warm, sober breath of colouring, well relieved by the dear old hellstone chintz curtains and chair covers. An open davenport stood in the window opposite the door. In the other there was a stand, with a tall white china vase, from which drooped wreaths of English ivy, pale green birch, and copper-coloured beech leaves. Pretty baskets of work stood about in different places, and books, not cared for on account of their binding solely, lay on one table, as if recently put down. Behind the door was another table, decked out for tea, with a white tablecloth, on which flourished the coconut cakes, and a basket piled with oranges and ruddy American apples, heaped on leaves. It appeared to Mr. Thornton that all these graceful cares were habitual to the family, and especially of a piece with Margaret. She stood by the tea-table in a light-coloured muslin gown, which had a good deal of pink about it. She looked as if she was not attending to the conversation, but solely busy with the teacups, among which her round ivory hands moved with pretty, noiseless daintiness. She had a bracelet on one taper arm, which would fall down over her round wrist. Mr. Thornton watched the replacing of this troublesome ornament with far more attention than he listened to her father. It seemed as if it fascinated him to see her push it up impatiently, until it tightened her soft flesh, and then to mark the loosening, the fall. He could almost have exclaimed, "'There it goes, again!' There was so little left to be done after he arrived at the preparation for tea that he was almost sorry the obligation of eating and drinking came so soon as to prevent his watching Margaret. She handed him his cup of tea with the proud air of an unwilling slave, but her eye caught the moment when he was ready for another cup, and he almost longed to ask her to do for him what he saw her compelled to do for her father, who took her little finger and thumb in his masculine hand and made them serve as sugar-tongs. Mr. Thornton saw her beautiful eyes lifted to her father, full of light, half laughter and half love, as this bit of pantomime went on between the two, unobserved, as they fancied, by any. Margaret's head still ached, as the paleness of her complexion, and her silence might have testified, but she was resolved to throw herself into the breach, if there was any long, untoward pause, rather than that her father's friend, pupil, and guest, should have cause to think himself in any way neglected. But the conversation went on, and Margaret drew into a corner, near her mother, with her work, after the tea-things were taken away, and felt that she might let her thoughts roam, without fear of being suddenly wanted to fill a gap. Mr. Thornton and Mr. Hale were both absorbed in the continuation of some subject which had been started at their last meeting. Margaret was recalled to a sense of the present by some trivial, low-spoken remark of her mother's, and on suddenly looking up from her work, her eye was caught by the difference of outward appearance between her father and Mr. Thornton, as betokening such distinctly opposite natures. Her father was of slight figure, which made him appear taller than he really was, 
when not contrasted, as at this time, with the tall, massive frame of another. The lines in her father's face were soft and waving, with a frequent undulating kind of trembling movement passing over them, showing every fluctuating emotion. The eyelids were large and arched, giving to the eyes a peculiar languid beauty which was almost feminine. The brows were finely arched, but were, by the very size of the dreamy lids, raised to a considerable distance from the eyes. Now, in Mr. Thornton's face, the straight brows fell low over the clear, deep-set, earnest eyes, which, without being unpleasantly sharp, seemed intent enough to penetrate into the very heart and core of what he was looking at. The lines in the face were few but firm, as if they were carved in marble, and lay principally about the lips, which were slightly compressed over a set of teeth so faultless and beautiful as to give the effect of sudden sunlight when the rare bright smile, coming in an instant and shining out of the eyes, changed the whole look from the severe resolved expression of a man ready to do and dare everything, to the keen honest enjoyment of the moment, which is seldom shown so fearlessly and instantaneously except by children. Margaret liked this smile. It was the first thing she had admired in this new friend of her father's, and the opposition of character, shown in all these details of appearance she had just been noticing, seemed to explain the attraction they evidently felt towards each other. She rearranged her mother's worsted work, and fell back into her own thoughts, as completely forgotten by Mr. Thornton as if she had not been in the room, so thoroughly was he occupied in explaining to Mr. Hale the magnificent power, yet delicate adjustment, of the might of the steam-hammer, which was recalling to Mr. Hale some of the wonderful stories of the subservient genie in the Arabian Nights, one moment stretching from earth to sky and filling all the width of the horizon, and the next obediently compressed into a vase small enough to be born in the hand of a child. And this imagination of power, this practical realization of a gigantic thought, came out of one man's brain in our good town. That very man has it within him to mount, step by step, on each wonder he achieves, to higher marvels still. And I'll be bound to say, we have many among us who, if he were gone, could spring into the breach and carry on the war which compels, and shall compel, all material power to yield to science. "'Your boast reminds me of the old lines. "'I've a hundred captains in England,' he said, "'as good as ever he was.' "'At her father's quotation Margaret looked suddenly up, "'with inquiring wonder in her eyes. "'How in the world had they got from cogwheels to Chevy Chase?' "'It's no boast of mine,' replied Mr. Thornton. "'It is plain matter of fact. "'I won't deny that I am proud of belonging to a town, "'or perhaps I should rather say a district.' the necessities of which give birth to such grandeur of conception. I would rather be a man toiling, suffering, nay, failing and successless, here, than lead a dull, prosperous life in the well-worn grooves of what you call more aristocratic society down in the South, with their slow days of careless ease. One may be clogged with honey and unable to rise and fly. "'You are mistaken,' said Margaret, roused by the aspersion on her beloved South to a fond vehemence of defence that brought the colour into her cheeks and the angry tears into her eyes. You do not know anything about the South. If there is less adventure or less progress, I suppose I must not say less excitement, from the gambling spirit of trade, which seems requisite to force out these wonderful inventions, there is less suffering also. I see men here going about in the streets who look ground down by some pinching sorrow or care, who are not only sufferers but haters. Now, in the South we have our poor, but there is not that terrible expression in their countenances of a sullen sense of injustice which I see here. You do not know the South, Mr. Thornton, she concluded, collapsing into a determined silence, and angry with herself for having said so much. And may I say you do not know the North? asked he, with an inexpressible gentleness in his tone, as he saw that he had really hurt her. She continued resolutely silent, yet yearning after the lovely haunts she had left far away in Hampshire, with a passionate longing that made her feel her voice would be unsteady and trembling if she spoke. "'At any rate, Mr. Thornton,' said Mrs. Hale, 
you will allow that milton is a much more smoky dirty town than you will ever meet with in the south i am afraid i must give up its cleanliness said mr thornton with the quick gleaming smile but we are bidden by parliament to burn our own smoke so i suppose like good little children we shall do as we are bid some time but i thought you told me you had altered your chimneys so as to consume the smoke did you not asked mr hale mine were altered by my own will before parliament meddled with the affair it was an immediate outlay but it repays me in the saving of coal i am not sure whether i should have done it if i had waited until the act was passed at any rate i should have waited to be informed against and fined and given all the trouble in yielding that i legally could but all laws which depend for their enforcement upon informers and fines become inert from the odiousness of the machinery i doubt if there has been a chimney in milton informed against for five years past although some are constantly sending out one-third of their coal in what is called here unparliamentary smoke i only know it is impossible to keep the muslin blinds clean here above a week together and at hellstone we had them up for a month or more and they have not looked dirty at the end of that time and as for hands margaret how many times did you say you had washed your hands this morning before twelve o'clock three times was it not yes mamma you seem to have a strong objection to the acts of parliament and all legislation affecting your mode of management down here at milton said mr hale yes i have and many others have as well and with justice i think the whole machinery i don't mean the wood and iron machinery now of the cotton trade is so new that is it no wonder if it does not work well in every part all at once seventy years ago what was it and now what is it not raw crude materials came together men of the same level as regarding education and station took suddenly the different positions of masters and men owing to the mother wit as regarded opportunities and probabilities which distinguished some and made them far-seeing as to what great future lay concealed in that rude model of sir richard arkwright's the rapid development of what might be called a new trade gave those early masters enormous power of wealth and command i don't mean merely over the workmen i mean over purchasers over the whole world's market why i may give you as an instance an advertisement inserted not fifty years ago in a milton paper that so-and-so one of the half-dozen calico printers of the time would close his warehouse at noon each day therefore that all purchasers must come before that hour fancy a man dictating in this manner the time when he would sell and when he would not sell now i believe if a good customer chose to come at midnight i should get up and stand hat in hand to receive his orders margaret's lip curled but somehow she was compelled to listen she could no longer abstract herself in her own thoughts i only name such things to show what almost unlimited power the manufacturers had about the beginning of this century the men were rendered dizzy by it because a man was successful in his ventures there was no reason that in all other things his mind should be well balanced on the contrary his sense of justice and his simplicity were often utterly smothered under the glut of wealth that came down upon him and they tell strange tales of the wild extravagance of living indulged in on gala days by those early cotton lords there can be no doubt too of the tyranny they exercised over their workpeople you know the proverb mr hale set a beggar on horseback and he'll ride to the devil well some of these early manufacturers did ride to the devil in a magnificent style crushing human bone and flesh under their horses hoofs without remorse but by and by came a reaction there were more factories more masters more men were wanted the power of masters and men became more evenly balanced and now the battle is pretty fairly waged between us we will hardly submit to the decision of an umpire much less to the interference of a meddler with only a smattering of the knowledge of the real facts of the case even though that meddler be called the high court of parliament is there necessity for calling it a battle between the two classes asked mr hale i know from your using the term it is one which gives a true idea of the real state of things to your mind it is true and i believe it to be as much a necessity as that prudent wisdom and good conduct are always opposed to and doing battle with ignorance and improvidence 
it is one of the great beauties of our system that a working man may raise himself into the power and position of a master by his own exertions and behavior that in fact every one who rules himself to decency and sobriety of conduct and attention to his duties comes over to our ranks it may not always be as a master but as an overlooker a cashier a bookkeeper a clerk one on the side of authority and order you consider all who are unsuccessful in raising themselves in the world from whatever cause as your enemies then if i understand you rightly said margaret in a clear cold voice as their own enemies certainly said he quickly not a little piqued by the haughty disapproval her form of expression and tone of speaking implied but in a moment his straightforward honesty made him feel that his words were but a poor and quibbling answer to what she had said and be she as scornful as she liked it was a duty he owed to himself to explain as truly as he could what he did mean yet it was very difficult to separate her interpretation and keep it distinct from his meaning he could best have illustrated what he wanted to say by telling them something of his own life but was it not too personal a subject to speak about to strangers still it was the simple straightforward way of explaining his meaning so putting aside the touch of shyness that brought a momentary flush of colour into his dark cheek he said i am not speaking without book sixteen years ago my father died under very miserable circumstances i was taken from school and had to become a man as well as i could in a few days i had such a mother as few are blessed with a woman of strong power and firm resolve we went into a small country town where living was cheaper than in milton and where i got employment in a draper's shop a capital place by the way for obtaining a knowledge of goods week by week our income came to fifteen shillings out of which three people had to be kept my mother managed so that i could put by three of these fifteen shillings regularly this made the beginning this taught me self-denial now that i am able to afford my mother such comforts as her age rather than her own wish requires i thank her silently on each occasion for the early training she gave me now when i feel that in my own case it is no good luck nor merit nor talent but simply the habits of life which taught me to despise indulgences not thoroughly earned indeed never to think twice about them i believe that this suffering which miss hale says is impressed on the countenances of the people of milton is but the natural punishment of dishonestly enjoyed pleasure at some former period of their lives i do not look on self-indulgent sensual people as worthy of my hatred i simply look upon them with contempt for their poorness of character but you have had the rudiments of a good education remarked mr hale the quick zest with which you are now reading homer shows me that you do not come to it as an unknown book you have read it before and are only recalling your old knowledge that is true i had blundered along it at school i dare say i was even considered a pretty fair classic in those days though my latin and greek have slipped away from me since but i ask you what preparation they were for such a life as i had to lead none at all utterly none at all on the point of education any man who can read and write starts fair with me in the amount of really useful knowledge that i had at that time well i don't agree with you but there i am perhaps somewhat of a pedant did not the recollection of the heroic simplicity of the homeric life nerve you up not one bit exclaimed mr thornton laughing i was too busy to think about any dead people with the living pressing alongside me neck to neck in the struggle for bread now that i have my mother safe in the quiet peace that becomes her age and duly rewards her former exertions i can turn to all that old narration and thoroughly enjoy it i dare say my remark came from the professional feeling of there being nothing like leather replied mr hale when mr thornton rose up to go away after shaking hands with mr and mrs hale he made an advance to margaret to wish her good-bye in a similar manner it was the frank familiar custom of the place but margaret was not prepared for it she simply bowed her farewell although the instant she saw the hand half put out quickly drawn back she was sorry she had not been aware of the intention mr thornton however knew nothing of her sorrow and 
drawing himself up to his full height, walked off, muttering as he left the house. A more proud, disagreeable girl I never saw. Even her great beauty is blotted out of one's memory by her scornful ways. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter 11 First Impressions There's iron, they say, in all our blood, and a grain or two perhaps is good. But his, he makes me harshly feel, has got a little too much of steel. Anonymous "'Margaret,' said Mr. Hale, as he returned from showing his guest downstairs. "'I could not help watching your face with some anxiety when Mr. Thornton made his confession of having been a shop-boy. I knew it all along from Mr. Bell, so I was aware of what was coming, but I half expected to see you get up and leave the room.' "'Oh, Papa, you don't mean that you thought me so silly. I really liked that account of himself better than anything else he said. Everything else revolted me.' from its hardness. But he spoke about himself so simply, with so little of the pretense that makes the vulgarity of shop-people, and with such tender respect for his mother, that I was less likely to leave the room then than when he was boasting about Milton, as if there was not such another place in the world, or quietly professing to despise people for careless, wasteful improvidence, without ever seeming to think it his duty to try to make them different, to give them anything of the training which his mother gave him, and to which he evidently owes his position, whatever that may be. No, his statement of having been a shop-boy was the thing I liked best of all. "'I am surprised at you, Margaret,' said her mother. "'You who are always accusing people of being shoppy at Hellstone. I don't think, Mr. Hale, you have done quite right in introducing such a person to us without telling us what he had been.' I really was very much afraid of showing him how much shocked I was at some parts of what he said. His father dying in miserable circumstances. Why, it might have been in the workhouse. I am not sure if it was not worse than being in the workhouse, replied her husband. I heard a good deal of his previous life from Mr. Bell before we came here, and as he has told you a part, I will fill up what he left out. His father speculated wildly, failed, and then killed himself because he could not bear the disgrace. All his former friends shrunk from the disclosures that had to be made of his dishonest gambling. Wild, hopeless struggles, made with other people's money, to regain his own moderate portion of wealth. No one came forwards to help the mother and this boy. There was another child, I believe, a girl, too young to earn money, but of course she had to be kept. At least, no friend came forward immediately, and Mrs. Thornton is not one, I fancy, to wait till tardy kindness comes to find her out. So they left Milton. I knew that he had gone into a shop, and that his earnings, with some fragment of property secured to his mother, had been made to keep them for a long time. Mr. Bell said they absolutely lived upon water porridge for years. How, he did not know. But long after the creditors had given up hope of any payment of old Mr. Thornton's debts, if, indeed, they had ever hoped at all about it, after his suicide, this young man returned to Milton, and went quietly round to each creditor, paying him the first installment of the money owing to him. No noise, no gathering together of creditors. It was done very silently and quietly, but all was paid at last, helped on materially by the circumstance of one of the creditors, a crabbed old fellow, Mr. Bell says, taking in Mr. Thornton as a kind of partner. "'That really is fine,' said Margaret. "'What a pity such a nature should be tainted by his position as a Milton manufacturer.' "'How tainted?' asked her father. "'Oh, Papa, by that testing everything by the standard of wealth. When he spoke of the mechanical powers, he evidently looked upon them only as new ways of extending trade and making money, and the poor men around him— they were poor because they were vicious, out of the pale of his sympathies because they had not his iron nature and the capabilities that it gives him for being rich. Not vicious. He never said that. Improvident and self-indulgent were his words. 
Margaret was collecting her mother's working materials and preparing to go to bed. Just as she was leaving the room she hesitated. She was inclined to make an acknowledgment which she thought would please her father, but which, to be full and true, must include a little annoyance. However, out it came. Papa, I do think Mr. Thornton a very remarkable man, but personally I don't like him at all. And I do, said her father, laughing, personally, as you call it, and all. I don't set him up for a hero, or anything of that kind. But good night, child. Your mother looks sadly tired to-night, Margaret. Margaret had noticed her mother's jaded appearance with anxiety for some time past, and this remark of her father's sent her up to bed with a dim fear lying like a weight on her heart. The life in Milton was so different from what Mrs. Hale had been accustomed to live in Helstone, in and out perpetually into the fresh and open air. The air itself was so different, deprived of all revivifying principle as it seemed to be here. The domestic worries pressed so closely, and in so new and sordid a form, upon all the women in the family, that there was good reason to fear that her mother's health might be becoming seriously affected. There were several other signs of something wrong about Mrs. Hale. She and Dixon held mysterious consultations in her bedroom, from which Dixon would come out crying and cross, as was her custom when any distress of her mistress called upon her sympathy. Once Margaret had gone into the chamber soon after Dixon left it, and found her mother on her knees, and as Margaret stole out she caught a few words, which were evidently a prayer for strength and patience to endure severe bodily suffering. Margaret yearned to reunite the bond of intimate confidence which had been broken by her long residence at her Aunt Shaw's, and strove by gentle caresses and softened words to creep into the warmest place in her mother's heart. But though she received caresses and fond words back again, in such profusion as would have gladdened her formerly, yet she felt there was a secret withheld from her, and she believed it bore serious reference to her mother's health. She lay awake very long this night, planning how to lessen the evil influence of their Milton life on her mother. A servant to give Dixon permanent assistance should be got, if she gave up her whole time to the search, and then, at any rate, her mother might have all the personal attention she required, and had been accustomed to her whole life. Visiting register offices, seeing all manner of unlikely people, and very few in the least likely, absorbed Margaret's time and thoughts for several days. One afternoon she met Bessie Higgins in the street, and stopped to speak to her. "'Well, Bessie, how are you? Better, I hope, now the wind has changed.' "'Better and not better, if you know what that means.' "'Not exactly,' replied Margaret, smiling. "'I'm better in not being torn to pieces by coughing o' nights. But I'm weary and tired of Milton, and longing to get away to the land of Beulah, and when I think I'm farther and farther off, my heart sinks, and I'm no better, I'm worse. Margaret turned round to walk alongside of the girl in her feeble progress homeward, but for a minute or two she did not speak. At last she said in a low voice, "'Bessie, do you wish to die?' For she shrank from death herself, with all the clinging to life so natural to the young and healthy. Bessie was silent in her turn for a minute or two. Then she replied, "'If you'd led the life I have, and gotten as weary of it as I have, and thought at times, maybe it'll last for fifty or sixty years, it does with some, and got dizzy and dazed, and sick, as each of them sixty years seemed to spin about me, and mock me with its length of hours and minutes, and endless bits of time, oh, wench, I tell thee thou'd be glad enough when the doctor said he feared thou'd never see another winter. Why, Bessie, what kind of a life has yours been? Not worse than many others, I reckon. Only I fretted again it, and they didn't. But what was it? You know, I am a stranger here, so perhaps I am not so quick at understanding what you mean as if I'd lived all my life in Milton. If you'd a come to our house when you said you would, I could maybe have told you, but father says you're just like the rest of em. It's out of sight out of mind with you. I don't know who the rest are, and I've been very busy, and to tell the truth, I had forgotten my promise. You offered it. We asked none of it. I had forgotten what I said for the time, continued Margaret quietly, 
I should have thought of it again when I was less busy. May I go with you now? Bessie gave a quick glance at Margaret's face to see if the wish expressed was really felt. The sharpness in her eye turned into a wistful longing as she met Margaret's soft and friendly gaze. I had none so many to care for me. If you care, you may come. So they walked on together in silence. As they turned up into a small court, opening out of a squalid street, Bessie said, "'You'll not be daunted if father's at home, and speaks a bit gruffish at first. He took a mind to you, you see, and he thought a deal o' your coming to see us, and just because he liked you he was vexed and put about.' "'Don't fear, Bessie.' But Nicholas was not at home when they entered. A great, slatternly girl, not so old as Bessie, but taller and stronger, was busy at the wash-tub, knocking about the furniture in a rough, capable way, but altogether making so much noise that Margaret shrunk, out of sympathy with poor Bessie, who had sat down in the first chair, as if completely tired out with her walk. Margaret asked the sister for a cup of water, and while she ran to fetch it, knocking down the fire-irons and turning over a chair in her way, she unloosed Bessie's bonnet-strings, to relieve her catching breath. "'Do you think such a life as this is worth caring for?' gasped Bessie, at last. Margaret did not speak, but held the water to her lips. Bessie took a long and feverish draught, and then fell back and shut her eyes. Margaret heard her murmur to herself, "'They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. Neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat.' Margaret bent over and said, "'Bessie, don't be impatient with your life, whatever it is, or may have been. Remember one who gave it you, and who made it what it is.' She was startled by hearing Nicholas speak behind her. He had come in without her noticing him. "'Now I'll not have my wench preached to. She's bad enough as it is, with her dreams and her methody fancies, and her visions of cities with golden gates and precious stones, but if it amuses her, I let it be. But I'm none going to have more stuff poured into her. But surely, said Margaret, facing round, you believe in what I said, that God gave her life, and ordered what kind of life it was to be. I believe what I see, and no more. That's what I believe, young woman. I don't believe all I hear. No, not by a big deal. I did hear a young lass make an ado about knowing where we lived, and coming to see us, and my wench here thought a deal about it, and flushed up many a time, when who little knew as I was looking at her, at the sound of a strange step. But who's come at last, and who's welcome, as long as who'll keep from preaching on what who knows not about? Bessie had been watching Margaret's face. She half set up to speak now, laying her hand on Margaret's arm, with a gesture of entreaty. Don't be vexed with him. There's many a one thinks like him many and many a one here. If you could hear them speak, you'd not be shocked at him. He's a rare good man, is father. But oh, said she, falling back in despair, what he says at times makes me long to die more than ever, for I want to know so many things, and am so tossed about we wonder. Poor wench, poor old wench, I'm loath to vex thee, I am. But a man must speak out for the truth, and when I see the world going all wrong at this time o' day, bothering itself with things it knows not about, and leaving undone all the things that lie in disorder close at its hand, why, I say, leave all this talk about religion alone, and set to work on what you see and know. That's my creed. It's simple, and not far to fetch, nor hard work. But the girl only pleaded the more with Margaret. Don't think hardly on him. He's a good man. He is. Sometimes I think I shall be moped with sorrow even in the city of God, if father is not there. The feverish color came into her cheek, and the feverish flame into her eye. But you will be there, father. You shall. Oh, my heart. She put her hand to it, and became ghastly pale. Margaret held her in her arms, and put the weary head to rest on her bosom. She lifted the thin, soft hair from off the temples, and bathed them with water. Nicholas understood all her signs for different articles with the quickness of love, and even the round-eyed sister moved with laborious gentleness at Margaret's hush. Presently the spasm that foreshadowed death had passed away. 
Bessie roused herself and said, "'I'll go to bed. It's best place, but,' catching at Margaret's gown, "'you'll come again. I know you will. But just say it.' "'I will come to-morrow,' said Margaret. Bessie leaned back against her father, who prepared to carry her upstairs, but as Margaret rose to go, he struggled to say something. "'I could wish there were a God, if it were only to ask him to bless thee.' Margaret went away very sad and thoughtful. She was late for tea at home. At Helstone, unpunctuality at mealtimes was a great fault in her mother's eyes, but now this, as well as many other little irregularities, seemed to have lost their power of irritation, and Margaret almost longed for the old complainings. "'Have you met with a servant, dear?' "'No, Mamma. That Anne Buckley would never have done.' "'Suppose I try,' said Mr. Hale. "'Everybody else has got their turn at this great difficulty. Now let me try. I may be the Cinderella to put on the slipper after all.' Margaret could hardly smile at this little joke, so oppressed was she by her visit to the Higginses. "'What would you do, Papa? How would you set about it?' "'Why, I would apply to some good house-mother to recommend me one known to her or her servants.' "'Very good. But we must first catch our house-mother.' "'You have caught her. Or, rather, she is coming into the snare, and you will catch her to-morrow, if you are skilful.' "'What do you mean, Mr. Hale?' asked his wife, her curiosity aroused. "'Why, my paragon pupil—' as Margaret calls him, has told me that his mother intends to call on Mrs. and Miss Hale to-morrow. "'Mrs. Thornton!' exclaimed Mrs. Hale. "'The mother of whom he spoke to us,' said Margaret. "'Mrs. Thornton, the only mother he has, I believe,' said Mr. Hale quietly. "'I shall like to see her. She must be an uncommon person,' her mother added. "'Perhaps she may have a relation who might suit us, and be glad of our place.' She sounded such a careful, economical person, that I should like any one out of the same family. "'My dear,' said Mr. Hale, alarmed, "'pray don't go off on that idea. I fancy Mrs. Thornton is as haughty and proud in her way as our little Margaret here is in hers, and that she completely ignores that old time of trial, and poverty, and economy, of which he speaks so openly. I am sure, at any rate, she would not like strangers to know anything about it.' "'Take notice that it is not my kind of haughtiness, Papa, if I have any at all, which I don't agree to, though you're always accusing me of it.' "'I don't know positively that it's hers either, but from little things I have gathered from him, I fancy so.' They cared too little to ask in what manner her son had spoken about her. Margaret only wanted to know if she must stay in to receive this call, as it would prevent her going to see how Bessie was, until late in the day, since the early morning was always occupied in household affairs, and then she recollected that her mother must not be left to have the whole weight of entertaining her visitor. End of chapter 11well, I suppose we must. Friends in Council Mr. Thornton had some difficulty in working up his mother to the desired point of civility. She did not often make calls, and when she did, it was in heavy state that she went through her duties. Her son had given her a carriage, but she refused to let him keep horses for it. They were hired for the solemn occasions, when she paid morning or evening visits. She had had horses for three days, not a fortnight before, and had comfortably killed off all her acquaintances, who might now put themselves to trouble and expense in their turn. Yet Crampton was too far off for her to walk, and she had repeatedly questioned her son as to whether his wish that she should call on the Hales was strong enough to bear the expense of cab hire. She would have been thankful if it had not, for, as she said, she saw no use in making up friendships and intimacies with all the teachers and masters in Milton. Why, he would be wanting her to call on Fanny's dancing master's wife the next thing. And so I would, mother, if Mr. Mason and his wife were friendless in a strange place, like the Hales. Oh, you need not speak so hastily. 
I'm going to-morrow. I only wanted you to exactly understand about it. If you are going to-morrow, I shall order horses. Nonsense, John. One would think you were made of money. Not quite. Yet. But about the horses I'm determined. The last time you were out in a cab, you came home with a headache from the jolting. I never complained of it, I'm sure. No, my mother is not given to complaints, said he, a little proudly. But so much the more I have to watch over you. Now, as for Fanny there, a little hardship would do her good. She's not made of the same stuff as you are, John. She could not bear it. Mrs. Thornton was silent after this, for her last words bore relation to a subject which mortified her. She had an unconscious contempt for a weak character, and Fanny was weak in the very points in which her mother and brother were strong. Mrs. Thornton was not a woman much given to reasoning. Her quick judgment and firm resolution served her in good stead of any long arguments and discussions with herself. She felt instinctively that nothing could strengthen Fanny to endure hardships patiently, or face difficulties bravely. And though she winced as she made this acknowledgment to herself about her daughter, it only gave her a kind of pitying tenderness of manner towards her. Much of the same description of demeanour with which mothers are wont to treat their weak and sickly children. A stranger, a careless observer, might have considered that Mrs. Thornton's manner to her children betokened far more love to Fanny than to John. But such a one would have been deeply mistaken. The daringness with which mother and son spoke out unpalatable truths, the one to the other, showed a reliance on the firm centre of each other's souls, which the uneasy tenderness of Mrs. Thornton's manner to her daughter, the shame with which she thought to hide the poverty of her child in all the grand qualities which she herself possessed unconsciously, and which she set so high a value upon in others, this shame, I say, betrayed the want of a secure resting-place for her affection. She never called her son by any name but John. Love and dear, and such like terms, were reserved for Fanny. But her heart gave thanks for him day and night, and she walked proudly among women for his sake. "'Fanny, dear, I shall have horses to the carriage to-day, to go and call on these hails. Should you not go and see Nurse? It's in the same direction, and she's always so glad to see you. You could go on there while I am at Mrs. Hale's.' "'Oh, Mamma, it's such a long way, and I'm so tired.' "'With what?' asked Mrs. Thornton, her brow slightly contracting. "'I don't know. The weather, I think. It's so relaxing. Couldn't you bring Nurse here, Mamma? The carriage could fetch her, and she could spend the rest of the day here, which I know she would like.' Mrs. Thornton did not speak, but she laid her work on the table and seemed to think. "'It will be a long way for her to walk back at night,' she remarked, at last. "'Oh, but I will send her home in a cab. I never thought of her walking.' At this point Mr. Thornton came in, just before going to the mill. "'Mother, I need hardly say, that if there is any little thing that could serve Mrs. Hale as an invalid, you will offer it, I'm sure.' "'If I can find it out, I will. But I have never been ill myself.' so I am not much up to invalids' fancies. Well, here is Fanny, then, who is seldom without an ailment. She will be able to suggest something, perhaps. Won't you, Fan? I'm not always an ailment, said Fanny, pettishly. And I am not going with Mamma. I have a headache to-day, and I shan't go out. Mr. Thornton looked annoyed. His mother's eyes were bent on her work, at which she was now stitching away busily. Fanny, I wish you to go, he said authoritatively. It will do you good, instead of harm. You will oblige me by going without saying anything more about it. He went abruptly out of the room after saying this. If he had stayed a minute longer, Fanny would have cried at his tone of command, even when he used the words, You will oblige me. As it was, she grumbled. John always speaks as if I fancied I was ill and I'm sure I never do fancy any such thing. Who are these Hales that he makes such a fuss about? Fanny, don't speak so of your brother. He has good reasons of some kind or other, or he would not wish us to go. Make haste and put your things on. But the little altercation between her son and her daughter did not incline Mrs. Thornton more favorably toward these Hales. 
her jealous heart repeated her daughter's question who are they that he is so anxious we should pay them all this attention it came up like a burden to a song long after fanny had forgotten all about it in the pleasant excitement of seeing the effect of a new bonnet in the looking-glass mrs thornton was shy it was only of late years that she had had leisure enough in her life to go into society and as society she did not enjoy it as dinner-giving and as criticizing other people's dinners she took satisfaction in it but this going to make acquaintance with strangers was a very different thing she was ill at ease and looked more than usually stern and forbidding as she entered the Hales' little drawing-room. Margaret was busy embroidering a small piece of cambric for some little article of dress for Edith's expected baby. Flimsy, useless work, as Mrs. Thornton observed to herself. She liked Mrs. Hale's double knitting far better. That was sensible of its kind. The room altogether was full of knick-knacks, which must take a very long time to dust, and time to people of limited income was money she made all these reflections as she was talking in her stately way to mrs hale and uttering all the stereotyped commonplaces that most people can find to say with their senses blindfolded mrs hale was making rather more exertion in her answers captivated by some real old lace which mrs thornton wore lace as she afterwards observed to dixon of that old english point which has not been made for the seventy years and which cannot be bought it must have been an heirloom and shows that she had ancestors so the owner of the ancestral lace became worthy of something more than the languid exertion to be agreeable to a visitor by which mrs hale's efforts at conversation would have been otherwise bounded at present margaret racking her brain to talk to fanny heard her mother and mrs thornton plunge into the interminable subject of servants i suppose you are not musical said fanny as i see no piano i am fond of hearing good music i cannot play well myself and papa and mamma don't care much about it so we sold our old piano when we came here i wonder how you can exist without one it almost seems to me a necessity of life fifteen shillings a week and three saved out of them thought margaret to herself but she must have been very young she probably has forgotten her own personal experience but she must know of those days margaret's manner had an extra tinge of coldness in it when she next spoke you have good concerts here i believe oh yes delicious too crowded that is the worst the directors admit so indiscriminately but one is sure to hear the newest music there i always have a large order to give to johnson's the day after a concert do you like new music simply for its newness then oh one knows it is the fashion in london or else the singers would not bring it down here you have been in london of course yes said margaret i have lived there for several years oh london and the alhambra are the two places i long to see london and the alhambra yes ever since i read the tales of the alhambra don't you know them i don't think i do but surely it is a very easy journey to london yes but somehow said fanny lowering her voice mamma has never been to london herself and can't understand my longing she's very proud of milton dirty smoky place as i feel it to be and i believe she admires it the more for those very qualities if it has been mrs thornton's home for some years i can well understand her loving it said margaret in her clear bell-like voice what are you saying about me miss hale may i inquire margaret had not the words ready for an answer to this question which took her a little by surprise so miss thornton replied oh mamma we are only trying to account for your being so fond of milton thank you said mrs thornton i do not feel that my very natural liking for the place where i was born and brought up and which has been my residence for some years requires any accounting for margaret was vexed as fanny had put it it did seem as if they had been impertinently discussing mrs thornton's feelings but she also rose up against that lady's manner of showing that she was offended mrs thornton went on after a moment's pause do you know anything of milton miss hale have you seen any of our factories our magnificent warehouses no said margaret i have not seen anything of that description as yet 
then she felt that by concealing her utter indifference to all such places she was hardly speaking the truth so she went on i dare say papa would have taken me before now if i had cared but i really do not find much pleasure in going over manufactories they are very curious places said mrs hale but there is so much noise and dirt always i remember once going in a lilac silk to see candles made and my gown was utterly ruined very probably said mrs thornton in a short displeased manner i merely thought that as strangers newly come to reside in a town which has risen to eminence in the country from the character and progress of its peculiar business you might have cared to visit some of the places where it is carried on places unique in the kingdom i am informed if miss hale changes her mind and condescends to be curious as to the manufactures of milton i can only say i shall be glad to procure her admission to print works or reed making or the more simple operations of spinning carried on in my son's mill every improvement of machinery is i believe to be seen there in its highest perfection i'm so glad you don't like mills and manufactories and all those kind of things said fanny in a half whisper as she rose to accompany her mother who was taking leave of mrs hale with rustling dignity i think i should like to know all about them if i were you replied margaret quietly fanny said her mother as they drove away we will be civil to these hales but don't form one of your hasty friendships with the daughter she will do you no good i see the mother looks very ill and seems a nice quiet kind of person i don't want any form of friendship with miss hale mamma said fanny pouting i thought i was doing my duty by talking to her and trying to amuse her well at any rate john must be satisfied now End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of north and south by elizabeth gaskell this librivox recording is in the public domain read by marianne chapter thirteen a soft breeze in a sultry place that doubt and trouble fear and pain and anguish all are shadows vain that death itself shall not remain that weary deserts we may tread a dreary labyrinth may thread through dark ways underground be led yet if we will one guide obey the dreariest path the darkest way shall issue out in heavenly day and we on divers shores now cast shall meet our perilous voyage past all in our father's house at last r c trench margaret flew upstairs as soon as their visitors were gone and put on her bonnet and shawl to run and inquire how bessie higgins was and to sit with her as long as she could before dinner as she went along the crowded narrow streets she felt how much of interest they had gained by the simple fact of her having learnt to care for a dweller in them mary higgins the slatternly younger sister had endeavoured as well as she could to tidy up the house for the expected visit there had been rough stoning done in the middle of the floor while the flags under the chairs and table and round the walls retained their dark unwashed appearance although the day was hot there burnt a large fire in the grate making the whole place feel like an oven margaret did not understand that the lavishness of coals was a sign of hospitable welcome to her on mary's part and thought that perhaps the oppressive heat was necessary for bessie bessie herself lay on a squab or short sofa placed under the window she was very much more feeble than on the previous day and tired with raising herself at every step to look out and see if it was margaret coming and now that margaret was there and had taken a chair by her bessie lay back silent and content to look at margaret's face and touch her articles of dress with a childish admiration of their fineness of texture i never knew why folk in the bible cared for soft raiment afore but it must be nice to go dressed as you do it's different for common folk most fine folk tire my eyes out with their colours but somehow yours rest me where did you get this frock in london said margaret much amused london have you been to london yes i lived there for some years 
but my home was in a forest, in the country. "'Tell me about it,' said Bessy. "'I like to hear speak of the country and trees, and such like things.' She leant back and shut her eyes, and crossed her hands over her breast, lying at perfect rest, as if to receive all the ideas Margaret could suggest. Margaret had never spoken of Hellstone since she left it, except just naming the place incidentally. She saw it in dreams more vivid than life, and as she fell away to slumber at nights, her memory wandered in all its pleasant places. But her heart was opened to this girl. Oh, Bessie, I loved the home we have left so dearly. I wish you could see it. I cannot tell you half its beauty. There are great trees standing all about it, with their branches stretching long and level, and making a deep shade of rest even at noonday. And yet, though every leaf may seem still, there's a continual rushing sound of movement all around, not close at hand. Then sometimes the turf is as soft and fine as velvet, and sometimes quite lush with the perpetual moisture of a little, hidden, tinkling brook near at hand. And then in other parts there are billowy ferns, whole stretches of fern, some in the green shadow, some with long streaks of golden sunlight lying on them, just like the sea. I have never seen the sea, murmured Bessie, but go on. Then, here and there, there are wide commons, high up as if above the very tops of the trees. I am glad of that. I felt smothered like down below. When I have gone for an out, I have always wanted to get high up and see far away, and take a deep breath of fullness in that air. I get smothered enough in Milton, and I think the sound you speak of among the trees, going on for ever and ever, would send me dazed. It's that made my head ache so in the mill. Now on these commons, I reckon, there is but little noise. No, said Margaret. Nothing but here and there a lark high in the air. Sometimes I used to hear a farmer speaking sharp and loud to his servants, but it was so far away that it only reminded me pleasantly that other people were hard at work in some distant place, while I just sat on the heather and did nothing. I used to think once that if I could have a day of doing nothing, to rest me, a day in some quiet place like that you speak on, it would maybe set me up. But now I've had many days of idleness, and I'm just as weary of them as I was of my work. Sometimes I'm so tired out that I think I cannot enjoy heaven without a piece of rest first. I'm rather afeard of going straight there without getting a good sleep in the grave to set me up. Don't be afraid, Bessie, said Margaret, laying her hand on the girls. God can give you more perfect rest than even idleness on earth or the dead sleep of the grave can do. Bessie moved uneasily. Then she said, I wish father would not speak as he does. He means well, as I told you yesterday, and tell you again and again. But you see, though I don't believe him a bit by day, yet by night, when I'm in a fever, half asleep and half awake, it comes back upon me. Oh, so bad! And I think, and I think, if this should be the end of all, and if all I've been born for is just to work my heart and my life away, and to sicken in this drear place, with them mill noises in my ears for ever, until I could scream out for them to stop, and let me have a little peace of quiet, and with the fluff filling my lungs, until I thirst to death for one long, deep breath of the clear air you speak on and my mother gone, and I never able to tell her again how I loved her, and oh, all of my troubles. I think if this life is the end, and that there's no God to wipe away all tears from all eyes. Yo, wench, yo, she said, sitting up and clutching violently, almost fiercely at Margaret's hand. I could go mad, and kill ya, I could. She fell back completely worn out with her passion. Margaret knelt down by her. Bessie, we have a father in heaven. I know it, I know it, 
moaned she, turning her head uneasily from side to side. "'I am very wicked. I have spoken very wickedly. Oh, don't be frightened by me and never come again. I would not harm a hair of your head. And—' opening her eyes and looking earnestly at Margaret. I believe, perhaps, more than you do of what's to come. I read the book of Revelations until I know it off by heart, and I never doubt when I'm waken and in my senses of all the glory I'm to come to. Don't let us talk of what fancies come into your head when you are feverish. I would rather hear something about what you used to do when you were well. I think I was well when mother died but I have never been rightly strong since somewhere about that time. I began to work in a carding room soon after, and the fluff got into my lungs and poisoned me. Fluff, said Margaret, inquiringly. Fluff, replied Bessie. Little bits as fly off for the cotton when they're carding it, and fill the air till it looks all fine white dust. They say it winds around the lungs and tightens them up. Anyhow, there's many a one as works in a carding room that falls into a waste, coughing and spitting blood, because they're just poisoned by the fluff. But can't it be helped? asked Margaret. I don't know. Some folk have a great wheel at one end of their carding room to make a draught and carry off the dust, but that wheel costs a deal of money, five or six hundred pound, maybe, and brings no profit. So it's but a few of the masters as will put em up, and I have heard tell o' men who did not like work in places where there was a wheel, because they said how it made em hungry, and after they had been long used to swallowing fluff, to go without it, and that their wage ought to be raised if they were to work in such places. So between masters and men the wheels fall through. I know I wish there had been a wheel in our place, though. Did not your father know about it? asked Margaret. Yes, and he were sorry. But our factory were a good one on the whole, and a steady, likely set of people, and father was afeard of letting me go to a strange place, for though you would not think it now, many a one then used to call me a gradely lass enough, and I didna like to be reckoned nesh and soft, and Mary's schooling were to be kept up, mother said, and father he were always liking to buy books, and go to lectures of one kind or another, all which took money, so I just worked on till I shall ne'er get the whirr out of my ears, nor the fluff out of my throat in this world. That's all. How old are you? asked Margaret. Nineteen, come July. And I, too, am nineteen. She thought, more sorrowfully than Bessie did, of the contrast between them. She could not speak for a moment or two for the emotion she was trying to keep down. About Mary, said Bessie. I wanted to ask you to be a friend to her. She's seventeen but she's the last on us, and I don't want her to go to the mill, and yet I don't know what she's fit for. She could not do, Margaret glanced unconsciously at the uncleaned corners of the room. She could hardly undertake a servant's place, could she? We have an old faithful servant, almost a friend, who wants help, but who is very particular, and it would not be right to plague her with giving her any assistance that would really be an annoyance and an irritation. No, I see. I reckon you're right. Our Mary is a good wench. But who has she had to teach her what to do about a house? No mother, and me at the mill, till I were good for nothing but scolding her, for doing badly what I didn't know how to do a bit. I wish she could have lived with you, for all that. But even though she may not be exactly fitted to come and live with us as a servant, and I don't know about that, I will always try to be a friend to her for your sake, Bessie. And now I must go. I will come again as soon as I can. But if it should not be to-morrow, or the next day, or even a week or a fortnight hence, don't think I've forgotten you. I may be busy. I'll know you won't forget me again. I'll not mistrust you no more. But remember, in a week or fortnight, I may be dead and buried." "'I'll come as soon as I can, Bessie,' said Margaret, squeezing her hand tight. "'But you'll let me know if you are worse.' "'Aye, that I will,' said Bessie, returning the pressure. From that day forwards Mrs. Hale became more and more of a suffering invalid. It was now drawing near to the anniversary of Edith's marriage, 
and looking back upon the year's accumulated heap of troubles, Margaret wondered how they had been borne. If she could have anticipated them, how she would have shrunk away and hid herself from the coming time. And yet day by day had, of itself and by itself, been very endurable, small, keen, bright little spots of positive enjoyment having come sparkling into the very middle of sorrows. A year ago, or when she first went to Hellstone, and first became silently conscious of the querulousness in her mother's temper, she would have groaned bitterly over the idea of a long illness to be borne in a strange, desolate, noisy, busy place, with diminished comforts on every side of the home life. But with the increase of serious and just ground of complaint, a new kind of patience had sprung up in her mother's mind. She was gentle and quiet in intense bodily suffering, almost in proportion as she had been restless and depressed when there had been no real cause for grief. Mr. Hale was in exactly that stage of apprehension which, in men of his stamp, takes the shape of willful blindness. He was more irritated than Margaret had ever known him at his daughter's expressed anxiety. "'Indeed, Margaret, you are growing fanciful. God knows I should be the first to take alarm if your mother were really ill. We always saw when she had her headaches at Hellstone, even without her telling us. She looks quite pale and white when she is ill, and now she has a bright healthy colour in her cheeks, just as she used to have when I first knew her. But papa, said Margaret, with hesitation, do you know, I think that is the flush of pain. Nonsense, Margaret. I tell you, you are too fanciful. You are the person not well, I think. Send for the doctor to-morrow for yourself, and then, if it will make your mind easier, he can see your mother. Thank you, dear papa. It will make me happier, indeed. And she went up to kiss him, but he pushed her away, gently enough, but still as if she had suggested unpleasant ideas, which he should be glad to get rid of as readily as he could of her presence. He walked uneasily up and down the room. Poor Maria, said he, half soliloquizing. I wish one could do right without sacrificing others. I shall hate this town, and myself, too, if she— Pray, Margaret, does your mother often talk to you of the old places? Of Hellstone, I mean. No, papa, said Margaret, sadly. Then, you see, she can't be fretting after them, eh? It's always been a comfort to me to think that your mother was so simple and open that I knew every little grievance she had. She never would conceal anything seriously affecting her health from me, would she, eh, Margaret? I'm quite sure she would not. So don't let me hear of these foolish, morbid ideas. Come, give me a kiss, and run off to bed. But she heard him pacing about, raccooning, as she and Edith used to call it, long after her slow and languid undressing was finished, long after she began to listen as she lay in bed. End of chapter 13《ハッピーバースデー》の前半部分を見ていきましょう。ハッピーバースデー》の前半部分を見ていきましょう。ハッピーバースデー》の前半部分を見ていきましょう。ハッピーバースデー》の前半部分を見ていきましょう。ハッピーバースデー》の前半部分を見ていきましょう。ハッピーバースデー》の前半部分を見ていきましょう。ハッピーバースデー》の前半for such a little fault. Southey. It was a comfort to Margaret about this time to find that her mother drew more tenderly and intimately towards her than she had ever done since the days of her childhood. She took her to her heart as a confidential friend, the post Margaret had always longed to fill, and had envied Dixon for being preferred to. Margaret took pains to respond to every call made upon her for sympathy, and there were many even when they bore relation to trifles, which she no more would have noticed or regarded herself than the elephant would perceive the little pin at his feet, which yet he lifts carefully up at the bidding of his keeper. All unconsciously Margaret drew near to a reward. One evening, Mr. Hale being absent, her mother began to talk to her about her brother Frederick, the very subject on which Margaret had longed to ask questions, and almost the only one, on which her timidity overcame her natural openness. 
the more she wanted to hear about him the less likely she was to speak oh margaret it was so windy last night it came howling down the chimney in our room i could not sleep i never can when there is such a terrible wind i got into a wakeful habit when poor frederick was at sea and now even if i don't waken all at once i dream of him in some stormy sea with great clear glass-green walls of waves on either side of his ship but far higher than her very mass curling over her with that cruel terrible white foam like some gigantic crested serpent it is an old dream but it always comes back on windy nights till i am thankful to waken sitting straight and stiff up in bed with my terror poor frederick he is on land now so wind can do him no harm though i did think it might shake down some of those tall chimneys where is frederick now mamma our letters are directed to the care of messrs barber at cadiz i know but where is he himself i can't remember the name of the place but he is not called hale you must remember that margaret notice the f d in every corner of the letters he has taken the name of dickinson i wanted him to be called beersford to which he had a kind of a right but your father thought he had better not he might be recognized you know if he were called by my name mamma said margaret i was at aunt shaw's when it all happened and i suppose i was not old enough to be told plainly about it but i should like to know now if i may if it does not give you too much pain to speak about it pain no replied mrs hale her cheeks flushing yet it is pain to think that perhaps i may never see my darling boy again or else he did right margaret they may say what they like but i have his own letters to show and i'll believe him though he is my son sooner than any court-martial on earth go to my little japan cabinet dear and in the second left-hand drawer you will find a packet of letters margaret went there were the yellow sea-stained letters with the peculiar fragrance which ocean letters have margaret carried them back to her mother who untied the silken string with trembling fingers and examining their dates she gave them to margaret to read making her hurried anxious remarks on their contents almost before her daughter could have understood what they were you see margaret how from the very first he disliked captain reed he was second lieutenant in the ship the orion in which frederick sailed the very first time poor little fellow how well he looked in his midshipman's dress with his dirk in his hand cutting open all the newspapers with it as if it were a paper-knife but this mr reed as he was then seemed to take a dislike to frederick from the very beginning and then stay these are the letters he wrote on board the russell when he was appointed to her and found his old enemy captain reed in command he did mean to bear all his tyranny patiently look this is the letter just read it margaret where is it he says stop my father may rely upon me that i will bear with all proper patience everything that one officer and gentleman can take from another but from my former knowledge of my present captain i confess i look forward with apprehension to a long cruise of tyranny on board the russell you see he promises to bear patiently and i am sure he did for he was the sweetest tempered boy when he was not vexed that could possibly be is that the letter in which he speaks of captain reed's impatience with the men for not going through the ship's manoeuvres as quickly as the avenger you see he says that they had many new hands on board the russell while the avenger had been nearly three years on the station with nothing to do but keep slavers off and work her men till they ran up and down the rigging like rats or monkeys margaret slowly read the letter half illegible through the fading of the ink it might be it probably was a statement of captain reed's imperiousness in trifles very much exaggerated by the narrator who had written it while fresh and warm from the scene of altercation some sailors being aloft in the main topsail rigging the captain had ordered them to race down threatening the hindmost with the cat nine tails he who was furthest on the spar feeling the impossibility of passing his companions and yet passionately dreading the disgrace of the flogging threw himself desperately down to catch a rope considerably lower 
failed and fell senseless on the deck he only survived for a few hours afterwards and the indignation of the ship's crew was at a boiling point when young hale wrote but we did not receive this letter till long long after we heard of the mutiny poor fred i dare say it was a comfort to him to write it even though he could not have known how to send it poor fellow and then we saw a report in the papers that's to say long before fred's letter reached us of an atrocious mutiny having broken out on board the russell and that the mutineers had remained in possession of the ship which had gone off it was supposed to be a pirate and that captain reed was sent adrift in a boat with some men officers or something whose names were all given for they were picked up by a west indian steamer oh margaret how your father and i turned sick over that list when there was no name of frederick hale we thought it must be some mistake for poor fred was such a fine fellow only perhaps rather too passionate and we hoped that the name of carr which was in the list was a misprint for that of hale newspapers are so careless and towards post time the next day papa set off to walk to southampton to get the papers and i could not stop at home so i went to meet him he was very late much later than i thought he would have been and i sat down under a hedge to wait for him he came at last his arms hanging loose down his head sunk and walking heavily along as if every step was a labor and a trouble margaret i see him now don't go on mamma i can understand it all said margaret leaning up caressingly against her mother's side and kissing her hand no you can't margaret no one can who did not see him then i could hardly lift myself up to go and meet him everything seemed so to reel around me at once and when i got to him he did not speak or seem surprised to see me there more than three miles from home, beside the Oldham beech tree. But he put my arm in his, and kept stroking my hand, as if he wanted to soothe me to be very quiet under some great heavy blow. And when I trembled so all over that I could not speak, he took me in his arms, and stooped down his head on mine, and began to shake and cry in a strange, muffled, groaning voice, till I, for very fright, stood quite still, and only begged him to tell me what he had heard. And then, with his hand jerking, as if someone else moved it against his will, he gave me a wicked newspaper to read, calling our Frederick a traitor of the blackest dye, a base, ungrateful disgrace to his profession. Oh, I cannot tell what bad words they did not use. I took the paper in my hands as soon as I had read it, I tore it up to little bits. I tore it. Oh, I believe, Margaret, I tore it with my teeth. I did not cry. I could not. My cheeks were hot as fire, and my very eyes burned in my head. I saw your father looking grave at me. I said it was a lie, and so it was. Months after, this letter came, and you see what provocation frederick had it was not for himself or for his own injuries he rebelled but he would speak his mind to captain reed and so it went on from bad to worse and you see most of the sailors stuck by fred i think margaret she continued after a pause in a weak trembling exhausted voice i am glad of it I am prouder of Frederick standing up against injustice than if he had been simply a good officer. I am sure I am, said Margaret, in a firm, decided tone. Loyalty and obedience to wisdom and justice are fine, but it is still finer to defy arbitrary power, unjustly and cruelly used, not on behalf of ourselves, but on behalf of others more helpless. For all that... I wish I could see Frederick once more, just once. He was my first baby, Margaret. Mrs. Hale spoke wistfully, and almost as if apologizing for the yearning, craving wish, as though it were a depreciation of her remaining child. 
but such an idea never crossed margaret's mind she was thinking how her mother's desire could be fulfilled it is six or seven years ago would they still prosecute him mother if he came and stood his trial what would be the punishment surely he might bring evidence of his great provocation it would do no good replied mrs hale some of the sailors who accompanied frederick were taken and there was a court-martial held on them on board the amicia i believed all they said in their defence poor fellows because it just agreed with frederick's story but it was of no use for the first time during the conversation mrs hale began to cry yet something possessed margaret to force the information she foresaw yet dreaded from her mother what happened to them mamma asked she they were hung at the yard arm said mrs hale solemnly and the worst was that the court in condemning them to death said they had suffered themselves to be led astray from their duty by their superior officers they were silent for a long time and frederick was in south africa for several years was he not yes and now he is in spain at cadiz or somewhere near it if he comes to england he will be hung i shall never see his face again for if he comes to england he will be hung there was no comfort to be given mrs hale turned her face to the wall and lay perfectly still in her mother's despair nothing could be said to console her she took her hand out of margaret's with a little impatient movement as if she would fain be left alone with the recollection of her son when mr hale came in margaret went out oppressed with gloom and seeing no promise of brightness on any side of the horizon end of chapter 14《Chapter Fifteen of North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter Fifteen Masters and Men. Thought fights with thought. Out springs a spark of truth from the collision of the sword and shield. W. S. Lander. Margaret, said her father the next day we must return mrs thornton's call your mother is not very well and thinks she cannot walk so far but you and i will go this afternoon as they went mr hale began about his wife's health with a kind of veiled anxiety which margaret was glad to see awakened at last did you consult the doctor margaret did you send for him no papa you spoke of his coming to see me now i was well but if I only knew of some good doctor, I would go this afternoon and ask him to come, for I am sure Mamma is seriously indisposed. She put the truth thus plainly and strongly because her father had so completely shut his mind against the idea when she had last named her fears. But now the case was changed. He answered in a despondent tone. Do you think she has any hidden complaint? Do you think she is really ill? Has Dixon said anything? oh margaret i am haunted by the fear that our coming to milton has killed her my poor maria oh papa don't imagine such things said margaret shocked she is not well that is all many a one is not well for a time and with good advice gets better and stronger than ever but has dixon said anything about her no you know dixon enjoys making a mystery out of trifles and she has been a little mysterious about mamma's health which has alarmed me rather that is all without any reason i dare say you know papa you said the other day i was getting fanciful i hope and trust you are but don't think of what i said then i'd like you to be fanciful about your mother's health don't be afraid of telling me your fancies i like to hear them though i dare say i spoke as if i was annoyed but we will ask mrs thornton if she can tell us of a good doctor we won't throw away our money on any but some one first-rate say we turn up this street 
the street did not look as if it could contain any house large enough for mrs thornton's habitation her son's presence never gave any impression as to the kind of house he lived in but unconsciously margaret had imagined that tall massive handsomely dressed mrs thornton must live in a house of the same character as herself now marlborough street consisted of long rows of small houses with a blank wall here and there at least that was all they could see from the point at which they entered it he told me he lived in marlborough street i'm sure said mr hale with a much perplexed air perhaps it is one of the economies he still practises to live in a very small house but here are plenty of people about let me ask she accordingly inquired of a passer-by and was informed that mr thornton lived close to the mill and had the factory lodge door pointed out to her at the end of the long dead wall they had noticed the lodge door was like a common garden door on one side of it were great closed gates for the ingress and egress of lorries and wagons the lodge-keeper admitted them into a great oblong yard on one side of which were offices for the transaction of business on the opposite an immense many-windowed mill whence proceeded the continual clank of machinery and the long groaning roar of the steam-engine enough to deafen those who lived within the enclosure opposite to the wall along which the street ran on one of the narrow sides of the oblong was a handsome stone-coped house blackened to be sure by the smoke but with paint windows and steps kept scrupulously clean it was evidently a house which had been built some fifty or sixty years the stone facings the long narrow windows and the number of them the flights of steps up to the front door ascending from either side and guarded by a railing all witnessed to its age margaret only wondered why people who could afford to live in so good a house and keep it in such perfect order did not prefer a much smaller dwelling in the country or even some suburb not in the continual whirl and din of the factory her unaccustomed ears could hardly catch her father's voice as they stood on the steps awaiting the opening of the door the yard too with the great doors in the dead wall as a boundary was but a dismal lookout for the sitting-rooms of the house as margaret found when they had mounted the old-fashioned stairs and been ushered into the drawing-room the three windows of which went over the front door and the room on the right-hand side of the entrance there was no one in the drawing-room it seemed as though no one had been in it since the day when the furniture was bagged up with as much care as if the house was to be overwhelmed with lava and discovered a thousand years hence the walls were pink and gold the pattern on the carpet represented bunches of flowers on a light ground but it was carefully covered up in the centre by a linen drugget glazed and colourless the window curtains were lace each chair and sofa had its own particular veil of netting or knitting great alabaster groups occupied every flat surface safe from dust under their glass shades in the middle of the room right under the bagged-up chandelier was a large circular table with smartly bound books arranged at regular intervals around the circumference of its polished surface like gaily coloured spokes of a wheel everything reflected light nothing absorbed it the whole room had a painfully spotted spangled speckled look about it which impressed margaret so unpleasantly that she was hardly conscious of the peculiar cleanliness required to keep everything so white and pure in such an atmosphere or of the trouble that must be willingly expended to secure that effect of icy snowy discomfort wherever she looked there was evidence of care and labour but not care and labour to produce ease to help on habits of tranquil home employment solely to ornament and then to preserve ornament from dirt or destruction they had leisure to observe and to speak to each other in low voices before mrs thornton appeared they were talking of what all the world might hear but it is a common effect of such a room as this to make people speak low as if unwilling to awaken the unused echoes at last mrs thornton came in rustling in handsome black silk as was her wont her muslins and laces rivalling not excelling the pure whiteness of the muslins and netting of the room margaret explained how it was that her mother could not accompany them to return mrs thornton's call but in her anxiety not to bring back her father's fears too vividly she gave but a bungling account and left the impression on mrs thornton's mind that mrs hale's was some temporary or fanciful fine ladyish indisposition 
which might have been put aside had there been a strong enough motive, or that if it was too severe to allow her to come out that day, the call might have been deferred. Remembering, too, the horses to her carriage, hired for her own visit to the Hales, and how Fanny had been ordered to go by Mr. Thornton, in order to pay every respect to them, Mrs. Thornton drew up slightly offended, and gave Margaret no sympathy, indeed, hardly any credit for the statement of her mother's indisposition. "'How is Mr. Thornton?' asked Mr. Hale. "'I was afraid he was not well, from his hurried note yesterday.' "'My son is rarely ill, and when he is, he never speaks about it, or makes it an excuse for not doing anything. He told me he could not get leisure to read with you last night, sir. He regretted it, I am sure. He values the hours spent with you.' "'I am sure they are equally agreeable to me,' said Mr. Hale. "'It makes me feel young again to see his enjoyment and appreciation of all that is fine in classical literature.' I have no doubt the classics are very desirable for people who have leisure, but, I confess, it was against my judgment that my son renewed his study of them. The time and place in which he lives seems to me to require all his energy and attention. Classics may do well for men who loiter away their lives in the country or in colleges, but Milton men ought to have their thoughts and powers absorbed by the work of to-day. At least, that is my opinion. This last clause she gave out with the pride that apes humility. But surely, if the mind is too long directed to one object only, it will get stiff and rigid, and be unable to take in many interests, said Margaret. I do not quite understand what you mean by a mind getting stiff and rigid. Nor do I admire those whirligig characters that are full of this thing to-day, to be utterly forgetful of it in their new interest to-morrow. Having many interests does not suit the life of a Milton manufacturer. It is, or ought to be, enough for him to have one great desire, and to bring all the purposes of his life to bear on the fulfilment of that. "'And that is?' asked Mr. Hale. Her sallow cheek flushed, and her eye lightened, as she answered. "'To hold and maintain a high, honourable place among the merchants of his country, the men of his town. Such a place my son has earned for himself. Go where you will. I don't say in England only, but in Europe. The name of John Thornton of Milton is known and respected amongst all men of business. Of course, it is unknown in the fashionable circles, she continued scornfully. Idle gentlemen and ladies are not likely to know much of a Milton manufacturer, unless he gets into Parliament, or marries a lord's daughter. Both Mr. Hale and Margaret had an uneasy, ludicrous consciousness that they had never heard of this great name, until Mr. Bell had written them word that Mr. Thornton would be a good friend to have in Milton. The proud mother's world was not their world of Harley Street gentilities on the one hand, or country clergymen and Hampshire squires on the other. Margaret's face, in spite of all her endeavours to keep it simply listening in its expression, told the sensitive Mrs. Thornton this feeling of hers. "'You think you have never heard of this wonderful son of mine, Miss Hale. You think I am an old woman whose ideas are bounded by Milton, and whose own crow is the whitest ever seen.' "'No,' said Margaret, with some spirit. "'It may be true.' that I was thinking I had hardly heard Mr. Thornton's name before I came to Milton, but since I have come here, I have heard enough to make me respect and admire him, and to feel just how much justice and truth there is in what you have said of him. "'Who spoke to you of him?' asked Mrs. Thornton, a little mollified, yet jealous lest any one else's words should not have done him full justice. Margaret hesitated before she replied. She did not like this authoritative questioning. Mr. Hale came in, as he thought, to the rescue. "'It was what Mr. Thornton said himself, that made us know the kind of man he was. Was it not, Margaret?' Mrs. Thornton drew herself up, and said, "'My son is not the one to tell of his own doings. May I ask you again, Miss Hale, from whose account you formed your favourable opinion of him? A mother is curious, and greedy of commendation of her children, you know.' Margaret replied, 
it was as much from what mr thornton withheld of that which we had been told of his previous life by mr bell it was more that than what he said that made us all feel what reason you have to be proud of him mr bell what can he know of john he living a lazy life in a drowsy college but i am obliged to you miss hale many a missy young lady would have shrunk from giving an old woman the pleasure of hearing that her son was well spoken of why asked margaret looking straight at mrs thornton in bewilderment why because i suppose they might have consciences that told them how surely they were making the old mother into an advocate for them in case they had any plans on the son's heart she smiled a grim smile for she had been pleased by margaret's frankness and perhaps she felt that she had been asking questions too much as if she had a right to catechize margaret laughed outright at the notion presented to her laughed so merrily that it grated on mrs thornton's ear as if the words that called forth that laugh must have been utterly and entirely ludicrous margaret stopped her merriment as soon as she saw mrs thornton's annoyed look i beg your pardon madam but I am really very much obliged to you for exonerating me from making any plans on Mr. Thornton's heart. "'Young ladies have, before now,' said Mrs. Thornton, stiffly. "'I hope Miss Thornton is well,' put in Mr. Hale, desirous of changing the current of the conversation. "'She is as well as she ever is. She is not strong,' replied Mrs. Thornton, shortly. "'And Mr. Thornton?' I suppose I may hope to see him on Thursday. I cannot answer for my son's engagements. There is some uncomfortable work going on in the town, a threatening of a strike. If so, his experience and judgment will make him much consulted by his friends. But I should think he could come on Thursday. At any rate, I am sure he will let you know if he cannot. A strike? asked Margaret. What for? What are they going to strike for? for the mastership and ownership of other people's property said mrs thornton with a fierce snort that is what they always strike for if my son's workpeople strike i will only say they are a pack of ungrateful hounds but i have no doubt they will they are wanting higher wages i suppose asked mr hale that is the face of the thing but the truth is they want to be masters and make the masters into slaves on their own ground. They are always trying at it. They always have it in their minds, and every five or six years there comes a struggle between masters and men. They'll find themselves mistaken this time, I fancy, a little out of their reckoning. If they turn out, they mayn't find it so easy to go in again. I believe the masters have a thing or two in their heads which will teach the men not to strike again in a hurry if they try it this time. "'Does it not make the town very rough?' asked Margaret. "'Of course it does. But surely you are not a coward, are you? Milton is not the place for cowards. I have known the time when I have had to thread my way through a crowd of white, angry men, all swearing they would have Makinson's blood as soon as he ventured to show his nose out of his factory, and he, knowing nothing of it, some one had to go and tell him, or he was a dead man, and it needed to be a woman. So I went, and when I had got in, I could not get out. It was as much as my life was worth. So I went up to the roof, where there were stones piled ready to drop on the heads of the crowd if they tried to force the factory doors. And I would have lifted those heavy stones, and dropped them with as good an aim as the best man there, but that I fainted with the heat I had gone through. If you live in Milton, you must learn to have a brave heart, Miss Hale. I would do my best, said Margaret, rather pale. I do not know whether I am brave or not till I am tried, but I am afraid I should be a coward. South country people are often frightened by what our Darkshire men and women only call living and struggling. But when you've been ten years among a people who are always owing their betters a grudge, and only waiting for an opportunity to pay it off, you will know whether you are a coward or not. Take my word for it. Mr. Thornton came that evening to Mr. Hale's. 
he was shown up into the drawing-room where mr hale was reading aloud to his wife and daughter i am come partly to bring you a note from my mother and partly to apologize for not keeping my time yesterday the note contains the address you asked for dr donaldson thank you said margaret hastily holding out her hand to take the note for she did not wish her mother to hear that they had been making any inquiry about a doctor she was pleased that mr thornton seemed immediately to understand her feeling he gave her the note without another word of explanation mr hale began to talk about the strike mr thornton's face assumed a likeness to his mother's worst expression which immediately repelled the watching margaret yes the fools will have a strike let them it suits us well enough but we gave them a chance they think trade is flourishing as it was last year we see the storm on the horizon and draw in our sails but because we don't explain our reasons they won't believe we're acting reasonably we must give them line and letter for the way we choose to spend or save our money henderson tried a dodge with his men out at ashley and failed he rather wanted a strike it would have suited his book well enough so when the men came to ask for the five per cent they are claiming he said he'd think about it and give them his answer on the payday knowing all the while what his answer would be of course but thinking he'd strengthen their conceit of his own way however they were too deep for him and heard something about the bad prospects of trade so in they came on the friday and drew back their claim and now he's obliged to go on working but we milton masters have to-day sent in our decision we won't advance a penny we tell them we may have to lower wages but we can't afford to raise so here we stand waiting for their next attack and what will that be asked mr hale i conjecture a simultaneous strike you will see milton without smoke in a few days i imagine miss hale but why asked she could you not explain what good reason you have for expecting a bad trade i don't know whether i used the right words but you will understand what i mean do you give your servants reasons for your expenditures or your economy in the use of your own money we the owners of capital have a right to choose what we will do with it a human right said margaret very low i beg your pardon i did not hear what you said i would rather not repeat it she said it related to a feeling which i do not think you would share won't you try me pleaded he his thoughts suddenly bent upon learning what she had said she was displeased with his pertinacity but did not choose to affix too much importance to her words i said you had a human right i meant that there seemed no reason but religious ones why you should not do what you like with your own i know we differ in our religious opinions but don't you give me credit for having some though not the same as yours he was speaking in a subdued voice as if to her alone she did not wish to be so exclusively addressed she replied out in her usual tone i do not think i have any occasion to consider your special religious opinions in the affair all i meant to say is that there is no human law to prevent the employers from utterly wasting or throwing away all their money if they choose but that there are passages in the bible which would rather imply to me at least that they neglected their duty as stewards if they did however i know so little about strikes and rate of wages and capital and labor that i had better not talk to a political economist like you nay the more reason said he eagerly i shall only be too glad to explain to you all that may seem anomalous or mysterious to a stranger especially at a time like this when our doings are sure to be canvassed by every scribbler who can hold a pen thank you she answered coldly of course i shall apply to my father in the first instance for any information he can give me if i get puzzled with living here amongst this strange society you think it strange why i don't know i suppose because on the very face of it i see two classes dependent on each other in every possible way yet evidently regarding the interests of the other as opposed to their own i never lived in a place before where there were two sets of people always running each other down who have you heard running the masters down 
I don't ask who you have heard abusing the men, for I see you persist in misunderstanding what I said the other day. But who have you heard abusing the masters? Margaret reddened, then smiled as she said, I am not fond of being catechized. I refuse to answer your question. Besides, it has nothing to do with the fact. You must take my word for it, that I have heard some people, or, it may be, only some one of the work people, speak as though it were the interest of the employers to keep them from acquiring money, that it would make them too independent if they had a sum in the savings bank. I dare say it was that man Higgins who told you all this, said Mrs. Hale. Mr. Thornton did not appear to hear what Margaret evidently did not wish him to know, but he caught it nevertheless. I heard, moreover, that it was considered to the advantage of the masters to have ignorant workmen, not hedge lawyers, as Captain Lennox used to call those men in his company, who questioned and would know the reason for every order. This latter part of her sentence she addressed rather to her father than to Mr. Thornton. "'Who is Captain Lennox?' asked Mr. Thornton to himself, with a strange kind of displeasure that prevented him for the moment from replying to her. Her father took up the conversation. "'You were never fond of schools, Margaret, or you would have seen and known before this how much is being done for education in Milton.' "'No,' said she, with sudden meekness. "'I know I do not care enough about schools.' but the knowledge and the ignorance of which I was speaking did not relate to reading and writing, the teaching or information one can give to a child. I am sure that what was meant was ignorance of the wisdom that shall guide men and women. I hardly know what that is. But he, that is, my informant, spoke as if the masters would like their hands to be merely tall, large children, living in the present moment, with a blind, unreasoning kind of obedience." In short, Miss Hale, it is very evident that your informant found a pretty ready listener to all the slander he chose to utter against the masters, said Mr. Thornton, in an offended tone. Margaret did not reply. She was displeased at the personal character Mr. Thornton affixed to what she had said. Mr. Hale spoke next. I must confess that, although I have not become so intimately acquainted with any workman as Margaret has, I am very much struck by the antagonism between the employer and the employed, on the very surface of things. I even gather this impression from what you yourself have from time to time said." Mr. Thornton paused a while before he spoke. Margaret had just left the room, and he was vexed at the state of feeling between himself and her. However, the little annoyance, by making him cooler and more thoughtful, gave a greater dignity to what he said. My theory is, that my interests are identical with those of my workpeople, and vice versa. Miss Hale, I know, does not like to hear men called hands, so I won't use that word, though it comes most readily to my lips as the technical term, whose origin, whatever it was, dates before my time. On some future day, in some millennium, in utopia, this unity may be brought into practice, just as I can fancy a republic the most perfect form of government. We will read Plato's Republic as soon as we have finished Homer. Well, in the Platonic year, it may fall out that we are all, men, women, and children, fit for a republic. But give me a constitutional monarchy in our present state of morals and intelligence. In our infancy we require a wise despotism to govern us. Indeed, long past infancy, children and young people are the happiest under the unfailing laws of a discreet, firm authority. I agree with Miss Hale so far as to consider our people in the condition of children, while I deny that we, the masters, have anything to do with making or keeping them so. I maintain that despotism is the best kind of government for them, so that in the hours in which I come in contact with them I must necessarily be an autocrat. I will use my best discretion. From no humbug or philanthropic feeling, of which we had rather too much in the North, to make wise laws and come to just decisions in the conduct of my business, laws and decisions which work for my own good in the first instance, for theirs in the second. But I will neither be forced to give my reasons, nor flinch from what I have once declared to be my resolution. Let them turn out. I shall suffer as well as they, 
but at the end they will find that I have not baited or altered one jot. Margaret had re-entered the room, and was sitting at her work, but she did not speak. Mr. Hale answered, I dare say I am talking in great ignorance, but from the little I know, I should say that the masses were already passing rapidly into the troublesome stage which intervenes between childhood and manhood in the life of the multitude as well as that of the individual. Now, the error which many parents commit in the treatment of the individual at this time is, insisting on the same unreasoning obedience as when all he had to do in the way of duty was to obey the simple laws of come when you're called and do as you're bid. But a wise parent humors the desire for independent action, so as to become the friend and adviser when his absolute rule shall cease. If I get wrong in my reasoning, recollect, it is you who adopted the analogy. Very lately, said Margaret, I heard a story of what happened in Nuremberg only three or four years ago. A rich man there lived alone in one of the immense mansions which were formerly both dwellings and warehouses. It was reported that he had a child, but no one knew of it for certain. For forty years this rumor kept rising and falling, never utterly dying away. After his death it was found to be true. He had a son, an overgrown man with the unexercised intellect of a child, whom he had kept up in that strange way, in order to save him from temptation and error. But, of course, when this great old child was turned loose into the world, every bad counsellor had power over him. He did not know good from evil. His father had made the blunder of bringing him up in ignorance, and taking it for innocence, and after fourteen months of riotous living, the city authorities had to take charge of him, in order to save him from starvation. He could not even use words effectively enough to be a successful beggar. I used the comparison, suggested by Miss Hale, of the position of the master to that of a parent, so I ought not to complain of your turning the simile into a weapon against me. But, Mr. Hale, when you were setting up a wise parent as a model for us, you said he humoured his child in their desire for independent action. Now certainly, the time has not come for the hands to have any independent action during business hours. I hardly know what you would mean by it, then. And I say— that the masters would be trenching on the independence of their hands, in a way that I, for one, should not feel justified in doing, if we interfered too much with the life they lead out of the mills. Because they labor ten hours a day for us, I do not see that we have any right to impose leading strings upon them for the rest of their time. I value my own independence so highly that I can fancy no degradation greater than that of having another man perpetually directing and advising and lecturing me or even planning too closely in any way about my actions. He might be the wisest of men, or the most powerful. I should equally rebel and resent his interference. I imagine this is a stronger feeling in the north of England than in the south. I beg your pardon. But is not that because there has been none of the equality of friendship between the adviser and advised classes? Because every man has had to stand in an unchristian and isolated position, apart from and jealous of his brother-man, constantly afraid of his rights being trenched upon? I only state the fact. I am sorry to say, I have an appointment at eight o'clock, and I must just take facts as I find them to-night, without trying to account for them, which, indeed, would make no difference in determining how to act as things stand. The facts must be granted. But, said Margaret in a low voice, it seems to me as if it makes all the difference in the world. Her father made a sign for her to be silent, and allow Mr. Thornton to finish what he had to say. He was already standing up and preparing to go. You must grant me this one point. Given a strong feeling of independence in every Darkshire man, have I any right to obtrude my views of the manner in which he shall act, upon another, hating it as I should do most vehemently myself, merely because he has labour to sell, and I capital to buy. Not in the least, said Margaret, determined to say just this one thing. Not in the least because of your labor and capital positions, whatever they are, but because you are a man, dealing with a set of men over whom you have, whether you reject the use of it or not, immense power, 
just because your lives and your welfare are so constantly and intimately interwoven god has made us so that we must be mutually dependent we may ignore our own dependence or refuse to acknowledge that others depend upon us in more respects than the payment of weekly wages but the thing must be nevertheless neither you nor any other master can help yourselves the most proudly independent man depends on those around him for their insensible influence on his character his life and the most isolated of all your darkshire egos has dependents clinging to him on all sides he cannot shake them off any more than the great rock he resembles can shake off pray don't go into similes margaret you have let us off once already said her father smiling yet uneasy at the thought that they were detaining mr thornton against his will which was a mistake for he rather liked it as long as margaret would talk although what she said only irritated him just tell me miss hale are you yourself ever influenced no that is not a fair way of putting it but if you are ever conscious of being influenced by others and not by circumstances have those others been working directly or indirectly have they been laboring to exhort to enjoin to act rightly for the sake of example or have they been simple true men taking up their duty and doing it unflinchingly without a thought of how their actions were to make this man industrious that man saving why if i were a workman i should be twenty times more impressed by the knowledge that my master was honest punctual quick resolute in all his doings and hands are keener spies even than valets than by any amount of interference however kindly meant with my ways of going on out of work hours i do not choose to think too closely on what i am myself but i believe i rely on the straightforward honesty of my hands and the open nature of their opposition in contradistinction to the way in which the turnout will be managed in some mills just because they know how i scorn to take a single dishonest advantage or to do an underhand thing myself it goes farther than a whole course of lectures on honesty is the best policy life diluted into words no no what the master is that the men will be without overmuch taking thought on his part that is a great admission said margaret laughing when i see men violent and obstinate in pursuit of their rights i may safely infer that the master is the same that he is a little ignorant of that spirit which suffereth long and is kind and seeketh not her own you are just like all strangers who don't understand the working of our system miss hale he said hastily you suppose that our men are puppets of dough ready to be moulded into any amiable form we please you forget we have only to do with them for less than a third of their lives and you seem not to perceive that the duties of a manufacturer are far larger and wider than those merely of an employer of labor we have a wide commercial character to maintain which makes us into the great pioneers of civilization it strikes me said mr hale smiling that you might pioneer a little at home they are a rough heathenish set of fellows these milton men of yours they are that replied mr thornton rosewater surgery won't do for them cromwell would have made a capital mill owner miss hale i wish we had him to put down this strike for us cromwell is no hero of mine she said coldly but i am trying to reconcile your admiration of despotism with your respect for other men's independence of character he reddened at her tone i choose to be the unquestioned and irresponsible master of my hands during the hours that they labor for me but those hours past our relation ceases and then comes in the same respect for their independence that i myself exact he did not speak again for a minute he was too much vexed but he shook it off and bade mr and mrs hale good night then drawing near to margaret he said in a lower voice i spoke hastily to you once this evening and i am afraid rather rudely but you know i am but an uncouth milton manufacturer will you forgive me certainly she said smiling up in his face the expression of which was somewhat anxious and oppressed 
and hardly cleared away as he met her sweet sunny countenance out of which all the north wind effect of their discussion had entirely vanished but she did not put out her hand to him and again he felt the omission and set it down to pride End of chapter 15chapter 16 of north and south by elizabeth gaskell this librivox recording is in the public domain read by marianne chapter 16 the shadow of death trust in that veiled hand which leads none by the path that he would go and always be for change prepared for the world's law is ebb and flow from the arabic the next afternoon dr donaldson came to pay his first visit to mrs hale the mystery that margaret hoped their late habits of intimacy had broken through was resumed she was excluded from the room while dixon was admitted margaret was not a ready lover but when she loved she loved passionately and with no small degree of jealousy she went into her mother's bedroom just beyond the drawing-room and paced it up and down while awaiting the doctor's coming out Every now and then she stopped to listen. She fancied she heard a moan. She clenched her hands tight and held her breath. She was sure she heard a moan. Then all was still for a few minutes more, and then there was the moving of chairs, the raised voices, and all the little disturbances of leave-taking. When she heard the door open, she went quickly out of the bedroom. "'My father is from home, Dr. Donaldson. He has to attend a pupil at this hour, may i trouble you to come into his room downstairs she saw and triumphed over all the obstacles which dixon threw in her way assuming her rightful position as daughter of the house in something of the spirit of the elder brother which quelled the old servant's officiousness very effectually margaret's conscious assumption of this unusual dignity of demeanour towards dixon gave her an instant's amusement in the midst of her anxiety she knew from the surprised expression on dixon's face how ridiculously grand she herself must be looking, and the idea carried her downstairs into the room. It gave her that length of oblivion from the keen sharpness of the recollection of the actual business at hand. Now, that came back, and seemed to take away her breath. It was a moment or two before she could utter a word. But she spoke with an air of command, as she asked, "'What is the matter with Mamma? "'You will oblige me by telling the simple truth.' then seeing a slight hesitation on the doctor's part she added i am the only child she has here i mean my father is not sufficiently alarmed i fear and therefore if there is any serious apprehension it must be broken to him gently i can do this i can nurse my mother pray speak sir to see your face and not be able to read it gives me a worse dread than I trust any words of yours will justify. My dear young lady, your mother seems to have a most attentive and efficient servant, who is more like her friend. I am her daughter, sir. But when I tell you she expressly desired that you might not be told, I am not good or patient enough to submit to the prohibition. Besides, I am sure you are too wise too experienced to have promised to keep the secret well he said half smiling though sadly enough there you are right i did not promise in fact i fear the secret will be known soon enough without my revealing it he paused margaret went very white and compressed her lips a little more otherwise not a feature moved with the quick insight into character without which no medical man can rise to the eminence of dr donaldson he saw that she would exact the full truth that she would know if one iota was withheld and that the withholding would be torture more acute than the knowledge of it he spoke two short sentences in a low voice watching her all the time for the pupils of her eyes dilated into a black horror and the whiteness of her complexion became livid he ceased speaking he waited for that look to go off, for her gasping breath to come. 
Then she said, I thank you most truly, sir, for your confidence. That dread has haunted me for many weeks. It is a true, real agony. My poor, poor mother. Her lips began to quiver, and he let her have the relief of tears, sure of her power of self-control to check them. A few tears, those were all she shed, before she recollected the many questions she longed to ask. Will there be much suffering? He shook his head. That we cannot tell. It depends on constitution, on a thousand things. But the late discoveries of medical science have given us a large power of alleviation. My father, said Margaret, trembling all over. I do not know, Mr. Hale. I mean, it is difficult to give advice. But I should say, bear on, with the knowledge you have forced me to give you so abruptly, till the fact which I could not withhold has become in some degree familiar to you, so that you may, without too great an effort, be able to give what comfort you can to your father. Before then, my visits which, of course, I shall repeat from time to time, although I fear I can do nothing but alleviate. A thousand little circumstances will have occurred to awaken his alarm, to deepen it, so that he will be all the better prepared. Nay, my dear young lady, nay, my dear, I saw Mr. Thornton, and I honour your father for the sacrifice he has made, however mistaken I may believe him to be. Well, this once, if it will please you, my dear. Only remember, when I come again, I come as a friend. And you must learn to look upon me as such, because seeing each other, getting to know each other at such times as these, is worth years of morning calls. Margaret could not speak for crying, but she wrung his hand at parting. That's what I call a fine girl thought Dr. Donaldson, when he was seated in his carriage, and had time to examine his ringed hand, which had slightly suffered from her pressure. Who would have thought that little hand could have given such a squeeze? But the bones were well put together, and that gives immense power. What a queen she is! With her head thrown back at first, to force me into speaking the truth, and then bent so eagerly forward to listen. Poor thing! I must see she does not overstrain herself. Though it's astonishing how much those thoroughbred creatures can do and suffer. That girl's game to the backbone. Another, who had gone that deadly color, could never have come round without either fainting or hysterics. But she wouldn't do either. Not she. And the very force of her will brought her round. Such a girl as that would win my heart if I were thirty years younger. It's too late now. Ah, here we are at the archers. So out he jumped, with thought, wisdom, experience, sympathy, and ready to attend the calls made upon them by this family, just as if there were none other in the world. Meanwhile Margaret had returned into her father's study for a moment, to recover strength before going upstairs into her mother's presence. Oh, my God, my God! But this is terrible. How shall I bear it? Such a deadly disease. No hope. Oh, Mamma, Mamma, I wish I had never gone to Aunt Shaw's and been all those precious years away from you. Poor Mamma, how much she must have borne. Oh, I pray thee, my God, that her sufferings may not be too acute too dreadful. How shall I bear to see them? How can I bear Papa's agony? He must not be told yet. Not all at once. It would kill him. But I won't lose another moment of my own dear, precious mother. She ran upstairs. Dixon was not in the room. Mrs. Hale lay back in an easy chair, with a soft white shawl wrapped around her, and a becoming cap put on in expectation of the doctor's visit. Her face had a little faint color in it, and the very exhaustion after the examination gave it a peaceful look. 
Margaret was surprised to see her look so calm. "'Why, Margaret, how strange you look! What is the matter?' And then, as the idea stole into her mind of what was indeed the real state of the case, she added, as if a little displeased, "'You have not been seeing Dr. Donaldson, and asking him any questions, have you, child?' Margaret did not reply, only looked wistfully towards her. Mrs. Hale became more displeased. "'He would not, surely, break his word to me, and—' "'Oh, yes, mamma, he did. I made him. It was I. Blame me.' She knelt down by her mother's side, and caught her hand. She would not let it go, though Mrs. Hale tried to pull it away. She kept kissing it, and the hot tears she shed bathed it. "'Margaret, it was very wrong of you. You knew I did not wish you to know.' But, as if tired with the contest, she left her hand in Margaret's clasp, and by and by she returned the pressure faintly. That encouraged Margaret to speak. "'Oh, Mamma, let me be your nurse. I will learn anything Dixon can teach me. But you know I am your child, and I do think I have a right to do everything for you.' "'You don't know what you are asking,' said Mrs. Hale, with a shudder. "'Yes, I do. I know a great deal more than you are aware of. Let me be your nurse. Let me try, at any rate. No one has ever, shall ever, try so hard as I will do. It will be such a comfort, Mamma. "'My poor child. Well, you shall try.' "'Do you know, Margaret, Dixon and I thought you would quite shrink from me if you knew.' "'Dixon thought,' said Margaret, her lip curling. "'Dixon could not give me credit for enough true love, for as much as herself. "'She thought, I suppose, that I was one of those poor sickly women who like to lie on rose-leaves and be fanned all day. "'Don't let Dixon's fancies come any more between you and me, Mamma. "'Don't please implored she don't be angry with dixon said mrs hale anxiously margaret recovered herself no i won't i will try and be humble and learn her ways if only you will let me do all i can for you let me be in the first place mother i am greedy of that i used to fancy you would forget me while i was away at aunt shaw's and cry myself to sleep at night with that notion in my head. And I used to think, how will Margaret bear our makeshift poverty after the thorough comfort and luxury in Harley Street, till I have many a time been more ashamed of your seeing our contrivances at Helstone than of any stranger finding them out. Oh, Mamma, and I did so enjoy them. They were so much more amusing than all the jog-trot Harley Street ways, the wardrobe shelf with handles that served as a supper tray on grand occasions, and the old tea chest stuffed and covered for ottomans. I think what you call the makeshift contrivances at dear Helstone were a charming part of the life there. I shall never see Helstone again, Margaret, said Mrs. Hale, the tears welling up into her eyes. Margaret could not reply. Mrs. Hale went on. While I was there, I was forever wanting to leave it. Every place seemed pleasanter. And now I shall die far away from it. I am rightly punished. You must not talk so, said Margaret impatiently. He said you might live for years. Oh, mother, we will have you back at Hellstone yet. No, never. That I must take as a just penance. But, Margaret, Frederick. At the mention of that one word, she suddenly cried out loud, as if in some sharp agony. It seemed as if the thought of him upset all her composure, destroyed the calm, overcame the exhaustion. Wild, passionate cry succeeded to cry. Frederick, Frederick, come to me. I am dying. Little first-born child, come to me once again. She was in violent hysterics. 
Margaret went and called Dixon in terror. Dixon came in a huff, and accused Margaret of having overexcited her mother. Margaret bore all meekly, only trusting that her father might not return. In spite of her alarm, which was even greater than the occasion warranted, she obeyed all Dixon's directions promptly and well, without a word of self-justification. By so doing she mollified her accuser. They put her mother to bed, and Margaret sat by her till she fell asleep, and afterwards till Dixon beckoned her out of the room, and, with a sour face, as if doing something against the grain, she bade her drink a cup of coffee which she had prepared for her in the drawing-room, and stood over her in a commanding attitude as she did so. "'You shouldn't have been so curious, miss, and then you wouldn't have needed to fret before your time. It would have come soon enough. And now, I suppose, you'll tell Master, and a pretty household I shall have of you.' "'No, Dixon,' said Margaret, sorrowfully. "'I will not tell Papa. He could not bear it as I can. And by way of proving how well she bore it, she burst into tears. "'Aye, I knew how it would be. Now you'll waken your mamma, just after she's gone to sleep so quietly. Miss Margaret, my dear, I've had to keep it down this many a week, and though I don't pretend I can love her as you do, yet I loved her better than any other man, woman, or child. No one but Master Frederick ever came near her in my mind. Ever since Lady Beersford's maid first took me in to see her dressed out in white crepe, and corn ears, and scarlet poppies, and I ran a needle down into my finger, and broke it in, and she tore up her worked pocket handkerchief, after they'd cut it out, and came in to wet the bandages again with lotion when she returned from the ball, where she'd been the prettiest young lady of all. I've never loved any one like her. I little thought that I should live to see her brought so low. I don't mean no reproach to nobody. Many a one calls you pretty and handsome, and what not, even in this smoky place, enough to blind one's eyes. The owls can see that. But you'll never be like your mother for beauty. Never. Not if you live to be a hundred. Mamma is very pretty still. Poor Mamma. Now, don't ye set off again, or I shall give way at last. Whimpering. You'll never stand Master's coming home and questioning, at this rate. Go out and take a walk, and come in something like. Many's the time I've longed to walk it off. The thought of what was the matter with her, and how it must all end. Oh, Dixon, said Margaret. How often I've been cross with you, not knowing what a terrible secret you had to bear. Bless you, child. I like to see you showing a bit of spirit. It's the good old Beersford blood. Why, the last Sir John but two shot his steward down, there where he stood, just for telling him that he'd racked the tenants, and he'd racked the tenants till he could get no more money off them than he could get skin off a flint. Well, Dixon, I won't shoot you, and I'll try not to be cross again. You never have. If I've said it at times, it's always been to myself, just in private, by way of making a little agreeable conversation, for there's no one here fit to talk to, and when you fire up, you're the very image of Master Frederick. I could find in my heart to put you in a passion any day, just to see his stormy look coming like a great cloud over your face, but now you go out, miss. I'll watch over missus. And as for master, his books are company enough for him if he should come in. I will go, said Margaret. She hung about Dixon for a minute or so, as if afraid and irresolute. Then suddenly kissing her, she went quickly out of the room. Bless her, said Dixon. She's as sweet as a nut. There are three people I love. It's missus, Master Frederick, and her. Just them three. That's all. The rest be hanged, for I don't know what they're in the world for. Master was born, I suppose, for to marry Mrs. If I thought he loved her properly, I might get to love him in time. But he should have made a deal more on her, and not been always reading, reading, thinking, thinking. See what it has brought him to. Many a one who never reads nor thinks either, 
gets to be rector and dean and what not and i dare say master might if he'd just minded missus and let the weary reading and thinking alone there she goes looking out of the window as she heard the front door shut poor young lady her clothes look shabby to what they did when she came to Hellstone a year ago. Then she hadn't so much as a darn stocking or a cleaned pair of gloves in all her wardrobe. And now... End of chapter 16「Chapter 17 of North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. CHAPTER Seventeen, WHAT IS A STRIKE? There are briars besetting every path, which call for patient care, and there is a cross in every lot, and an earnest need for prayer. Anonymous Margaret went out heavily, and unwillingly enough. But the length of a street, yes, the air of a Milton street, cheered her young blood before she reached her first turning. Her step grew lighter, her lip redder. She began to take notice, instead of having her thoughts turned so exclusively inward. She saw unusual loiterers in the street, men with their hands in their pockets sauntering along, loud laughing and loud-spoken girls clustered together, apparently excited to high spirits, and a boisterous independence of temper and behavior. The more ill-looking of the men, the discreditable minority, hung about on the steps of the beer-houses and gin-shops, smoking and commenting pretty freely on every passer-by. Margaret disliked the prospect of the long walk through these streets, before she came to the fields which she had planned to reach. Instead, she would go and see Bessie Higgins. It would not be so refreshing as a quiet country walk, but still it would perhaps be doing the kinder thing. Nicholas Higgins was sitting by the fire smoking, as she went in, Bessie was rocking herself on the other side. Nicholas took the pipe out of his mouth, and standing up, pushed his chair towards Margaret. He leant against the chimney-piece in a lounging attitude, while she asked Bessie how she was. "'Who's rather run down in the mouth regard to spirits, but who's better in health? Who doesn't like this strike? Who's a deal too much set on peace and quietness at any price?' This is the third strike I've seen, said she, sighing, as if that was answer and explanation enough. Well, third time pays for all. See if we don't dang the masters this time. See if they don't come, and beg us to come back, at our own price. That's all. We've missed it aforetime, I grant you. But this time we lain our plans, desperate deep. Why do you strike? asked Margaret. Striking is leaving off work till you get your own rate of wages, is it not? You must not wonder at my ignorance. Where I come from I never heard of a strike. I wish I were there, said Bessie, wearily. But it's not for me to get sick and tired of strikes. This is the last I'll see. Before it's ended I shall be in the great city, the holy Jerusalem. Who's so full of the life to come, who cannot think of the present. Now I, you see, am bound to do the best I can here. I think a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, so them's the different views we take on the strike question. But, said Margaret, if the people struck, as you call it, where I come from, as they are mostly all field labourers, the seed would not be sown, the hay got in, the corn reaped. Well, said he, he had resumed his pipe, and put his well in the form of an interrogation. Why, she went on, what would become of the farmers? He puffed away. I reckon they'd either have to give up their farms, or to give a fair rate of wage. Suppose they could not, or would not do the last. They could not give up their farms all in a minute, however much they might like to do so. But they would have no hay, no corn to sell that year, and where would the money come from to pay the labourer's wages the next? Still puffing away. At last, he said, I know not of your ways down south. I have heard there are a pack of spiritless, downtrodden men. 
Wheely clemmed to death. Too much dazed with clemmin to know when they're put upon. Now, it's not so here. We known when we're put upon, and ween too much blood in us to stand it. We just take our hands from our looms and say, You may clem us, but you'll not put upon us, my masters, and be danged to em. They shan't this time. I wish I lived down south, said Bessie. There's a great deal to bear there, said Margaret. There are sorrows to bear everywhere. There is very hard bodily labour to be gone through, with very little food to give strength. But it's out of doors, said Bessie, and away from the endless, endless noise, and sicken in heat. It's sometimes in heavy rain, and sometimes in bitter cold. A young person can stand it, but an old man gets racked with rheumatism, and bent and withered before his time, yet he must work on the same, or else go to the workhouse. "'I thought you were so taken with the ways of the South Country.' "'So I am,' said Margaret, smiling a little, as she found herself thus caught. "'I only mean, Bessie, there's good and bad in everything in this world, and as you felt the bad up here, I thought it was fair you should know the bad down there.' "'And you say they never strike down there?' asked Nicholas abruptly. "'No,' said Margaret. "'I think they have too much sense.' "'And I think,' replied he, dashing the ashes out of his pipe with so much vehemence that it broke, "'it's not that they've too much sense, but that they've too little spirit.' "'Oh, father,' said Bessie, "'what have you gained by striking? "'Think of that first strike when mother died, "'how we all had to clem, you the worst of all, "'and yet many a one went in every week at the same wage.' till all were gone in that there was work for, and some went beggars all their lives at after. Aye, said he, that their strike was badly managed. Folk got into the management of it, as were either fools or not true men. You'll see, it'll be different this time. But all this time you've not told me what you're striking for, said Margaret, again. Why, you see, there's five or six masters who have set themselves again paying the wages they've been paying these two years past, and flourishing upon, and getting richer upon. And now they've come to us, and say we're to take less, and we won't. We'll just clem them to death first, and see who'll work for em then. They'll have killed the goose that laid em the golden eggs, I reckon. And so you plan dying, in order to be revenged upon them? No said he, I do not. I just look forward to the chance of dying at my post sooner than yield. That's what folks call fine and honourable in a soldier, and why not in a poor weaver chap? But, said Margaret, a soldier dies in the cause of the nation, in the cause of others. He laughed grimly. My lass, said he, you're but a young wench, and don't you think I can keep three people— that's Bessie, Mary, and me, on sixteen shillings a week. Don you think it's for myself I'm striking work at this time? It's just as much in the cause of others as yon soldier. Only may happen, the cause he dies for is just that of somebody he's never clapped eyes on, nor heard on all his born days, while I take up John Boucher's case, as lives next door but one, we a sickly wife, and eight children, none of em factory age, and I don't take up his cause only, though he's a poor good for naught, as can only manage two looms at a time. But I take up the cause of justice. Why are we to have less wage now, I ask, than two year ago? Don't ask me, said Margaret. I'm very ignorant. Ask some of your masters. Surely they will give you a reason for it. It's not merely an arbitrary decision of theirs, come to without reason." "'You're just a foreigner, and nothing more,' he said, contemptuously. "'But you know about it. Ask the masters. They'd tell us to mind our own business, and they'd mind theirs. Our business being, you understand, to take the baited wage, and be thankful, and their business, to bait us down to Clemen Point, to swell their profits. That's what it is.' "'But,' said Margaret, determined not to give way, although she saw she was irritating him. The state of trade may be such, 
as not to enable them to give you the same remuneration. State a trade. That's just a piece of master's humbug. It's rate of wages I was talking of. The masters keep the state of trade in their own hands, and just walk it forward like a black bugaboo, to frighten naughty children with into being good. I tell you, it's their part, their cue, as some folks call it, to beat us down, to swell their fortunes. And it's ours to stand up and fight hard, not for ourselves alone, but for them round about us, for justice and fair play. We help to make their profits, and we ought to help spend them. It's not that we want their brass so much this time, as we've done many a time afore. We in getting money laid by, and we're resolved to stand and fall together. Not a man on us will go in for less wage than the Union says is our due. So I say, hooray for the strike, and let Thornton and Slickson and Hamper and their set look to it. Thornton, said Margaret. Mr. Thornton, of Marlborough Street. Aye, Thornton of Marlborough Mill, as we call him. He is one of the masters you are striving with, is he not? What sort of a master is he? Do you ever see a bulldog? Set a bulldog on hind legs, and dress him up in coat and breeches, and yon just gettin John Thornton. Nay, said Margaret, laughing, I deny that. Mr. Thornton is plain enough, but he's not like a bulldog, with its short broad nose and snarling upper lip. No, not in look, I grant you. But let John Thornton get a hold of a notion, and he'll stick to it like a bulldog. You might pull him away with a pitchfork, ere he'd leave to go. He's worth fighting with, is John Thornton. As for Slickson, I take it some of these days he'll wheedle his men back with fair promises, that they'll just get cheated out of as soon as they're in his power again. He'll work his fines well out on em, I'll warrant. He's as slippery as an eel, he is. He's like a cat, as sleek and cunning and fierce. It'll never be an honest up-and-down fight with him, as it will be with Thornton. Thornton's as dour as a door-nail, an obstinate chap, every inch on him, the old bulldog. Poor Bessie! said Margaret, turning round to her. You sigh over it all. You don't like struggling and fighting as your father does, do you? No, she said heavily. I'm sick on it. I could have wished to have had other talk about me in my latter days than just the clashing and clanging and clattering that has wearied a my life long about work and wages and masters and hands and knobsticks poor wench. Latter days be fard. Thou'rt looking a slight better already for a little stir in change. Beside, I shall be a deal here to make it more lively for thee. Tobacco smoke chokes me, she said querulously. Then I'll never smoke no more in the house, he replied tenderly. But why didst thou not tell me afore, thou foolish wench? She did not speak for a while, and then so low that only Margaret heard her. I reckon he'll want a the comfort he can get out o' either pipe or drink afore he's done. Her father went out of doors, evidently to finish his pipe. Bessie said passionately, Now am I not a fool? Am I not, miss? There, I knew I ought to keep father at home, and away for the folk that are always ready to tempt a man, in time of strike, to go drink. And there my tongue must needs quarrel with this pipe o' his'n. And he'll go off, I know he will, as often as he wants to smoke, and nobody knows where it'll end. I wish I'd let him myself be choked first. But does your father drink? asked Margaret. No, not to say drink, replied she, still in the same wild, excited tone. But what win ye have? There are days with you, as with other folk, I suppose, when you get up and go through the hours, just longin for a bit of change, a bit of Philip, as it were. I know I hae gone and bought a four-pounder, out o' another baker's shop, to common on such days, just because I sickened at the thought of going on for ever with the same sight in my eyes, and the same sound in my ears, and the same taste in my mouth, and the same thought, or no thought for that matter, in my head, 
day after day, for ever. I've longed for to be a man to go spreein, even it were only to tramp to some new place in search of work. And father, all men, have it stronger in em than me to get tired of sameness and work for ever. And what is em to do? It's little blame to them if they go to the gin shop for to make their blood flow quicker and more lively, and to see things they never see at no other time, pictures and looking glass and such like. But father never was a drunkard, though maybe he's got worse for drink now and then. Only you see, and now her voice took a mournful, pleading tone. At times a strike, there's much to knock a man down, for all they start so hopefully. And where's the comfort to come fro? He'll get angry and mad. They all do. And then they get tired out with being angry and mad. And maybe had done things in their passion they'd be glad to forget. Bless your sweet, pitiful face. But you don't know what a strike is yet. Come, Bessie, said Margaret. I won't say you're exaggerating, because I don't know enough about it. But perhaps, as you're not well, you're only looking on one side, and there is another, and brighter to be looked to. It's all well enough for you to say, who have lived in pleasant green places all your life long, and never known want or care, or wickedness either, for that matter. Take care, said Margaret, her cheek flushing, and her eyes lightening. How you judge, Bessie. I shall go home to my mother, who is so ill, so ill, Bessie, that there's no outlet but death for her out of the prison of her great suffering. And yet I must speak cheerfully to my father, who has no notion of her real state, and to whom the knowledge must come gradually. The only person, the only one who could sympathize with me and help me, whose presence could comfort my mother more than any other earthly thing, is falsely accused, would run the risk of death if he came to see his dying mother. This I tell you, only you, Bessie. You must not mention it. No other person in Milton, hardly any other person in England, knows. Have I not care? Do I not know anxiety, though I go about well-dressed, and have food enough? Oh, Bessie, God is just, and our lots are well portioned out by him, although none but he knows the bitterness of our souls. I ask your pardon, replied Bessie, humbly. Sometimes, when I've thought of my life, and the little pleasure I've had in it, I've believed that, maybe, I was one of those doomed to die by the falling of a star from heaven, and the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became wormwood, and men died of the waters, because they were made bitter. One can bear pain and sorrow better if one thinks it has been prophesied long before for one. Somehow, then it seems as if my pain was needed for the fulfillment. Other ways it seems all sent for nothing. Nay, Bessie, think, said Margaret. God does not willingly afflict. Don't dwell so much on the prophecies, but read the clearer parts of the Bible. I dare say it would be wiser, but where would I hear such grand words of promise? Here tell I anything so far different for this dreary world, and this town above a, as in Revelations. Many's the time I've repeated the verses in the seventh chapter to myself, just for the sound. It's as good as an organ, and as different from every day, too. No, I cannot give up revelations. It gives me more comfort than any other book I the Bible. Let me come and read you some of my favorite chapters. Ay, she said greedily, come. Father will maybe hear you. He's devil with me talking, and he says it's all not to do with the things of the day, and that's his business. Where's your sister? Gone fusty and cutting. I were loath to let her go, but somehow we must live, and the union can't afford us much. Now I must go. You have done me good, Bessie. I done you good? Yes, I came here very sad, and rather too apt to think my own cause for grief was the only one in the world, 
and now I hear how you have had to bear for years, and that makes me stronger. Bless you. I thought eh the good doing was on the side of gentlefolk. I shall get proud if I think I can do good to you. You won't do it if you think about it, but you'll only puzzle yourself if you do. That's one comfort. You're not like no one I ever seed. I don't know what to make o' you. Nor I of myself. Good-bye. Bessie stilled her rocking to gaze after her. I wonder if there are many folk like her down south. She's like a breath of country air, somehow. She freshens me up above a bit. Who'd have thought that face, as bright and as strong as the angel I dream of, could have known the sorrow she speaks on? I wonder how she'll sin. All of us must sin. I think a deal on her, for sure. But father does the like, I see. And Mary, even. It's not often who's stirred up to notice much. End of chapter 17「Eighteen of North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter eighteen. Likes and Dislikes. My heart revolts within me, and two voices make themselves audible within my bosom. Wallenstein. On Margaret's return home she found two letters on the table. One was a note for her mother. The other, which had come by post, was evidently from her Aunt Shaw, covered with foreign postmarks, thin, silvery, and rustling. She took up the other, and was examining it when her father came in suddenly. "'So your mother is tired, and gone to bed early. I'm afraid such a thundery day was not the best in the world for the doctor to see her. What did he say? Dixon tells me he spoke to you about her.' Margaret hesitated. Her father's looks became more grave and anxious. "'He does not think her seriously ill.' "'Not at present. She needs care,' he says. He was very kind, and said he would call again, and see how his medicines worked. "'Only care. He did not recommend change of air. He did not say the smoky town was doing her any harm, did he, Margaret?' "'No. Not a word.' she replied, gravely. He was anxious, I think. Doctors have that anxious manner. It's professional, said he. Margaret saw, in her father's nervous ways, that the first impression of possible danger was made upon his mind, in spite of all his making light of what she told him. He could not forget the subject, could not pass from it to other things. He kept recurring to it through the evening with an unwillingness to receive even the slightest unfavorable idea, which made Margaret inexpressibly sad. "'This letter's from Aunt Shaw, Papa. She has got to Naples, and finds it too hot, so she has taken apartments at Sorrento. But I don't think she likes Italy.' "'He did not say anything about diet, did he?' "'It was to be nourishing and digestible. Mama's appetite is pretty good, I think.' Yes, and that's what makes it all the more strange he should have thought of speaking about diet. I asked him, Papa. Another pause. Then Margaret went on. Aunt Shaw says she has sent me some coral ornaments, Papa, but, added Margaret, half smiling, she's afraid the Milton dissenters won't appreciate them. She has got all her ideas of dissenters from the Quakers, has not she? If you ever hear or notice that your mother wishes for anything, be sure you let me know. I am so afraid she does not tell me always what she would like. Pray, see after that girl Mrs. Thornton named. If we had a good, efficient house-servant, Dixon could be constantly with her, and I'd answer for it. We'd soon set her up amongst us, if care will do it. She's been very much tired of late with the hot weather, and the difficulty of getting a servant. A little rest will put her quite to rights, eh, Margaret?" "'I hope so,' said Margaret, but so sadly that her father took notice of it. He pinched her cheek. "'Come, 
if you look so pale as this, I must rouge you up a little. Take care of yourself, child, or you'll be wanting the doctor next. But he could not settle to anything that evening. He was continually going backwards and forwards, on laborious tiptoe, to see if his wife was still asleep. Margaret's heart ached at his restlessness, his trying to stifle and strangle the hideous fear that was looming out of the dark places of his heart. He came back at last, somewhat comforted. "'She's awake now, Margaret. She quite smiled as she saw me standing by her. Just her old smile. And she says she feels refreshed, and ready for tea. Where's the note for her? She wants to see it. I'll read it to her while you make tea.' The note proved to be a formal invitation from Mrs. Thornton to Mr., Mrs., and Miss Hale to dinner, on the twenty-first instant. Margaret was surprised to find an acceptance contemplated, after all she had learnt of sad probabilities during the day. But so it was. The idea of her husband's and daughter's going to this dinner had quite captivated Mrs. Hale's fancy, even before Margaret had heard the contents of the note. It was an event to diversify the monotony of the invalid's life, and she clung to the idea of their going, with even fretful pertinacity when Margaret objected. "'Nay, Margaret, if she wishes it, I'm sure we'll both go willingly. She would never wish it unless she felt herself really stronger, really better than we thought she was, eh, Margaret?' said Mr. Hale anxiously, as she prepared to write the note of acceptance the next day. "'Eh, Margaret?' questioned he, with a nervous motion of his hands. It seemed cruel to refuse him the comfort he craved for, and besides, his passionate refusal to admit the existence of fear almost inspired Margaret herself with hope. "'I do think she is better since last night,' said she. Her eyes look brighter, and her complexion clearer. "'God bless you,' said her father, earnestly. "'But is it true?' Yesterday was so sultry, every one felt ill. It was a most unlucky day for Mr. Donaldson to see her on. So he went away to his day's duties, now increased by the preparation of some lectures he had promised to deliver to the working people at a neighboring lyceum. He had chosen ecclesiastical architecture as his subject, rather more in accordance with his own taste and knowledge than as falling in with the character of the place or the desire for particular kinds of information among those to whom he was to lecture. And the institution itself, being in debt, was only too glad to get a gratis course from an educated and accomplished man like Mr. Hale, let the subject be what it might. "'Well, mother,' asked Mr. Thornton that night, "'who have accepted your invitations for the twenty-first? "'Fanny, where are the notes?' "'The Slickson's accepted.' Collingbrook's accept, Stevenson's accept, Brown's decline, Hale's, father and daughter come, mother too great an invalid, Macpherson's come, Mr. Horsfall and Mr. Young. I was thinking of asking the porters, as the Browns can't come. Very good. Do you know? I'm really afraid Mrs. Hale is very far from well, from what Dr. Donaldson says. "'It's strange of them to accept a dinner invitation if she's very ill,' said Fanny. "'I didn't say very ill,' said her brother, rather sharply. "'I only said very far from well. They may not know it either.' And then he suddenly remembered that, from what Dr. Donaldson had told him, Margaret, at any rate, must be aware of the exact state of the case. "'Very probably they are quite aware of what you said yesterday, John.' of the great advantage it would be to them, to Mr. Hale, I mean, to be introduced to such people as the Stevensons and the Collingbrooks. I am sure that motive will not influence them. No, I think I understand how it is. John, said Fanny, laughing in her little weak, nervous way, how you profess to understand these Hales, and how you will never allow that we can know anything about them, are they really so very different to most people one meets with? She did not mean to vex him, but if she had intended it, she could not have done it more thoroughly. He chafed in silence, however, not deigning to reply to her question. 
"'They do not seem to me out of the common way,' said Mrs. Thornton. "'He appears a worthy kind of man enough, rather too simple for trade. "'So perhaps it's as well he should have been a clergyman first, and now a teacher. "'She's a bit of a fine lady, with her invalidism. "'And as for the girl, she's the only one who puzzles me when I think about her, "'which I don't often do. "'She seems to have a great notion of giving herself airs and I can't make out why. I could almost fancy she thinks herself too good for her company at times. And yet they're not rich. From all I can hear, they never have been. And she's not accomplished, Mamma. She can't play. Go on, Fanny. What else does she want to bring her up to your standard? Nay, John, said his mother. That speech of Fanny's did no harm. I myself heard Miss Hale say she could not play. If you would let us alone, we could perhaps like her, and see her merits. I'm sure I never could, murmured Fanny, protected by her mother. Mr. Thornton heard, but did not care to reply. He was walking up and down the dining-room, wishing that his mother would order candles, and allow him to set to work at either reading or writing, and so put a stop to the conversation but he never thought of interfering in any of the small domestic regulations that Mrs. Thornton observed, in habitual remembrance of her old economies. "'Mother,' said he, stopping, and bravely speaking out the truth, "'I wish you would like Miss Hale.' "'Why?' asked she, startled by his earnest, yet tender manner. "'You're never thinking of marrying her, a girl without a penny.' "'She would never have me.' said he, with a short laugh. "'No, I don't think she would,' answered his mother. She laughed at my face when I praised her for speaking out something Mr. Bell had said in your favour. I liked the girl for doing it so frankly, for it made me sure she had no thought of you, and the next minute she vexed me so by seeming to think—well, never mind. Only you're right in saying she's too good an opinion of herself to think of you.' the saucy jade. I should like to know where she'd find a better. If these words hurt her son, the dusky light prevented him from betraying any emotion. In a minute he came up quite cheerfully to his mother, and putting one hand lightly on her shoulder, said, Well, I'm just as much convinced of the truth of what you have been saying as you can be, and as I have no thought or expectation of ever asking her to be my wife— You'll believe me for the future that I'm quite disinterested in speaking about her. I foresee trouble for that girl, perhaps want of motherly care, and I only wish you to be ready to be a friend to her, in case she needs one. Now, Fanny, said he, I trust you have delicacy enough to understand that it is as great an injury to Miss Hale as to me. In fact, she would think it a greater, to suppose that I have any reason— more than I now give, for begging you and my mother to show her every kind attention. "'I cannot forgive her pride,' said his mother. "'I will befriend her, if there is need, for your asking, John. I would befriend Jezebel herself, if you asked me. But this girl, who turns up her nose at us all, who turns up her nose at you—' "'Nay, mother, I have never yet put myself— and I mean never to put myself within reach of her contempt. Contempt, indeed! One of Mrs. Thornton's expressive snorts. Don't go on speaking of Miss Hale, John, if I've to be kind to her. When I'm with her, I don't know if I like or dislike her most, but when I think of her, and hear you talk of her, I hate her. I can see she's given herself airs to you, as well as you told me out. "'And if she has,' said he, and then he paused for a moment, then went on. "'I'm not a lad, to be cowed by a proud look from a woman, or to care for her misunderstanding me and my position. I can laugh at it.' "'To be sure, and at her, too, with her fine notions and haughty tosses.' "'I only wonder why you talk so much about her, then,' said Fanny. "'I'm sure.' I'm tired enough of the subject. Well, said her brother, with a shade of bitterness, 
suppose we find some more agreeable subject what do you say to a strike by way of something pleasant to talk about have the hands actually turned out asked mrs thornton with vivid interest harper's men are actually out mine are working out their week through fear of being prosecuted for breach of contract i've had every one of them up and punished for it that left his work before his time was out the law expenses would have been more than the hands themselves were worth a set of ungrateful knots said his mother to be sure but i'd have shown them how i kept my word and how i mean them to keep theirs they know me by this time slickson's men are off pretty certain he won't spend money in getting them punished we're in for a turnout mother i hope there are not many orders in hand of course there are they know that well enough but they don't quite understand all though they think they do what do you mean john candles had been brought and fanny had taken up her interminable piece of worsted work over which she was yawning throwing herself back in her chair from time to time to gaze at vacancy and think of nothing at her ease why said he the americans are getting their yarns so into the general market that our only chance is producing them at a lower rate if we can't we may shut up shop at once and hands and masters go alike on tramp yet these fools go back to the prices paid three years ago nay some of their leaders quote dickinson's prices now though they know as well as we do what with fines pressed out of their wages as no honourable man would extort them and other ways which i for one would scorn to use the real rate of wage paid at dickinson's is less than at ours upon my word mother i wish the old combination laws were in force it's too bad to find out that fools ignorant wayward men like these just by uniting their weak silly heads are to rule over the fortunes of those who bring all the wisdom that knowledge and experience and often painful thought and anxiety can give the next thing will be indeed we're all but come to it now that we shall have to go and ask stand hat in hand and humbly ask the secretary of the spinners union to be so kind as to furnish us with labour at their own price that's what they want they who haven't the sense to see that if we don't get a fair share of the profits to compensate us for our wear and tear here in england we can move off to some other country and that what with home and foreign competition we are none of us likely to make above a fair share and may be thankful enough if we can get that in an average number of years can't you get hands from ireland i wouldn't keep these fellows a day i'd teach them that i was master and could employ what servants i liked yes to be sure i can and i will too if they go on long it will be trouble and expense and i fear there will be some danger but i will do it rather than give in if there is to be all this extra expense i am sorry we're giving a dinner just now so am i not because of the expense but because i shall have much to think about and many unexpected calls on my time but we must have had mr hornsfall and he does not stay in milton long and as for the others we owe them dinners and it's all one trouble he kept on with his restless walk not speaking any more but drawing a deep breath from time to time as if endeavouring to throw off some annoying thought fanny asked her mother numerous small questions all having nothing to do with the subject which a wiser person would have perceived was occupying her attention consequently she received many short answers she was not sorry when at ten o'clock the servants filed in to prayers these her mother always read first reading a chapter they were now working steadily through the old testament when prayers were ended and his mother had wished him a good night with that long steady look of hers which conveyed no expression of the tenderness that was in her heart but yet had the intensity of a blessing mr thornton continued his walk all his business plans had received a check a sudden pull-up from this approaching turnout the forethought of many anxious hours was thrown away utterly wasted by their insane folly 
which would injure themselves even more than him, though no one could set any limit to the mischief they were doing. And these were the men who thought themselves fitted to direct the masters in the disposal of their capital. Hamper had said, only this very day, that if he were ruined by the strike, he would start life again, comforted by the conviction that those who brought it on were in a worse predicament than he himself, for he had head as well as hands, while they had only hands. And if they drove away their market, they could not follow it, nor turn to anything else. But this thought was no consolation to Mr. Thornton. It might be that revenge gave him no pleasure. It might be that he valued the position he had earned with the sweat of his brow, so much that he keenly felt its being endangered by the ignorance or folly of others, so keenly that he had no thoughts to spare for what would be the consequences of their conduct to themselves. He paced up and down, setting his teeth a little now and then. At last it struck two. The candles were flickering in their sockets. He lighted his own, muttering to himself, "'Once for all, they shall know whom they have to deal with. I can give them a fortnight, no more. If they don't see their madness before the end of that time, I must have hands from Ireland. I believe it's Slickson's doing. Confound him and his dodges! He thought he was overstocked, so he seemed to yield at first, when the deputation came to him, and, of course, he only confirmed them in their folly, as he meant to do. That's where it spread from. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 of North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter 19 Angel Visits As angels in some brighter dreams call to the soul when man doth sleep, so some strange thoughts transcend our wonted themes, and into glory peep. Henry Vaughan Mrs. Hale was curiously amused and interested by the idea of the Thornton dinner-party. She kept wondering about the details, with something of the simplicity of a little child, who wants to have all its anticipated pleasures described beforehand. But the monotonous life led by invalids often makes them like little children, inasmuch as they have neither of them any sense of proportion in events, and seem each to believe that the walls and curtains which shut in their world and shut out everything else must of necessity be larger than anything hidden beyond. Besides, Mrs. Hale had had her vanities as a girl, and perhaps unduly felt their mortification when she became a poor clergyman's wife. They had been smothered and kept down, but they were not extinct, and she liked to think of seeing Margaret dressed for a party, and discussed what she should wear, with an unsettled anxiety that amused Margaret, who had been more accustomed to society in her one in Harley Street than her mother in five and twenty years of Hellstone. "'Then you think you shall wear your white silk. Are you sure it will fit? It's nearly a year since Edith was married.' "'Oh, yes, Mamma. Mrs. Murray made it, and it's sure to be right. It may be a straw's breadth shorter or longer wasted, according to my having grown fat or thin, but I don't think I've altered in the least. "'Hadn't you better let Dixon see it? It may have gone yellow with lying by.' "'If you like, Mamma. But if the worst comes to the worst, I've a very nice pink gauze, which Aunt Shaw gave me, only two or three months before Edith was married. That can't have gone yellow. No, but it may have faded. Well, then I've a green silk. I feel more as if it was the embarrassment of riches. I wish I knew what you ought to wear, said Mrs. Hale, nervously. Margaret's manner changed instantly. Shall I go and put them on one after another, Mamma, and then you could see which you liked best? But, yes, perhaps that will be best. So off to Margaret went. She was very much inclined to play some pranks when she was dressed up at such an unusual hour, to make her rich white silk balloon out into a cheese, 
to retreat backwards from her mother as if she were the queen, but when she found that these freaks of hers were regarded as interruptions to the serious business, and as such annoyed her mother, she became grave and sedate. What had possessed the world, her world, to fidget so about her dress, she could not understand. But that very afternoon, on naming her engagement to Bessie Higgins, apropos of the servant that Mrs. Thornton had promised to inquire about, Bessie quite roused up at the intelligence. "'Dear, and are you going to dine at Thornton's, at Marlborough Mills?' "'Yes, Bessie. Why are you so surprised?' "'Oh, I don't know. But they visit with a the first folk in Milton.' "'And you don't think that we're quite the first folk in Milton, eh, Bessie?' Bessie's cheeks flushed a little, at her thought being thus easily read. "'Well,' said she, "'you'll see. They think in a deal o' money here, and I reckon you've not getten much.' "'No,' said Margaret, "'that's very true. But we are educated people, and have lived amongst educated people. Is there anything so wonderful in our being asked out to dinner by a man who owns himself inferior to my father by coming to him to be instructed? I don't mean to blame Mr. Thornton. Few draper's assistants, as he was once, could have made themselves what he is. But can you give dinners back, in your small house? Thornton's house is three times as big. Well, I think we could manage to give Mr. Thornton a dinner back, as you call it. Perhaps not in such a large room, nor with so many people, but I don't think we've thought about it at all in that way. "'I never thought you'd be dining with the Thorntons,' repeated Bessie. "'Why, the mayor himself dines there, and the members of Parliament, and all.' "'I think I could support the honour of meeting the mayor of Milton.' "'But them ladies dress so grand,' said Bessie, with an anxious look at Margaret's print gown, which her Milton eyes appraised at seven pence a yard. Margaret's face dimpled up into a merry laugh. "'Thank you, Bessie.' for thinking so kindly about my looking nice among all the smart people. But I've plenty of grand gowns. A week ago, I should have said they were far too grand for anything I should ever want again. But as I'm to dine at Mr. Thornton's, and perhaps to meet the mayor, I shall put on my very best gown, you may be sure. "'What when you wear?' asked Bessie, somewhat relieved. "'White silk,' said Margaret. "'A gown I had for a cousin's wedding, a year ago.' "'That'll do,' said Bessie, falling back in her chair. "'I should be loath to have your look down upon.' "'Oh, I'll be fine enough, if that will save me from being looked down upon in Milton.' "'I wish I could see you dressed up,' said Bessie. "'I reckon you're not what folk would call pretty. You've not red and white enough for that. But, dun you know, I hae dreamed o' you long afore I ever seed you.' "'Nonsense, Bessie.' Ay, but I did. Your very face, looking with your clear steadfast eyes out of the darkness, with your hair blown off from your brow, and going out like rays round your forehead, which was just as smooth and as straight as it is now, and you're always coming to give me strength, which I seemed to gather out of your deep comfort and eyes, and you were dressed in shining raiment, just as you're going to be dressed, so, you see, it was you. "'Nay, Bessie,' said Margaret gently, "'it was but a dream. "'And why might I nay dream a dream in my affliction as well as others? "'Did not many a one I the Bible? "'Ay, and see visions, too. "'Why, even my father thinks a deal o' dreams. "'I tell you again, I saw you as plainly, coming swiftly towards me, "'with your hair blown back with the very swiftness of the motion, "'just like the way it grows, a little standing off like.' "'and the white shining dress on you've gotten to wear. "'Let me come and see you in it. "'I want to see you, and touch you, "'as in very deed you were in my dream. "'My dear Bessie, it's quite a fancy of yours. "'Fancy or no fancy, you've come, "'as I knew you would, "'when I saw your movement in my dream, "'and when you're here about me, "'I reckon I feel easier in my mind, "'and comforted.' "'just as a fire comforts one on a dree day. "'You'll set it were on the twenty-first. "'Please, God, I'll come and see you.' "'Oh, Bessie, 
you may come and welcome but don't talk so it really makes me sorry it does indeed then i'll keep it to myself if i bite my tongue out not but what it's true for all that margaret was silent at last she said let us talk about it sometimes if you think it true but not now tell me has your father turned out ay said bessy heavily in a manner very different from that she had spoken in but a minute or two before he and many another all hampers men and many a one beside the women are as bad as the men in their savageness this time food is high and they mun have food for their children i reckon suppose thornton's set em their dinner out the same money spent on potatoes and meal would keep many a crying baby quiet and hush up its mother's heart for a bit don't speak so said margaret you make me feel wicked and guilty in going to this dinner no said bessy some's preelected to sumptuous feasts and purple and fine linen maybe you're one on em others toil and moil all their lives long and the very dogs are not pitiful in our days as they were in the days of lazarus but if you ask me to cool your tongue with the tip of my finger i'll come across the great gulf to you just for the thought o what you've been to me here bessy you're very feverish i can tell it in the touch of your hand as well as in what you're saying it won't be division enough in that awful day that some of us have been beggars here and some of us have been rich we shall not be judged by that poor accident but by our faithful following of christ margaret got up and found some water and soaking her pocket-handkerchief in it she laid the cool wetness on bessy's forehead and began to chafe the stone-cold feet bessy shut her eyes and allowed herself to be soothed at last she said you'd have been delved out o your five wits as well as me if you'd had one body after another coming in to ask for father and staying to tell me each one their tale some spoke a deadly hatred and made my blood run cold wi the terrible things they said o the masters but more being women kept plaining plaining with the tears running down their cheeks and never wiped away nor heeded of the price o' meat and how their children could not sleep at nights for the hunger and do they think the strike will mend this asked margaret they say so replied bessy they do say trade has been good for long and the masters has no end o' money how much father does it know but in course the union does and as is natural they want in their share o' the profits now that food is getting dear and the union says they'll not be doing their duty if they don't make the masters give em their share but masters has gotten the upper hand somehow and i'm feared they'll keep it now and for evermore it's like the great battle o oh armageddon the way they keep on grinning and fighting at each other till even while they fight they are picked off into the pit just then nicholas higgins came in he caught his daughter's last words ay and i'll fight on too and i'll get it this time it'll not take long for to make em give in for they've gotten a pretty lot of orders all under contract and they'll soon find out they'd better give us our five per cent than lose the profit they'll gain let alone the fine for not filling the contract aha my masters i know who'll win margaret fancied from his manner that he must have been drinking not so much from what he said as from the excited way in which he spoke and she was rather confirmed in this idea by the evident anxiety bessy showed to hasten her departure bessy said to her the twenty-first that's thursday week i may come and see your dress for thornton's i reckon what time is your dinner before margaret could answer higgins broke out thornton's are to go in to dine at thornton's ask him to give you a bumper to the success of his orders by the twenty-first i reckon he'll be pottered in his brains how to get em done in time tell him there's seven hundred'll come marching into marlborough mills the morning after he gives the five per cent and will help him through his contract in no time 
you'll have em all there my master hamper he's one of the old-fashioned sort ne'er meets a man bout an oath or a curse i should think he were going to die if he spoke me civil but arter all his bark's war than his bite and yo may tell him one of his turnouts said so if you like eh but you'll have a lot of prize mill owners at thornton's i should like to get speech of them when they're a bit inclined to sit still after dinner i could na run for the life on em i'd tell em my mind i'd speak up again the hard way they're driving on us good-bye said margaret hastily good-bye bessie i shall look to see you on the twenty-first if you're well enough the medicines and treatment which dr donaldson had ordered for mrs hale did her so much good at first that not only she herself but margaret began to hope that he might have been mistaken and that she could recover permanently as for mr hale although he had never had an idea of the serious nature of their apprehensions he triumphed over their fears with an evident relief which proved how much his glimpse into the nature of them had affected him only dixon croaked for ever into margaret's ear however margaret defied the raven and would hope they needed this gleam of brightness indoors for out of doors even to their uninstructed eyes there was a gloomy brooding appearance of discontent mr hale had his own acquaintances among the working men and was so depressed with their earnestly told tales of suffering and long endurance they would have scorned to speak of what they had to bear to any one who might from his position have understood it without their words but here was this man from a distant country who was perplexed by the workings of the system into the midst of which he was thrown and each was eager to make him a judge and to bring witness of his own causes for irritation then mr hale brought all his budget of grievances and laid it before mr thornton for him with his experience as a master to arrange them and explain their origin which he always did on sound economical principles showing that as trade was conducted there must always be a waxing and waning of commercial prosperity and that in the waning a certain number of masters as well as of men must go down into ruin and be no more seen among the ranks of the happy and prosperous he spoke as if this consequence were so entirely logical that neither employers nor employed had any right to complain if it became their fate the employer to turn aside from the race he could no longer run with a bitter sense of incompetency and failure wounded in the struggle trampled down by his fellows in their haste to get rich slighted where he once was honoured humbly asking for instead of bestowing employment with a lordly hand of course speaking so of the fate that as a master might be his own in the fluctuations of commerce he was not likely to have more sympathy with that of the workmen who were passed by in the swift merciless improvement or alteration which would fain lie down and quietly die out of the world that needed them not but felt as if they could never rest in their graves for the clinging cries of the beloved and helpless they would leave behind who envied the power of the wild bird that can feed her young with her very heart's blood margaret's whole soul rose up against him when he reasoned in this way as if commerce were everything and humanity nothing she could hardly thank him for the individual kindness which brought him that very evening to offer her for the delicacy which made him understand that he must offer her privately every convenience for illness that his own wealth or his mother's foresight had caused them to accumulate in their household and which as he learnt from dr donaldson mrs hale might possibly require his presence after the way he had spoken his bringing before her the doom which she was vainly trying to persuade herself might yet be averted from her mother all conspired to set margaret's teeth on edge as she looked at him and listened to him what business had he to be the only person except dr donaldson and dixon admitted to the awful secret which she held shut up in the most dark and sacred recess of her heart not daring to look at it unless she invoked heavenly strength to bear the sight that some day soon she should cry aloud for her mother and no answer would come out of the blank dumb darkness 
yet he knew all. She saw it in his pitying eyes. She heard it in his grave and tremulous voice. How reconcile those eyes, that voice, with the hard reasoning, dry, merciless way in which he laid down axioms of trade, and serenely followed them out to their full consequences? The discord jarred upon her inexpressibly, the more because of the gathering woe of which she heard from Bessie. To be sure, Nicholas Higgins, the father, spoke differently. He had been appointed a committeeman, and said that he knew secrets of which the exoteric knew nothing. He said this more expressly and particularly on the very day before Mrs. Thornton's dinner-party, when Margaret, going in to speak to Bessie, found him arguing the point with Boucher, the neighbour of whom she had frequently heard mention, and as by turns exciting Higginson's compassion, as an unskilful workman with a large family depending on him for support, and at other times enraging his more energetic and sanguine neighbour by his want of what the latter called spirit. It was very evident that Higgins was in a passion when Margaret entered. Boucher stood, with both hands on the rather high mantelpiece, swaying himself a little on the support which his arms, thus placed, gave him, and looking wildly into the fire, with a kind of despair that irritated Higgins, even while it went to his heart. Bessie was rocking herself violently backwards and forwards, as was her wont, Margaret knew by this time, when she was agitated. Her sister Mary was tying on her bonnet, in great clumsy bows, as suited her great clumsy fingers, to go to her fustian cutting, blubbering out loud the while, and evidently longing to be away from a scene that distressed her. Margaret came in upon this scene. She stood for a moment at the door. Then, her finger on her lips, she stole to a seat on the squab near Bessie. Nicholas saw her come in, and greeted her with a gruff but not unfriendly nod. Mary hurried out of the house, catching gladly at the open door, and crying aloud when she got away from her father's presence. It was only John Bowker that took no notice whatever of who came in and who went out. "'It's no use, Higgins. Who cannot live long e this who's just sinking away, not for want of meat hersel, but because who cannot stand the sight of the little ones clemmin. Ay, clemmin. Five shillings a week may do well enough for thee, with but two mouths to fill, and one on em a wench who can weally earn her own meat. But it's clemmin to us. And I tell thee plain, if who dies, as I'm feared who will afore we're getting the five per cent, I'll fling the money back in the master's face, and say, Be doomed to ye, be doomed to the whole cruel world o' ye, that could nay lee me the best wife that ever bore children to a man. And look thee, lad, I'll hate thee, and the whole pack o' the union. Ay, and chase ye through heaven with my hatred. I will, lad, I will, if you're leading me astray in this matter. Thou saidst, Nicholas, on Wednesday senate, and now it's Tuesday of the second week, that afore a fortnight we'd ha the masters come a-beggin' to us to take back our work, at our own wage. And time's nearly up. And there's a lyle jack lyin' a-bed, too weak to cry, but just every now and then sobbin' up his heart for want of food. Our lyle jack, I tell thee, lad, who's never looked up since he was born, and who loves him as if he were her very life, as he is, for I reckon he'll have cost me that precious price, our lyle Jack, who waken me each morn with putting his sweet little lips to my great rough foul face, a seeking a smooth place to kiss. And he lies clemmin. Here the deep sobs choked the poor man, and Nicholas looked up, with eyes brimful of tears, to Margaret, before he could gain courage to speak. Hold up, man. The loud jack shall nay clem. I ha get him brass, and will go buy the chap a sup o' milk and a good four pounder this very minute. What's mine's thine, sure enough. I thou'st I want. Only dunna lose heart, man," continued he, as he fumbled in a teapot for what money he had. I lay yo my heart and soul will win for a this. It's but barren on one more week 
and you'll just see the way the masters will come round, praying on us to come back to our mills. And the union, that's to say, I, will take care you've everything for the children and the missus. So do not turn faint heart, and go to the tyrants a seek and work. The man turned round at these words, turned round a face so white and gaunt, and tear furrowed and hopeless, that its very calm forced Margaret to weep. You know well that a worser tyrant than e'er the masters were says, clem to death, and see a may clem to death, ere you dare go again the union. You know it well, Nicholas, for a you're one on em. You may be kind hearts, each separate, but one spend together, you've no more pity for a man than a wild, hunger-maddened wolf. Nicholas had his hand on the lock of the door. He stopped and turned round on Boucher, close following. So help me, God, man alive, if I think not I'm doing best for thee, and for all on us. If I'm going wrong when I think I'm going right, it's their sin who hae left me where I am, in my ignorance. I hae thought till my brains ached. Belie me, John, I have, and I say again, there's no hope for us but having faith i the union. They'll win the day, see if they do not. Not one word had Margaret or Bessie spoken. They had hardly uttered the sighing that the eyes of each called to the other to bring up from the depths of her heart. At last Bessie said, I never thought to hear father call on God again, but you heard him say, so help me God. Yes, said Margaret. Let me bring you what money I can spare. Let me bring you a little food for that poor man's children. Don't let them know it comes from any one but your father. It will be but little. Bessie lay back without taking any notice of what Margaret said. She did not cry. She only quivered up her breath. My heart's drained dry a tears, said she. Boucher's been in these days past, a telling me of his fears and his troubles. He's but a weak kind of chap, I know, but he's a man for a that, and though I've been angry many a time before now, we him and his wife as knew no more nor how him to manage, yet, you see, all folks isn't wise, yet God lets em live. Ay, and gives em some one to love, and be loved by, just as good as Solomon. And, if sorrow comes to them they love, it hurts em as sore as e'er it did Solomon. I can't make it out. Perhaps it's as well such a one as Boucher has the union to see after him. But I'd like for to see the mean has make the union, and put em one by one face to face with Boucher. I reckon, if they heard him, they'd tell him, if I cotched em one by one, he might go back and get what he could for his work, even if it weren't so much as they ordered. Margaret sat utterly silent. How was she ever going to go away into comfort and forget that man's voice, with the tone of unutterable agony, telling more by far than his words of what he had to suffer? She took out her purse. She had not much in it of what she could call her own, but what she had she put into Bessie's hand without speaking. Thank you. There's many on em gets no more, and it's not so bad off. Leastways, does not show it as he does. But father won't let em want. Now he knows. You'll see, Boucher's been pulled down with his childer. And her being so cranky, and a they could pawn has gone this last twelve month. You're not to think we'd hae letten em clem, for all we're a bit pressed oursel. If neighbours doesn't see after neighbours, I don't know who will. Bessie seemed almost afraid lest Margaret should think they had not the will, and, to a certain degree, the power of helping one whom she evidently regarded as having a claim upon them. Besides, she went on, father is sure and positive the masters must give in, within these next few days, that they cannot hold out much longer. But I thank you all the same. I thank you for myself, as much as for Boucher, for it just makes my heart warm to you more and more. 
Bessie seemed much quieter today, but fearfully languid and exhausted. As she finished speaking, she looked so faint and weary that Margaret became alarmed. "'It's not,' said Bessie. "'It's not death yet. I had a fearful night with dreams, or somewhat like dreams, for I were wide awake, and I'm all in a swounding daze today. Only yon poor chap made me alive again. No, it's not death yet, but death is not far off. I cover me up, and all may be sleep, if the cough will let me. Good night, good afternoon, map and I should say, but the light is dim and misty today. End of chapter 19「Twenty of North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter Twenty, Men and Gentlemen. Old and young, boy, let em all eat. I have it. Let em have ten tire of teeth apiece. I care not. Rollo, Duke of Normandy. Margaret went home so painfully occupied with what she had heard and seen that she hardly knew how to rouse herself up to the duties which awaited her, the necessity for keeping up a constant flow of cheerful conversation for her mother, who, now that she was unable to go out, always looked to Margaret's return from the shortest walk as bringing in some news. "'And can that factory friend of yours come on Thursday to see you dressed?' "'She was so ill I never thought of asking her.' said Margaret, dolefully. "'Dear, everybody is ill now, I think,' said Mrs. Hale, with a little of the jealousy which one invalid is apt to feel of another. "'But it must be very sad to be ill in one of those little back streets,' her kindly nature prevailing, and the old hellstone habits of thought returning. "'It's bad enough here. What could you do for her, Margaret? Mr. Thornton has sent me some of his old port wine since you went out, would a bottle of that do her good, think you? No, Mamma. I don't believe they are very poor. At least, they don't speak as if they were. And, at any rate, Bessie's illness is consumption. She won't want wine. Perhaps I might take her a little preserve, made of our dear Hellstone fruit. No. There's another family to whom I should like to give. Oh, Mamma! Mamma! How am I to dress up in my finery, and go off and away to smart places, after the sorrow I have seen to-day?" exclaimed Margaret, bursting the bounds she had preordained for herself before she came in, and telling her mother of what she had seen and heard at Higgins's cottage. It distressed Mrs. Hale excessively. It made her restlessly irritated, till she could do something. She directed Margaret to pack up a basket in the very drawing-room, to be sent there and then to the family and was almost angry with her for saying that it would not signify if it did not go till morning, as she knew Higgins had provided for their immediate wants, and she herself had left money with Bessie. Mrs. Hale called her unfeeling for saying this, and never gave herself breathing time till the basket was sent out of the house. Then she said, "'After all, we may have been doing wrong. It was only the last time Mr. Thornton was here that he said, those were not true friends, who helped to prolong the struggle by assisting the turnouts. And this Boucher man was a turnout, was he not? The question was referred to Mr. Hale by his wife when he came upstairs, fresh from giving a lesson to Mr. Thornton, which had ended in conversation, as was their wont. Margaret did not care if their gifts had prolonged the strike. She did not think far enough for that, in her present excited state. Mr. Hale listened and tried to be as calm as a judge. He recalled all that had seemed so clear not half an hour before, as it came out of Mr. Thornton's lips, and then he made an unsatisfactory compromise. His wife and daughter had not only done quite right in this instance, but he did not see for a moment how they could have done otherwise. Nevertheless, as a general rule, it was very true what Mr. Thornton said, that as the strike, if prolonged, must end in the master's bringing hands from a distance, 
if, indeed, the final results were not, as it had often been before, the invention of some machine which would diminish the need of hands at all. Why, it was clear enough that the kindest thing was to refuse all help which might bolster them up in their folly. But, as to this Boucher, he would go and see him first thing in the morning, and try and find out what could be done for him. Mr. Hale went the next morning, as he proposed. He did not find Boucher at home, but he had a long talk with his wife, promised to ask for an infirmary order for her, and, seeing the plenty provided by Mrs. Hale, and somewhat lavishly used by the children, who were masters downstairs in their father's absence. He came back with a more consoling and cheerful account than Margaret had dared to hope for. Indeed, what she had said the night before had prepared her father for so much worse a state of things that, by a reaction of his imagination, he described all as better than it really was. "'But I will go again, and see the man himself,' said Mr. Hale. "'I hardly know as yet how to compare one of these houses with our Hellstone cottages. I see furniture here which our labourers would never have thought of buying, and food commonly used which they would consider luxuries. Yet for these very families there seems no other resource, now that their weekly wages are stopped.' but the pawn-shop. One had need to learn a different language, and measure by a different standard, up here in Milton. Bessie, too, was rather better this day. Still, she was so weak that she seemed to have entirely forgotten her wish to see Margaret dressed, if, indeed, that had not been the feverish desire of a half-delirious state. Margaret could not help comparing this strange dressing of hers, to go where she did not care to be, her heart heavy with various anxieties, with the old, merry, girlish toiletries that she and Edith had performed scarcely more than a year ago. Her only pleasure now in decking herself out was in thinking that her mother would take delight in seeing her dressed. She blushed when Dixon, throwing the drawing-room door open, made an appeal for admiration. "'Miss Hale looks well, ma'am, doesn't she? Mrs. Shaw's coral couldn't have come in better.' It just gives the right touch of color, ma'am. Otherwise, Miss Margaret, you would have been too pale. Margaret's black hair was too thick to be plaited. It needed rather to be twisted round and round, and have its fine silkiness compressed into massive coils that encircled her head like a crown, and then were gathered into a large spiral knot behind. She kept its weight together by two large coral pins, like small arrows for length. Her white silk sleeves were looped up with strings of the same material, and on her neck, just below the base of her curved and milk-white throat, there lay heavy coral beads. "'Oh, Margaret, how I should like to be going with you to one of the old Barrington assemblies, taking you as Lady Beersford used to take me!' Margaret kissed her mother for this little burst of maternal vanity, but she could hardly smile at it. She felt so much out of spirits." I would rather stay at home with you. Much rather, Mamma. Nonsense, darling. Be sure you notice the dinner well. I shall like to hear how they manage these things in Milton, particularly the second course, dear. Look what they have instead of game. Mrs. Hale would have been more than interested, she would have been astonished, if she had seen the sumptuousness of the dinner-table and its appointments. Margaret, with her London-cultivated taste, felt the number of delicacies to be oppressive. One half of the quantity would have been enough, and the effect lighter and more elegant. But it was one of Mrs. Thornton's rigorous laws of hospitality, that of each separate dainty enough should be provided for all the guests to partake, if they felt inclined. Careless to abstemiousness in her daily habits, it was part of her pride to set a feast before such of her guests as cared for it. Her son shared this feeling, he had never known, though he might have imagined, and had the capability to relish, any kind of society but that which depended on an exchange of superb meals, and even now, though he was denying himself the personal expenditure of an unnecessary sixpence, and had more than once regretted that the invitations for this dinner had been sent out, still, as it was to be, he was glad to see the old magnificence of preparation. Margaret and her father were the first to arrive. Mr. Hale was anxiously punctual to the time specified. There was no one upstairs in the drawing-room but Mrs. Thornton and Fanny. 
every cover was taken off and the apartment blazed forth in yellow silk damask and a brilliantly flowered carpet every corner seemed filled up with ornament until it became a weariness to the eye and presented a very strange contrast to the bald ugliness of the lookout into the great mill-yard where wide folding gates were thrown open for the admission of carriages the mill loomed high on the left-hand side of the windows casting a shadow down from its many stories which darkened the summer evening before its time my son was engaged up to the last moment on business he will be here directly mr hale may i beg you to take a seat mr hale was standing at one of the windows as mrs thornton spoke he turned away saying don't you find such a close neighbourhood to the mill rather unpleasant at times she drew herself up never i am not become so fine as to desire to forget the source of my son's wealth and power besides there is not such another factory in milton one room alone is two hundred and twenty square yards i meant that the smoke and noise the constant going out and coming in of the workpeople might be annoying i agree with you mr hale said fanny there's a continual smell of steam and oily machinery and the noise is perfectly deafening i have heard noise that was called music far more deafening the engine room is at the street end of the factory we hardly hear it except in summer weather when all the windows are open and as for the continual murmur of the workpeople it disturbs me no more than the humming of a hive of bees if i think of it at all i connect it with my son and feel how all belongs to him and that he is the head that directs it just now there are no sounds to come from the mill the hands have been ungrateful enough to turn out as perhaps you have heard but the very business of which i spoke when you entered had reference to the steps he is going to take to make them learn their place the expression on her face always stern deepened into dark anger as she said this nor did it clear away when mr thornton entered the room for she saw in an instant the weight of care and anxiety which he could not shake off although his guest received from him a greeting that appeared both cheerful and cordial he shook hands with margaret he knew it was the first time their hands had met though she was perfectly unconscious of the fact he inquired after mrs hale and heard mr hale's sanguine hopeful account and glancing at margaret to understand how far she agreed with her father he saw that no dissenting shadow crossed her face and as he looked with this intention he was struck anew with her great beauty he had never seen her in such dress before and yet now it appeared as if such elegance of attire was so befitting her noble figure and lofty serenity of countenance that she ought to go always thus apparelled she was talking to fanny about what he could not hear but he saw his sister's restless way of continually arranging some part of her gown her wandering eyes now glancing here now there but without any purpose in her observation and he contrasted them uneasily with the large soft eyes that looked forth steadily at one object as if from out their light beamed some gentle influence of repose the curving lines of the red lips just parted in the interest of listening to what her companion said the head a little bent forward so as to make a long sweeping line from the summit where the light caught on the glossy raven hair to the smooth ivory tip of the shoulder the round white arms and taper hands lightly laid across each other but perfectly motionless in their pretty attitude mr thornton sighed as he took in all this with one of his sudden comprehensive glances and then he turned his back to the young ladies and threw himself with an effort but with all his heart and soul into a conversation with mr hale more people came more and more fanny left margaret's side and helped her mother to receive her guests mr thornton felt that in this influx no one was speaking to margaret and was restless under this apparent neglect but he never went near her himself he did not look at her only he knew what she was doing or not doing better than he knew the movements of any one else in the room 
Margaret was so unconscious of herself, and so much amused by watching other people, that she never thought whether she was left unnoticed or not. Somebody took her down to dinner. She did not catch the name, nor did he seem much inclined to talk to her. There was a very animated conversation going on among the gentlemen. The ladies, for the most part, were silent, employing themselves in taking notes of the dinner and criticizing each other's dresses. Margaret caught the clue in the general conversation, grew interested, and listened attentively. Mr. Horsfall, the stranger, whose visit to the town was the original germ of the party, was asking questions relative to the trade and manufactures of the place, and the rest of the gentlemen, all Milton men, were giving him answers and explanations. Some dispute arose, which was warmly contested. It was referred to Mr. Thornton, who had hardly spoken before, but who now gave an opinion, the grounds of which were so clearly stated that even the opponents yielded. Margaret's attention was thus called to her host. His whole manner as master of the house, and entertainer of his friends, was so straightforward, yet simple and modest, as to be thoroughly dignified. Margaret thought she had never seen him to so much advantage. When he had come to their house, there had always been something, either of over-eagerness or that kind of vexed annoyance, which seemed ready to presuppose that he was unjustly judged, and yet felt too proud to try and make himself better understood. But now, among his fellows, there was no uncertainty as to his position. He was regarded by them as a man of great force of character, of power in many ways. There was no need to struggle for their respect. He had it, and he knew it, and the security of this gave a fine grand quietness to his voice and ways, which Margaret had missed before. He was not in the habit of talking to ladies, and what he did say was a little formal. To Margaret herself he hardly spoke at all. She was surprised to think how much she enjoyed this dinner. She knew enough now to understand many local interests, nay, even some of the technical words employed by the eager mill-owners. She silently took a very decided part in the question they were discussing. At any rate, they talked in desperate earnest, not in the used-up style that wearied her so in the old London parties. She wondered that with all this dwelling on the manufacturers and trades of the place no allusion was made to the strike then pending. She did not yet know how coolly such things were taken by the masters as having only one possible end. To be sure, the men were cutting their own throats, as they had done many a time before. But if they would be fools, and put themselves into the hands of a rascally set of paid delegates, they must take the consequences. One or two thought Thornton looked out of spirits, and, of course, he must lose by this turnout. But it was an accident that might happen to themselves any day, and Thornton was as good to manage a strike as any one, for he was as iron a chap as any in Milton. The hands had mistaken their man in trying that dodge on him, and they chuckled inwardly at the idea of the workman's discomfiture and defeat in their attempt to alter one iota of what Thornton had decreed. It was rather dull for Margaret after dinner. She was glad when the gentlemen came, not merely because she caught her father's eye to brighten her sleepiness up, but because she could listen to something larger and grander than the petty interests which the ladies had been talking about. She liked the exultation in the sense of power which these Milton men had. It might be rather rampant in its display, and savor of boasting, but still they seemed to defy the old limits of possibility, in a kind of fine intoxication, caused by the recollection of what had been achieved, and what yet should be. In her cooler moments, she might not approve of their spirit in all things. Still, there was much to admire in their forgetfulness of themselves, and the present, in their anticipated triumphs over all inanimate matter at some future time, which none of them should live to see. She was rather startled when Mr. Thornton spoke to her, close at her elbow. "'I could see you were on our side in our discussion at dinner. Were you not, Miss Hale?' "'Certainly. But then I know so little about it. I was surprised, however, to find from what Mr. Horsfall said that there were others who thought in so diametrically opposite a manner as the Mr. Morrison he spoke about. He cannot be a gentleman. 
is he i am not quite the person to decide on another's gentlemanliness miss hale i mean i don't quite understand your application of the word but i should say that this morrison is no true man i don't know who he is i merely judge him from mr horsfall's account i suspect my gentleman includes your true man and a great deal more you would imply i differ from you a man to me is a higher and a completer being than a gentleman what do you mean asked margaret we must understand the words differently i take it that gentleman is a term that only describes a person in his relation to others but when we speak of him as a man we consider him not merely with regard to his fellow men but in relation to himself to life to time to eternity a castaway lonely as robinson crusoe a prisoner immured in a dungeon for life nay even a saint in patmos has his endurance his strength his faith best described by being spoken of as a man i am rather weary of this word gentlemanly which seems to me to be often inappropriately used and often too with such exaggerated distortion of meaning while the full simplicity of the noun man and the adjective manly are unacknowledged that i am induced to class it with the cant of the day margaret thought a moment but before she could speak her slow conviction he was called away by some of the eager manufacturers whose speeches she could not hear though she could guess at their import by the short clear answers mr thornton gave which came steady and firm as the boom of a distant minute gun they were evidently talking of the turnout and suggesting what course had best be pursued she heard mr thornton say that has been done there came a hurried murmur in which two or three joined all those arrangements have been made some doubts were implied some difficulties named by mr slickson who took hold of mr thornton's arm the better to impress his words mr thornton moved slightly away lifted his eyebrows a very little and then replied i take the risk you need not join in it unless you choose still some more fears were urged i am not afraid of anything so dastardly as incendiarism we are open enemies and i can protect myself from any violence that i apprehend and i will assuredly protect all others who come to me for work they know my determination by this time as well and as fully as you do mr horsfall took him a little on one side as margaret conjectured to ask him some other question about the strike but in truth it was to inquire who she herself was so quiet so stately and so beautiful a milton lady he asked as the name was given no from the south of england hampshire i believe was the cold indifferent answer mrs slickson was catechizing fanny on the same subject who is that fine distinguished-looking girl a sister of mr horsfall's oh dear no that is mr hale her father talking now to mr stevens he gives lessons that is to say he reads with young men my brother john goes to him twice a week and so he begged mamma to ask them here in hopes of getting him known i believe we have some of their prospectuses if you would like to have one mr thornton does he really find time to read with a tutor in the midst of all his business and this abominable strike in hand as well fanny was not sure from mrs slickson's manner whether she ought to be proud or ashamed of her brother's conduct and like all people who try and take other people's ought for the rule of their feelings she was inclined to blush for any singularity of action her shame was interrupted by the dispersion of the guests end of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of north and south by elizabeth gaskell this librivox recording is in the public domain read by marianne on earth is known to none the smile that is not sister to a tear Elliot. margaret and her father walked home the night was fine the streets clean 
and with her pretty white silk, like Lizzy Lindsay's gown of green satin, in the ballad, kilted up to her knee, she was off with her father, ready to dance along with the excitement of the cool, fresh night air. "'I rather think Thornton is not quite easy in his mind about this strike. He seemed very anxious to-night.' "'I should wonder if he were not. But he spoke with his usual coolness to the others, when they suggested different things, just before we came away.' "'So he did, after dinner, as well. It would take a good deal to stir him from his cool manner of speaking. But his face strikes me as anxious.' I should be, if I were he. He must know of the growing anger and hardly smothered hatred of his workpeople, who all look upon him as what the Bible calls a hard man, not so much unjust as unfeeling, clear in judgment, standing upon his rights as no human being ought to stand, considering what we and all our petty rights are in the sight of the Almighty. I am glad you think he looks anxious. When I remember Boucher's half-mad words and ways— I cannot bear to think how coolly Mr. Thornton spoke. "'In the first place, I am not so convinced as you are about that man Boucher's utter distress. For the moment he was badly off, I don't doubt. But there's always a mysterious supply of money from these unions, and, from what you said, it was evident that the man was of a passionate, demonstrative nature, and gave strong expression to all he felt.' "'Oh!' Papa. Well, I only want you to do justice to Mr. Thornton, who is, I suspect, of an exactly opposite nature, a man who is far too proud to show his feelings. Just the character I should have thought beforehand you would have admired, Margaret. So I do. So I should. But I don't feel quite so sure as you do of the existence of those feelings. He is a man of great strength of character of unusual intellect, considering the few advantages he has had. Not so few. He has led a practical life from a very early age, has been called upon to exercise judgment and self-control. All that develops one part of the intellect. To be sure, he needs some knowledge of the past, which gives the truest basis for conjecture as to the future. But he knows this need. He perceives it and that is something. You are quite prejudiced against Mr. Thornton, Margaret. He is the first specimen of a manufacturer, of a person engaged in trade, that I ever had the opportunity of studying, Papa. He is my first olive. Let me make a face while I swallow it. I know he is good of his kind, and by and by I shall like the kind. I rather think I am already beginning to do so. I was very much interested by what the gentlemen were talking about, although I did not understand half of it. I was quite sorry when Miss Thornton came to take me to the other end of the room, saying she was sure I would be uncomfortable at being the only lady among so many gentlemen. I had never thought about it. I was so busy listening. And the ladies were so dull, Papa. Oh, so dull. Yet I think it was clever, too. It reminded me of our old game of having each so many nouns to introduce into a sentence. "'What do you mean, child?' asked Mr. Hale. "'Why, they took nouns that were signs of things which gave evidence of wealth. Housekeepers, undergardeners, extent of glass, valuable lace, diamonds, and all such things. And each one formed her speech so as to bring them all in, in the prettiest accidental manner possible.' "'You will be as proud of your one servant when you get her, "'if all is true about her that Mrs. Thornton says.' "'To be sure, I shall. "'I felt like a great hypocrite to-night, "'sitting there in my white silk gown, "'with my idle hands before me, "'when I remembered all the good, thorough housework they had done to-day. "'They took me for a fine lady, I'm sure. "'Even I was mistaken enough to think you looked like a lady, my dear.' said Mr. Hale, quietly smiling. But smiles were changed to white and trembling looks when they saw Dixon's face as she opened the door. "'Oh, Master! Oh, Miss Margaret! Thank God you are come! A Dr. Donaldson is here. The servant next door went for him, for the charwoman has gone home. She is better now. 
"'But, oh, sir, I thought she would have died an hour ago.' Mr. Hale caught Margaret's arm to steady himself from falling. He looked at her face, and saw an expression upon it of surprise and extremest sorrow, but not the agony of terror that contracted his own unprepared heart. She knew more than he did, and yet she listened with that hopeless expression of awed apprehension. "'Oh, I should not have left her! Wicked daughter that I am!' moaned forth Margaret, as she supported her trembling father's hasty steps upstairs. Dr. Donaldson met them on the landing. "'She is better now,' he whispered. "'The opiate has taken effect. The spasms were very bad. No wonder they frightened your maid. But she'll rally this time.' "'This time? Let me go to her.' Half an hour ago, Mr. Hale was a middle-aged man. Now his sight was dim, his senses wavering, his walk tottering, as if he were seventy years of age. Dr. Donaldson took his arm and led him into the bedroom. Margaret followed close. There lay her mother, with an unmistakable look on her face. She might be better now. She was sleeping, but death had signed her for his own and it was clear that ere long he would return to take possession. Mr. Hale looked at her for some time without a word. Then he began to shake all over, and, turning away from Dr. Donaldson's anxious care, he groped to find the door. He could not see it, although several candles, brought in the sudden affright, were burning and flaring there. He staggered into the drawing-room, and felt about for a chair. Dr. Donaldson wheeled one to him and placed him in it. He felt his pulse. "'Speak to him, Miss Hale. We must rouse him.' "'Papa,' said Margaret, with a crying voice that was wild with pain. "'Papa, speak to me.' The speculation came again into his eyes, and he made a great effort. "'Margaret, did you know of this?' Oh, it was cruel of you. No, sir, it was not cruel, replied Dr. Donaldson, with quick decision. Miss Hale acted under my directions. There may have been a mistake, but it was not cruel. Your wife will be a different creature tomorrow, I trust. She has had spasms, as I anticipated, though I did not tell Miss Hale of my apprehensions. She has taken the opiate I brought with me. She will have a good long sleep, and to-morrow that look which has alarmed you so much will have passed away. But not the disease. Dr. Donaldson glanced at Margaret. Her head bent, her face raised with no appeal for a temporary reprieve, showed that quick observer of human nature that she thought it better that the whole truth should be told. Not the disease. We cannot touch the disease, with all our poor vaunted skill. We can only delay its progress, alleviate the pain it causes. Be a man, sir, a Christian. Have faith in the immortality of the soul, which no pain, no mortal disease, can assail or touch. But all the reply he got was in the choked words, You have never been married, Dr. Donaldson. You do not know what it is. And in the deep, manly sobs, which went through the stillness of the night like heavy pulses of agony. Margaret knelt by him, caressing him with tearful caresses. No one, not even Dr. Donaldson, knew how the time went by. Mr. Hale was the first to dare to speak of the necessities of the present moment. What? must we do he asked tell us both margaret is my staff my right hand dr donaldson gave his clear sensible directions no fear for to-night nay even peace for to-morrow and for many days yet but no enduring hope of recovery he advised mr hale to go to bed and leave only one to watch the slumber which he hoped would be undisturbed. He promised to come again early in the morning, and with a warm and kindly shake of the hand, 
he left them. They spoke but few words. They were too much exhausted by their terror to do more than decide upon the immediate course of action. Mr. Hale was resolved to sit up through the night, and all that Margaret could do was to prevail upon him to rest on the drawing-room sofa. Dixon stoutly and bluntly refused to go to bed, and, as for Margaret, it was simply impossible that she should leave her mother, let all the doctors in the world speak of husbanding resources, and one watcher only being required. So, Dixon sat, and stared, and winked, and drooped, and picked herself up again with a jerk, and finally gave up the battle, and fairly snored. Margaret had taken off her gown and tossed it aside with a sort of impatient disgust, and put on her dressing-gown. She felt as if she could never sleep again, as if her whole senses were acutely vital, and all endued with double keenness, for the purpose of watching. Every sight and sound, nay, even every thought, touched some nerve to the very quick. For more than two hours she heard her father's restless movements in the next room. He came perpetually to the door of her mother's chamber, pausing there to listen, till she, not hearing his close unseen presence, went and opened it to tell him how all went on, in reply to the questions his baked lips could hardly form. At last he, too, fell asleep, and all the house was still. Margaret sat behind the curtain, thinking, far away in time, far away in space, seemed all the interests of past days. No more than thirty-six hours ago, she cared for Bessie Higgins and her father, and her heart was wrung for Boucher. Now, that was all like a dreaming memory of some former life. Everything that had passed out of doors seemed dissevered from her mother, and therefore unreal. Even Hardley Street appeared more distinct. There she remembered, as if it were yesterday, how she had pleased herself with tracing out her mother's features in her Aunt Shaw's face, and how letters had come, making her dwell on the thoughts of home with all the longing of love. Hellstone, itself, was in the dim past. The dull grey days of the preceding winter and spring, so uneventless and monotonous, seemed more associated with what she cared for now above all price. She would fain have caught at the skirts of that departing time, and prayed it to return, and give her back what she had too little valued while it was yet in her possession. What a vain show life seemed! How unsubstantial, and flickering, and flitting! It was as if from some aerial belfry, high up above the stir and jar of the earth, there was a bell continually tolling, All our shadows, all are passing, all is past. And when the morning dawned, cool and grey, like many a happier morning before, when Margaret looked one by one at the sleepers, it seemed as if the terrible night were unreal as a dream, it, too, was a shadow. It, too, was past. Mrs. Hale herself was not aware when she awoke how ill she had been the night before. She was rather surprised at Dr. Donaldson's early visit, and perplexed by the anxious faces of husband and child. She consented to remain in bed that day, saying she certainly was tired, but the next she insisted on getting up and Dr. Donaldson gave his consent to her returning into the drawing-room. She was restless and uncomfortable in every position, and before night she had become feverish. Mr. Hale was utterly listless, and incapable of deciding on anything. "'What can we do to spare Mamma such another night?' asked Margaret, on the third day. "'It is, to a certain degree, the reaction after the powerful opiates I have been obliged to use.' It is more painful for you to see than for her to bear, I believe. But, I think, if we could get a water-bed it might be a good thing. Not but what she will be better to-morrow, pretty much like herself as she was before this attack. Still, I should like her to have a water-bed. Mrs. Thornton has one, I know. I'll try and call there this afternoon. Stay, said he, his eye catching on Margaret's face, blanched with watching in a sick-room. 
I am not sure whether I can go. I've a long round to take. It would do you no harm to have a brisk walk to Marlborough Street, and ask Mrs. Thornton if she can spare it. Certainly, said Margaret. I could go while Mamma is asleep this afternoon. I'm sure Mrs. Thornton would lend it to us. Dr. Donaldson's experience told them rightly. Mrs. Hale seemed to shake off the consequences of her attack, and looked brighter and better this afternoon than Margaret had ever hoped of seeing her again. Her daughter left her after dinner, sitting in her easy-chair, with her hand lying on her husband's, who looked more worn and suffering than she by far. Still, he could smile now, rather slowly, rather faintly, it is true, but a day or two before, Margaret never thought to see him smile again. It was about two miles from their house in Crampton Crescent to Marlborough Street. It was too hot to walk very quickly. An August sun beat straight down into the street at three o'clock in the afternoon. Margaret went along, without noticing anything very different from usual in the first mile and a half of her journey. She was absorbed in her own thoughts, and had learnt by this time to thread her way through the irregular stream of human beings that flowed through Milton streets. But, by and by, she was struck with an unusual heaving among the mass of people in the crowded road on which she was entering. They did not appear to be moving on, so much as talking, and listening, and buzzing with excitement, without much stirring from the spot where they might happen to be. Still, as they made way for her, and, wrapped up in the purpose of her errand, and the necessities that suggested it, she was less quick of observation than she might have been, if her mind had been at ease. She had got into Marlborough Street before the full conviction forced itself upon her, that there was a restless, oppressive sense of irritation abroad among the people, a thunderous atmosphere, morally as well as physically, around her. From every narrow lane opening out on Marlborough Street came up a low, distant roar, as of myriads of fierce, indignant voices. The inhabitants of each poor, squalid dwelling were gathered round the doors and windows, if indeed they were not actually standing in the middle of the narrow ways, all with looks intent towards one point. Marlborough Street itself was the focus of all those human eyes, that betrayed intensest interest of various kinds, some fierce with anger, some lowering with relentless threats, some dilated with fear or imploring entreaty, and, as Margaret reached the small side entrance by the folding doors, in the great dead wall of Marlborough Mill Yard, and waited the porter's answer to the bell, she looked round and heard the first long, far-off roll of the tempest, saw the first slow surging wave of the dark crowd come, with its threatening crest, tumble over and retreat at the far end of the street, which a moment ago seemed so full of repressed noise, but which now was ominously still. All these circumstances forced themselves on Margaret's notice, but did not sink down into her preoccupied heart. She did not know what they meant, what was their deep significance. While she did know, did feel the keen sharp pressure of the knife that was soon to stab her through and through by leaving her motherless. She was trying to realize that, in order that, when it came, she might be ready to comfort her father. The porter opened the door cautiously, not nearly wide enough to admit her. "'It's you, is it, ma'am?' said he, drawing a long breath and widening the entrance, but still not opening it fully. Margaret went in. He hastily bolted it behind her. "'The folk are all coming up here, I reckon?' asked he. "'I don't know. Something unusual seemed going on, but this street is quite empty, I think.' She went across the yard and up the steps to the house door. There was no near sound, no steam engine at work with beat and pant, no click of machinery or mingling and clashing of many sharp voices, but far away the ominous gathering roar, deep clamoring. End of chapter 21《Chapter Twenty Two of North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.
Read by Marianne. Chapter Twenty Two, A Blow and Its Consequences. But work grew scarce, while bread grew dear, and wages lessened too, for Irish hordes were bitters here, our half-paid work to do. Corn Law Rhymes. Margaret was shown into the drawing room. It had returned to its normal state of bag and coverings. The windows were half open because of the heat, and the Venetian blinds covered the glass, so that a grey grim light, reflected from the pavement below, threw all the shadows wrong, and combined with the green-tinged upper light to make even Margaret's own face, as she caught it in the mirrors, look ghastly and wan. She sat and waited. No one came. Every now and then the wind seemed to bear the distant, multitudinous sound nearer, and yet there was no wind. It died away into profound stillness between the whiles. Fanny came in at last. "'Mamma will come directly, Miss Hale. She desired me to apologize to you, as it is. Perhaps you know my brother has imported hands from Ireland, and it has irritated the Milton people excessively.' as if he hadn't a right to get labour where he could, and the stupid wretches here wouldn't work for him. And now they've frightened these poor Irish starvelings so with their threats that we daren't let them out. You may see them, huddled in that top room in the mill. And they're to sleep there, to keep them safe from those brutes, who will neither work nor let them work. And Mamma is seeing about their food, and John is speaking to them, for some of the women are crying to go back. Ah, here's Mamma. Mrs. Thornton came in with a look of black sternness on her face, which made Margaret feel she had arrived at a bad time to trouble her with her request. However, it was only in compliance with Mrs. Thornton's expressed desire that she would ask for whatever they might want in the progress of her mother's illness. Mrs. Thornton's brow contracted, and her mouth grew set, when Margaret spoke with gentle modesty of her mother's restlessness and Dr. Donaldson's wish that she should have the relief of a water-bed. She ceased. Mrs. Thornton did not reply immediately. Then she started up and exclaimed, "'They're at the gates! Call John, Fanny! Call him in from the mill! They're at the gates! They'll batter them in! Call John, I say!' and simultaneously the gathering tramp to which she had been listening instead of heeding margaret's words was heard just right outside the wall and an increasing din of angry voices raged behind the wooden barrier which shook as if the unseen maddened crowd made battering rams of their bodies and retreated a short space only to come with more united steady impetus against it till their great beats made the strong gates quiver like reeds before the wind. The women gathered round the windows, fascinated to look on the scene which terrified them. Mrs. Thornton, the women servants, Margaret, all were there. Fanny had returned, screaming upstairs as if pursued at every step, and had thrown herself in hysterical sobbing on the sofa. Mrs. Thornton watched for her son, who was still in the mill. He came out, looked up at them, the pale cluster of faces, and smiled good courage to them, before he locked the factory door. Then he called to one of the women to come down and undo his own door, which Fanny had fastened behind him in her mad flight. Mrs. Thornton herself went, and the sound of his well-known and commanding voice seemed to have been like the taste of blood to the infuriated multitude outside. Hitherto they had been voiceless, wordless, needing all their breath for their hard laboring efforts to break down the gates. But now, hearing him speak inside, they set up such a fierce, unearthly groan, that even Mrs. Thornton was white with fear as she preceded him into the room. He came in a little flushed, but his eyes gleaming, as if in answer to the trumpet call of danger, and with a proud look of defiance on his face that made him a noble, if not a handsome man, Margaret had always dreaded lest her courage should fail her in any emergency, and she should be proved to be what she dreaded lest she was, a coward. But now, in this real great time of reasonable fear and nearness of terror, she forgot herself, 
and only felt an intense sympathy, intense to painfulness, in the interests of the moment. Mr. Thornton came frankly forwards. "'I am sorry, Miss Hale. You have visited us at this unfortunate moment, when, I fear, you may be involved in whatever risk we have to bear. Mother, hadn't you better go into the back rooms? I am not sure whether they may not have made their way from Pinner's Lane into the stable-yards, but if not, you will be safer there than here. Go, Jane,' continued he, addressing the upper servant, and she went, followed by the others. "'I stop here,' said his mother. "'Where you are, there I stay.' And, indeed, retreat into the back rooms was of no avail. The crowd had surrounded the outbuildings at the rear, and were sending forth their awful threatening roar behind. The servants retreated into the garrets, with many a cry and shriek. Mr. Thornton smiled scornfully as he heard them. He glanced at Margaret, standing all by herself at the window nearest the factory. Her eyes glittered, her color was deepened on cheek and lip. As if she felt his look, she turned to him and asked a question that had been for some time in her mind. "'Where are the poor imported workpeople? In the factory there?' "'Yes. I left them cowered up in a small room, at the head of a back flight of stairs, bidding them run all risks and escape down there, if they heard any attack made on the mill doors. But it is not them. It is me they want.' "'When can the soldiers be here?' asked his mother, in a low but not unsteady voice. He took out his watch, with the same measured composure with which he did everything. He made some little calculation. "'Supposing Williams got straight off when I told him, and had it to dodge about amongst them, it must be twenty minutes yet.' Twenty minutes,' said his mother, for the first time showing her terror in the tones of her voice. "'Shut down the windows instantly, mother,' exclaimed he. "'The gates won't bear such another shock. Shut down that window, Miss Hale.' Margaret shut down her window, and then went to assist Mrs. Thornton's trembling fingers. For some cause or other there was a pause of several minutes in the unseen street. Mrs. Thornton looked with wild anxiety at her son's countenance, as if to gain the interpretation of the sudden stillness from him. His face was set into rigid lines of contemptuous defiance. Neither hope nor fear could be read there. Fanny raised herself up. "'Are they gone?' asked she, in a whisper. "'Gone,' replied he. "'Listen.' She did listen. They all could hear the one great straining breath, the creak of wood slowly yielding, the wrench of iron, the mighty fall of the ponderous gates. Fanny stood up tottering, made a step or two towards her mother, and fell forwards into her arms in a fainting fit. Mrs. Thornton lifted her up with a strength that was as much that of the will as of the body, and carried her away. "'Thank God,' said Mr. Thornton, as he watched her out. "'Had you not better go upstairs, Miss Hale?' Margaret's lips formed a no, but he could not hear her speak, for the tramp of innumerable steps right under the very wall of the house, and the fierce growl of low, deep, angry voices, that had a ferocious murmur of satisfaction in them, more dreadful than their baffled cries not many minutes before. "'Never mind,' said he, thinking to encourage her. "'I am very sorry that you should have been entrapped into all this alarm, but it cannot last long now. A few minutes more, and the soldiers will be here.' "'Oh, God!' cried Margaret, suddenly. "'There is Boucher! I know his face, though he is livid with rage. He is fighting to get to the front. Look! Look!' "'Who is Boucher?' asked Mr. Thornton, coolly, and coming close to the window to discover the man in whom Margaret took such an interest. As soon as they saw Mr. Thornton, they set up a yell. To call it not human is nothing. It was as the demoniac desire of some terrible wild beast for the food that is withheld from his ravening. Even he drew back for a moment, dismayed at the intensity of hatred he had provoked. "'Let them yell,' 
he said. "'In five minutes more. "'I only hope my poor Irishmen are not terrified out of their wits "'by such a fiend-like noise. "'Keep up your courage for five minutes, Miss Hale.' "'Don't be afraid for me,' she said hastily. "'But what in five minutes? "'Can you do nothing to soothe these poor creatures? "'It is awful to see them.' The soldiers will be here directly, and that will bring them to reason. To reason, said Margaret, quickly. What kind of reason? The only reason that does with men that make themselves into wild beasts. By heaven, they've turned to the mill door. Mr. Thornton, said Margaret, shaking all over with her passion. Go down this instant, if you are not a coward. Go down and face them like a man. Save these poor strangers, whom you have decoyed here. Speak to your workmen as if they were human beings. Speak to them kindly. Don't let the soldiers come in and cut down poor creatures who are driven mad. I see one there who is. If you have any courage or noble quality in you, go out and speak to them, man to man. He turned and looked at her while she spoke. A dark cloud came over his face while he listened. He set his teeth as he heard her words. "'I will go. Perhaps I may ask you to accompany me downstairs and bar the door behind me. My mother and sister will need that protection.' "'Oh, Mr. Thornton, I do not know. I may be wrong, only—' But he was gone. He was downstairs in the hall. He had unbarred the front door. All she could do was to follow him quickly and fasten it behind him, and clamber up the stairs again with a sick heart and a dizzy head. Again she took her place by the farthest window. He was on the steps below. She saw that by the direction of a thousand angry eyes. But she could neither see nor hear anything save the savage satisfaction of the rolling, angry murmur. She threw the window wide open. Many in the crowd were mere boys, cruel and thoughtless, cruel because they were thoughtless. Some were men, gaunt as wolves, and mad for prey. She knew how it was. They were like Boucher, with starving children at home, relying on ultimate success in their efforts to get higher wages, and enraged beyond measure at discovering that Irishmen were to be brought in to rob their little ones of bread. Margaret knew it all. She read it in Boucher's face, forlornly desperate and livid with rage. If Mr. Thornton would but say something to them, let them hear his voice only. It seemed as if it would be better than this wild beating and raging against the stony silence that vouchsafed them no word, even of anger or reproach. But perhaps he was speaking now. There was a momentary hush of their noise inarticulate as that of a troop of animals. She tore her bonnet off and bent forwards to hear. She could only see, for if Mr. Thornton had indeed made the attempt to speak, the momentary instinct to listen to him was past and gone, and the people were raging worse than ever. He stood with his arms folded, still as a statue, his face pale with repressed excitement. They were going to try to intimidate him, to make him flinch. Each was urging the other on to some immediate act of personal violence. Margaret felt intuitively that in an instant all would be uproar. The first touch would cause an explosion in which, among such hundreds of infuriated men and reckless boys, even Mr. Thornton's life would be unsafe. That in another instant the stormy passions would have passed their bounds and swept away all barriers of reason, or apprehension of consequence. Even while she looked, she saw lads in the background stooping to take off their heavy wooden clogs, the readiest missile they could find. She saw it was the spark to the gunpowder, and, with a cry, which no one heard, she rushed out of the room, downstairs. She had lifted the great iron bar of the door with an imperious force, had thrown the door wide open, and was there, in face of that angry sea of men, her eyes smiting them with flaming arrows of reproach. 
the clogs were arrested in the hands that held them the countenances so fell not a moment before now looked irresolute as if asking what this meant for she stood between them and their enemy she could not speak but held out her arms toward them till she could recover breath oh do not use violence he is one man and you are many but her words died away for there was no tone in her voice it was but a hoarse whisper mr thornton stood a little on one side he had moved away from behind her as if jealous of anything that should come between him and danger go she said once more and now her voice was like a cry the soldiers are sent for are coming go peaceably go away you shall have relief from your complaints whatever they are shall them irish blackguards be packed back again asked one from the crowd with fierce threatening in his voice never for your bidding exclaimed mr thornton and instantly the storm broke the hootings rose and filled the air but margaret did not hear them her eye was on the group of lads who had armed themselves with their clogs some time before she saw their gesture she knew its meaning she read their aim another moment and mr thornton might be smitten down he whom she had urged and goaded to come to this perilous place she only thought how she could save him she threw her arms around him she made her body into a shield from the fierce people beyond still with his arms folded he shook her off go away said he in his deep voice this is no place for you it is said she you did not see what i saw if she thought her sex would be a protection if with shrinking eyes she had turned away from the terrible anger of these men in any hope that ere she looked again they would have paused and reflected and slunk away and vanished she was wrong their reckless passion had carried them too far to stop at least had carried some of them too far for it is always the savage lads with their love of cruel excitement who head the riot reckless to what bloodshed it may lead a clog whizzed through the air margaret's fascinated eyes watched its progress it missed its aim and she turned sick with affright but changed not her position only hid her face on mr thornton's arm then she turned and spoke again for god's sake do not damage your cause by this violence you do not know what you are doing she strove to make her words distinct a sharp pebble flew by her grazing forehead and cheek and drawing a blinding sheet of light before her eyes she lay like one dead on mr thornton's shoulder then he unfolded his arms and held her encircled in one for an instant you do well said he you come to oust the innocent stranger you fall you hundreds on one man and when a woman comes before you to ask you for your own sakes to be reasonable creatures your cowardly wrath falls on her you do well they were silent while he spoke they were watching open-eyed and open-mouthed the thread of dark red blood which wakened them up from their trance of passion those nearest to the gate stole out ashamed there was a movement through all the crowd a retreating movement only one voice cried out the stone were meant for thee but thou wert sheltered behind a woman mr thornton quivered with rage the blood flowing had made margaret conscious dimly vaguely conscious he placed her gently on the doorstep her head leaning against the frame can you rest there he asked but without waiting for her answer he went slowly down the steps right into the middle of the crowd now kill me if it is your brutal will there is no woman to shield me here you may beat me to death you will never move me from what i have determined upon not you he stood amongst them with his arms folded in precisely the same attitude as he had been in on the steps 
but the retrograde movement toward the gate had begun as unreasoningly perhaps as blindly as the simultaneous anger or perhaps the idea of the approach of the soldiers and the sight of that pale upturned face with closed eyes still and sad as marble though the tears welled out of the long entanglement of eyelashes and dropped down and heavier slower plash than even tears came the drip of blood from her wound even the most desperate boucher himself drew back faltered away scowled and finally went off muttering curses on the master who stood in his unchanging attitude looking after their retreat with defiant eyes the moment the retreat had changed into a flight as it was sure from its very character to do he darted up the steps to margaret she tried to rise without his help it is nothing she said with a sickly smile the skin is grazed and i was stunned at the moment oh i am so thankful they are gone and she cried without restraint he could not sympathize with her his anger had not abated it was rather rising the more as his sense of immediate danger was passing away the distant clank of the soldiers was heard just five minutes too late to make this vanished mob feel the power of authority and order he hoped they would see the troops and be quelled by the thought of their narrow escape while these thoughts crossed his mind margaret clung to the doorpost to steady herself but a film came over her eyes he was only just in time to catch her mother mother cried he come down they are gone and miss hale is hurt he bore her into the dining-room and laid her on the sofa there laid her down softly and looking on her pure white face the sense of what she was to him came upon him so keenly that he spoke it out in his pain oh my margaret my margaret no one can tell what you are to me dead cold as you lie there you are the only woman i ever loved oh margaret margaret inarticulately as he spoke kneeling by her and rather moaning than saying the words he started up ashamed of himself as his mother came in she saw nothing but her son a little paler a little sterner than usual miss hale is hurt mother a stone has grazed her temple she has lost a good deal of blood i'm afraid she looks very seriously hurt i could almost fancy her dead said mrs thornton a good deal alarmed it is only a fainting fit she has spoken to me since but all the blood in his body seemed to rush inwards to his heart as he spoke and he absolutely trembled go and call jane she can find me the things i want and do you go to your irish people who are crying and shouting as if they were mad with fright he went he went away as if weights were tied to every limb that bore him from her he called jane he called his sister she should have all the womanly care all gentle tenderance but every pulse beat in him as he remembered how she had come down and placed herself in foremost danger could it be to save him at the time he had pushed her aside and spoken gruffly he had seen nothing but the unnecessary danger she had placed herself in he went to his irish people with every nerve in his body thrilling at the thought of her and found it difficult to understand enough of what they were saying to soothe and comfort away their fears there they declared they would not stop they claimed to be sent back and so he had to think and talk and reason mrs thornton bathed margaret's temples with eau de cologne as the spirit touched the wound which till then neither mrs thornton nor jane had perceived margaret opened her eyes but it was evident that she did not know where she was nor who they were the dark circles deepened the lips quivered and contracted and she became insensible once more she has had a terrible blow said mrs thornton is there any one who will go for a doctor 
"'Not me, ma'am, if you please,' said Jane, shrinking back. "'Them rabble may be all about. "'I don't think the cut is so deep, ma'am, as it looks.' "'I will not run the chance. "'She was hurt in our house. "'If you are a coward, Jane, I am not. "'I will go. "'Pray, ma'am, let me send one of the police. "'There's ever so many come up, and soldiers, too. "'And yet you're afraid to go.' I will not have their time taken up with our errands. They'll have enough to do to catch some of the mob. You will not be afraid to stop in this house, she asked contemptuously, and go on bathing Miss Hale's forehead, shall you? I shall not be ten minutes away. Couldn't Hannah go, ma'am? Why Hannah? Why any one but you? No, Jane. If you don't go, I do. Mrs. Thornton went first to the room in which she had left Fanny stretched on the bed. She started up as her mother entered. "'Oh, Mamma, how you terrified me! I thought you were a man that had got into the house!' "'Nonsense! The men are all gone away. There are soldiers all around the place, seeking for their work now it is too late. Miss Hale is lying on the dining-room sofa, badly hurt. I am going for the doctor.' "'Oh!' "'Don't, Mamma! They'll murder you!' She clung to her mother's gown. Mrs. Thornton wrenched it away with no gentle hand. "'Find me someone else to go, but that girl must not bleed to death.' "'Bleed? Oh, how horrid! How has she got hurt?' "'I don't know. I have no time to ask. Go down to her, Fanny, and do try to make yourself of use. Jane is with her.' and I trust it looks worse than it is. Jane has refused to leave the house, cowardly woman, and I won't put myself in the way of any more refusals from my servants, so I am going myself. Oh, dear, dear, said Fanny, crying, and preparing to go down rather than be left alone, with the thought of wounds and bloodshed in the very house. Oh, Jane, said she, creeping into the dining-room, what is the matter? white she looks. How did she get hurt? Did they throw stones into the drawing-room? Margaret did indeed look white and wan, although her senses were beginning to return to her. But the sickly days of the swoon made her still miserably faint. She was conscious of movement around her, and of refreshment from the eau de cologne, and a craving for the bathing to go on without intermission. But when they stopped to talk, she could no more have opened her eyes or spoken to ask for more bathing, than the people who lie in death-like trance can move, or utter sound, to arrest the awful preparations for their burial, while they are yet fully aware, not merely of the actions of those around them, but of the idea that is the motive for such actions. Jane paused in her bathing, to reply to Miss Thornton's question. She'd have been safe enough, Miss, if she'd stayed in the drawing-room, or come up to us. We were in the front garret, and could see it all, out of harm's way. "'Where was she, then?' said Fanny, drawing nearer by slow degrees, as she became accustomed to the sight of Margaret's pale face. "'Just before the front door. With Master,' said Jane, significantly. "'With John? With my brother? How did she get there?' "'Nay, miss, that's not for me to say,' answered Jane, with a slight toss of her head. Sarah did. Sarah what? said Fanny, with impatient curiosity. Jane resumed her bathing, as if what Sarah did or said was not exactly the thing she liked to repeat. Sarah what? asked Fanny, sharply. Don't speak in these half-sentences, or I can't understand you. Well, miss, since you will have it. Sarah, you see— was in the best place for seeing, being at the right-hand window. And she says, and said at the very time, too, that she saw Miss Hale with her arms round Master's neck, hugging him before all the people. "'I don't believe it,' said Fanny. "'I know she cares for my brother. Anyone can see that. And I dare say she'd give her eyes if he'd marry her, which he never will, I can tell her, but I don't believe she'd be so bold and forward as to put her arms round his neck. Poor young lady. She's paid for it dearly if she did. 
it's my belief that the blow has given her such an ascendancy of blood to the head as she'll never get better from she looks like a corpse now oh i wish mamma would come said fanny wringing her hands i never was in the room with a dead person before stay miss she's not dead her eyelids are quivering and here's what tears are coming down her cheeks speak to her miss fanny are you better now asked fanny in a quavering voice no answer no sign of recognition but a faint pink colour returned to her lips although the rest of her face was ashen pale mrs thornton came hurriedly in with the nearest surgeon she could find how is she are you better my dear as margaret opened her filmy eyes and gazed dreamily at her here is mr low come to see you mrs thornton spoke loudly and distinctly as if to a deaf person margaret tried to rise and drew her ruffled luxuriant hair instinctively over the cut i am better now said she in a very low faint voice i was a little sick she let him take her hand and feel her pulse the bright colour came for a moment into her face when he asked to examine the wound in her forehead and she glanced up at jane as if shrinking from her inspection more than from the doctor's it is not much i think i am better now i must go home not until i have applied some strips of plaster and you have rested a little she sat down hastily without another word and allowed it to be bound up now if you please said she i must go mamma will not see it i think under the hair is it not quite no one could tell but you must not go said mrs thornton impatiently you are not fit to go i must said margaret decidedly think of mamma if they should hear besides i must go said she vehemently i cannot stay here may i ask for a cab you are quite flushed and feverish observed mr low it is only with being here when i do so want to go the air getting away would do me more good than anything pleaded she i really believe it is as she says mr low replied if her mother is so ill as you told me on the way here it may be very serious if she hears of this riot and does not see her daughter back at the time she expects the injury is not deep i will fetch a cab if your servants are still afraid to go out oh thank you said margaret it will do me more good than anything it is the air of this room that makes me feel so miserable she leant back on the sofa and closed her eyes fanny beckoned her mother out of the room and told her something that made her equally anxious with margaret for the departure of the latter not that she fully believed fanny's statement but she credited enough of it to make her manner to margaret appear very much constrained at wishing her good-bye mr low returned in the cab if you will allow me i will see you home miss hale the streets are not very quiet yet margaret's thoughts were quite alive enough to the present to make her desirous of getting rid of both mr low and the cab before she reached crampton crescent for fear of alarming her father and mother beyond that one aim she would not look that ugly dream of insolent words spoken about herself could never be forgotten but it could be put aside till she was stronger for oh she was very weak and her mind sought for some present fact to steady itself upon and keep it from utterly losing consciousness in another hideous sickly swoon end of chapter twenty two Chapter Twenty Three of North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter Twenty Three, Mistakes. Which, when his mother saw, she in her mind was troubled sore. Ne wist well what to ween. Spencer. 
Margaret had not been gone five minutes when Mr. Thornton came in, his face all aglow. "'I could not come sooner. The superintendent would—' "'Where is she?' He looked round the dining-room, and then almost fiercely at his mother, who was quietly rearranging the disturbed furniture, and did not instantly reply. "'Where is Miss Hale?' asked he again. "'Gone home,' said she, rather shortly. "'Gone home?' "'Yes. She was a great deal better. Indeed, I don't believe it was very much of a hurt. Only some people faint at the least thing.' "'I am sorry she has gone home,' said he, walking uneasily about. "'She could not have been fit for it.' "'She said she was. And Mr. Lowe said she was. I went for him myself.' "'Thank you, mother.' He stopped, and partly held out his hand to give her a grateful shake, but she did not notice the movement. "'What have you done with your Irish people?' "'Sent to the dragon for a good meal for them, poor wretches. And then, luckily, I caught Father Grady, and I've asked him in to speak with them, and dissuade them from going off in a body. How did Miss Hale go home? I'm sure she could not walk. She had a cab— Everything was done properly, even to the paying. Let us talk of something else. She has caused disturbance enough. I don't know where I should have been but for her. Are you become so helpless as to have to be defended by a girl? asked Mrs. Thornton, scornfully. He reddened. Not many girls would have taken the blows on herself which were meant for me, meant with right-down good will, too. A girl in love will do a great deal, replied Mrs. Thornton, shortly. Mother! He made a step forwards, stood still, heaved with passion. She was a little startled at the evident force he used to keep himself calm. She was not sure of the nature of the emotions she had provoked. It was only their violence that was clear. Was it anger? His eyes glowed, his figure was dilated. His breath came thick and fast. It was a mixture of joy, of anger, of pride, of glad surprise, of panting doubt, but she could not read it. Still, it made her uneasy, as the presence of all strong feeling, of which the cause is not fully understood or sympathized in, always has this effect. She went to the sideboard, opened a drawer, and took out a duster, which she kept there for any occasional purpose. She had seen a drop of eau de cologne on the polished arm of the sofa, and instinctively sought to wipe it off, but she kept her back turned to her son much longer than was necessary, and when she spoke her voice seemed unusual and constrained. "'You have taken some steps about the rioters, I suppose. You don't apprehend any more violence, do you? Where were the police? Never at hand when they're wanted.' On the contrary, I saw three or four of them, when the gates gave way, struggling and beating about in fine fashion, and more came running up just when the yard was clearing. I might have given some of the fellows in charge then, if I had had my wits about me. But there will be no difficulty. Plenty of people can identify them. But they won't come back to-night. I'm going to see about a sufficient guard for the premises. I have appointed to meet Captain Hanbury in half an hour at the station. You must have some tea first. Tea, yes. I suppose I must. It's half-past six, and I may be out for some time. Don't sit up for me, mother. You expect me to go to bed before I have seen you safe, do you? Well, perhaps not. He hesitated for a moment. But if I've time, I shall go round by Crampton, after I've arranged with the police, and seen Hamper and Clarkson. Their eyes met. They looked at each other intently for a minute. Then she asked, "'Why are you going round by Crampton?' "'To ask after Miss Hale.' "'I will send. Williams must take the water-bed she came to ask for. He shall inquire how she is. I must go myself.' "'Not merely to ask how Miss Hale is?' "'No, not merely for that.' I want to thank her for the way in which she stood between me and the mob. 
what made you go down at all it was putting your head in the lion's mouth he glanced sharply at her saw that she did not know what had passed between him and margaret in the drawing-room and replied by another question shall you be afraid to be left without me until i can get some of the police or had we better send williams for them now and they could be here by the time we have done tea there's no time to be lost i must be off in a quarter of an hour mrs thornton left the room her servants wondered at her directions usually so sharply cut and decided now confused and uncertain mr thornton remained in the dining-room trying to think of the business he had to do at the police office and in reality thinking of margaret everything seemed dim and vague beyond behind besides the touch of her arms round his neck the soft clinging which made the dark colour come and go in his cheek as he thought of it the tea would have been very silent but for fanny's perpetual description of her own feelings how she had been alarmed and then thought they were gone and felt sick and faint and trembling in every limb there that's enough said her brother rising from the table the reality was enough for me he was going to leave the room when his mother stopped him with her hand upon his arm you will come back here before you go to the hales she said in a low anxious voice i know what i know said fanny to herself why will it be too late to disturb them john come back to me for this one evening it will be late for mrs hale but that is not it to-morrow you will come back to-night john she had seldom pleaded with her son at all she was too proud for that but she had never pleaded in vain i will return straight here after i have done my business you will be sure to inquire after them after her mrs thornton was by no means a talkative companion to fanny nor yet a good listener while her son was absent but on his return her eyes and ears were so keen to see and to listen to all the details which he could give as to the steps he had taken to secure himself and those whom he chose to employ from any repetition of the day's outrages he clearly saw his object punishment and suffering were the natural consequences to those who had taken part in the riot all that was necessary in order that property should be protected and that the will of the proprietor might cut to his end clean and sharp as a sword mother you know what i have got to say to miss hale to-morrow the question came upon her suddenly during a pause in which she at least had forgotten margaret she looked up at him yes i do you can hardly do otherwise do otherwise i don't understand you i mean that after allowing her feelings to so overcome her i consider you bound in honour bound in honour he said scornfully i am afraid honour has nothing to do with it her feelings overcame her what feelings do you mean nay john there is no need to be angry did she not rush down and cling to you to save you from danger she did said he but mother continued he stopping short in his walk right in front of her i dare not hope i never was faint-hearted before but i cannot believe such a creature cares for me don't be foolish john such a creature why she might be a duke's daughter to hear you speak and what proof more would you have i wonder of her caring for you i can believe she has had a struggle with her aristocratic way of viewing things but i like her the better for seeing clearly at last it is a good deal for me to say said mrs thornton smiling slowly while the tears stood in her eyes for after to-night i shall stand second it was to have you to myself all to myself a few hours longer that i begged you not to go till to-morrow dearest mother still love is selfish and in an instant he reverted to his own hopes and fears in a way that drew the cold creeping shadow over mrs thornton's heart but i know she does not care for me i shall put myself at her feet i must if it were but one chance in a thousand 
or a million. I should do it. Don't fear, said his mother, crushing down her own personal mortification at the little notice he had taken of the rare evolution of her maternal feelings, the pang of jealousy that betrayed the intensity of her disregarded love. Don't be afraid, she said coldly. As far as love may go, she may be worthy of you. It must have taken a good deal to overcome her pride. Don't be afraid, John, said she, kissing him, as she wished him good night. And she went slowly and majestically out of the room. But when she got into her own, she locked the door, and sat down to cry unwanted tears. Margaret entered the room, where her father and mother still sat, holding low conversation together, looking very pale and white. She came close up to them before she could trust herself to speak. Mrs. Thornton will send the waterbed, Mamma. Dear, how tired you look! Is it very hot, Margaret? Very hot, and the streets are rather rough with the strike. Margaret's color came back vivid and bright as ever, but it faded away instantly. Here has been a message from Bessie Higgins, asking you to go to her, said Mrs. Hale. But I'm sure you look too tired. Yes, said Margaret. I am tired. I cannot go. She was very silent and trembling while she made tea. She was thankful to see her father so much occupied with her mother as not to notice her looks. Even after her mother went to bed, he was not content to be absent from her, but undertook to read her to sleep. Margaret was alone. Now I will think of it. Now I will remember it all. I could not before. I dared not. She sat still in her chair, her hands clasped on her knees, her lips compressed, her eyes fixed as one who sees a vision. She drew a deep breath. I, who hate scenes, I, who have despised people for showing emotion, who have thought them wanting in self-control, I went down, and must needs throw myself into the melee, like a romantic fool. Did I do any good? They would have gone away without me, I dare say. But this was overleaping the rational conclusion, as in an instant her well-poised judgment felt. No, perhaps they would not. I did some good. But what possessed me to defend that man as if he were a helpless child? Ah, she said, clenching her hands together. It is no wonder those people thought I was in love with him, after disgracing myself in that way. I in love, and with him, too. Her pale cheeks suddenly became one flame of fire, and she covered her face with her hands. When she took them away, her palms were wet with scalding tears. Oh, how low I am fallen that they should say that of me! I could not have been so brave for anyone else, just because he was so utterly indifferent to me. If, indeed, I do not positively dislike him. It made me the more anxious that there should be fair play on each side, and I could see what fair play was. It was not fair, said she, vehemently, that he should stand there, sheltered, awaiting the soldiers, who might catch those poor maddened creatures as in a trap, without an effort on his part to bring them to reason. And it was worse than unfair for them to set on him as they threatened. I would do it again. Let who will say what they like of me. If I saved one blow, one cruel, angry action that might otherwise have been committed, I did a woman's work. Let them insult my maiden pride as they will. I walk pure before God." She looked up, and a noble peace seemed to descend and calm her face, till it was stiller than chiselled marble. Dixon came in. "'If you please, Miss Margaret, here's the water-bed from Mrs. Thornton. It's too late for to-night, I'm afraid, for Mrs. is nearly asleep, but it will do nicely for to-morrow.' "'Very,' said Margaret. "'You must send our best thanks.' Dixon left the room for a moment. "'If you please, Miss Margaret,' 
he says he's to ask particular how you are i think he must mean missus but he says his last words were to ask how miss hale was me said margaret drawing herself up i am quite well tell him i am perfectly well but her complexion was as deadly white as her handkerchief and her head ached intensely mr hale now came in he had left his sleeping wife and wanted as margaret saw to be amused and interested by something that she was to tell him with sweet patience did she bear her pain without a word of complaint and rummaged up numberless small subjects for conversation all except the riot and that she never named once it turned her sick to think of it good night margaret i have every chance of a good night myself and you are looking very pale with your watching i shall call dixon if your mother needs anything do you go to bed and sleep like a top for i'm sure you need it poor child good night papa she let her colour go the forced smile fade away the eyes grow dull with heavy pain she released her strong will from its laborious task till morning she might feel ill and weary she lay down and never stirred to move hand or foot or even so much as one finger would have been an exertion beyond the powers of either volition or motion she was so tired so stunned that she thought she never slept at all her feverish thoughts passed and repassed the boundary between sleeping and waking and kept their own miserable identity she could not be alone prostrate powerless as she was a cloud of faces looked up at her giving her no idea of fierce vivid anger or of personal danger but a deep sense of shame that she should thus be the object of universal regard a sense of shame so acute that it seemed as if she would fain have burrowed into the earth to hide herself and yet she could not escape out of that unwinking glare of many eyes end of chapter 23《Chapter Twenty Four of North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter Twenty Four Mistakes Cleared Up. Your beauty was the first that won the place, and scaled the walls of my undaunted heart, which, captive now, pines in a caitive case, unkindly met with rigor for desert yet not the less your servant shall abide in spite of rude repulse or silent pride william fowler the next morning margaret dragged herself up thankful that the night was over unrefreshed yet rested all had gone well through the house her mother had only wakened once a little breeze was stirring in the hot air and though there were no trees to show the playful tossing movement caused by the wind among the leaves, Margaret knew how, somewhere or another, by wayside, in copses, or in thick green woods, there was a pleasant, murmuring, dancing sound, a rushing and falling noise, the very thought of which was an echo of distant gladness in her heart. She sat at her work in Mrs. Hale's room, as soon as that forenoon slumber was over she would help her mother to dress after dinner she would go and see bessie higgins she would banish all recollection of the thornton family no need to think of them till they absolutely stood before her in flesh and blood but of course the effort not to think of them brought them only the more strongly before her and from time to time the hot flush came over her pale face sweeping it into colour as a sunbeam from between watery clouds comes swiftly moving over the sea dixon opened the door very softly and stole on tiptoe up to margaret sitting by the shaded window mr thornton miss margaret he's in the drawing-room margaret dropped her sewing did he ask for me isn't papa come in he asked for you miss and the master is out very well i will come said margaret quietly but she lingered strangely 
Mr. Thornton stood by one of the windows, with his back to the door, apparently absorbed in watching something in the street. But, in truth, he was afraid of himself. His heart beat thick at the thought of her coming. He could not forget the touch of her arms round his neck, impatiently felt as it had been at the time, but now the recollection of her clinging defence of him seemed to thrill him through and through, to melt away every resolution, all power of self-control, as if it were wax before a fire. He dreaded lest he should go forwards to meet her, with his arms held out in mute entreaty that she would come and nestle there, as she had done, all unheeded, the day before, but never unheeded again. His heart throbbed loud and quick. Strong man as he was, he trembled at the anticipation of what he had to say, and how it might be received. She might droop, and flush, and flutter to his arms, as to her natural home and resting place. One moment he glowed with impatience at the thought that she might do this. The next, he feared a passionate rejection, the very idea of which withered up his future with so deadly a blight that he refused to think of it. He was startled by the sense of the presence of someone else in the room. He turned round. She had come in so gently that he had never heard her. The street noises had been more distinct to his inattentive ear than her slow movements in her soft muslin gown. She stood by the table, not offering to sit down. Her eyelids were dropped half over her eyes. Her teeth were shut, not compressed. Her lips were just parted over them, allowing the white line to be seen between their curve. Her slow, deep breathings dilated her thin and beautiful nostrils. It was the only motion visible on her countenance. The fine-grained skin, the oval cheek, the rich outline of her mouth, its corners deep-set in dimples, were all wan and pale to-day the loss of their usual natural healthy colour being made the more evident by the heavy shadow of the dark hair, brought down upon the temples, to hide all signs of the blow she had received. Her head, for all its drooping eyes, was thrown a little back, in the old proud attitude. Her long arms hung motionless by her sides. Altogether she looked like some prisoner, falsely accused of a crime that she loathed and despised, and from which she was too indignant to justify herself. Mr. Thornton made a hasty step or two forwards, recovered himself, and went with quiet firmness to the door, which she had left open, and shut it. Then he came back, and stood opposite to her for a moment, receiving the general impression of her beautiful presence, before he dared to disturb it, perhaps to repel it, by what he had to say. "'Miss Hale, I was very ungrateful yesterday.' "'You had nothing to be grateful for,' said she, raising her eyes, and looking full and straight at him. "'You mean, I suppose, that you believe you ought to thank me for what I did.' In spite of herself, in defiance of her anger, the thick blushes came all over her face, and burnt into her very eyes, which fell not nevertheless from their grave and steady look." It was only a natural instinct. Any woman would have done just the same. We all feel the sanctity of our sex as a high privilege when we see danger. I ought rather, said she, hastily, to apologize to you for having said thoughtless words which sent you down into the danger. It was not your words. It was the truth they conveyed, pungently as it was expressed. But you shall not drive me off upon that and so escape the expression of my deep gratitude, my— He was on the verge now. He would not speak in the haste of his hot passion. He would weigh each word. He would, and his will was triumphant. He stopped in mid-career. I do not try to escape from anything, said she. I simply say that you owe me no gratitude, and I may add that any expression of it would be painful to me because I do not feel that I deserve it. Still, if it will relieve you from even a fancied obligation, speak on. I do not want to be relieved from any obligation, said he, 
goaded by her calm manner, fancied or not fancied. I question not myself to know which. I choose to believe that I owe my very life to you. I, smile, and think it an exaggeration, if you will. I believe it, because it adds a value to that life to think. Oh, Miss Hale, continued he, lowering his voice to such a tender intensity of passion that she shivered and trembled before him. To think circumstances so wrought, that whenever I exult in existence henceforward, I may say to myself, all this gladness in life, all honest pride in doing my work in the world, all this keen sense of being, I owe to her. And it doubles the gladness, it makes the pride glow, it sharpens the sense of existence, till I hardly know if it is pain or pleasure, to think that I owe it to one. Nay, you must, you shall hear, said he, stepping forward with stern determination. To one whom I love, as I do not believe man ever loved woman before. He held her hand tight in his. He panted as he listened for what should come. He threw the hand away with indignation as he heard her icy tone, for icy it was, though the words came faltering out, as if she knew not where to find them. Your way of speaking shocks me. It is blasphemous. I cannot help it, if that is my first feeling. It might not be so, I dare say, if I understood the kind of feeling you describe. I do not want to vex you, and besides, we must speak gently, for Mamma is asleep. But your whole manner offends me. How? exclaimed he offends you. I am indeed most unfortunate. Yes, said she, with recovered dignity, I do feel offended, and, I think, justly. You seem to fancy that my conduct of yesterday— Again the deep carnation blush, but this time with eyes kindling with indignation rather than shame, was a personal act between you and me, and that you may come and thank me for it, instead of perceiving, as a gentleman would. Yes, a gentleman, she repeated, in allusion to their former conversation about that word, that any woman, worthy of the name of woman, would come forward to shield, with her reverenced helplessness, a man in danger from the violence of numbers. And the gentleman thus rescued is forbidden the relief of thanks, he broke in, contemptuously. I am a man. I claim the right of expressing my feelings. And I yielded to the right, simply saying that you gave me pain by insisting upon it, she replied, proudly. But you seem to have imagined that I was not merely guided by womanly instinct, but, and here the passionate tears, kept down for long, struggled with vehemently, came into her eyes, and choked her voice but that I was prompted by some particular feeling for you. You! Why, there is not a man, not a poor desperate man in all that crowd, for whom I had not more sympathy, for whom I should not have done what little I could more heartily. You may speak on, Miss Hale. I am aware of all these misplaced sympathies of yours. I now believe that it was only your innate sense of oppression Yes, I, though a master, may be oppressed, that made you act so nobly as you did. I know you despise me. Allow me to say, it is because you do not understand me. I do not care to understand, she replied, taking hold of the table to steady herself, for she thought him cruel, as, indeed, he was, and she was weak with her indignation. No, I see you do not. You are unfair and unjust. Margaret compressed her lips. She would not speak in answer to such accusations. But, for all that, for all his savage words, he could have thrown himself at her feet and kissed the hem of her garment. 
she did not speak she did not move the tears of wounded pride fell hot and fast he waited a while longing for her to say something even a taunt to which he might reply but she was silent he took up his hat one word more you look as if you thought it tainted you to be loved by me you cannot avoid it nay i if i would cannot cleanse you from it but i would not if i could i have never loved any woman before my life has been too busy my thoughts too much absorbed with other things now i love and will love but do not be afraid of too much expression on my part i am not afraid she replied lifting herself straight up no one yet has ever dared to be impertinent to me and no one ever shall but mr thornton you have been very kind to my father said she changing her whole tone and bearing to a most womanly softness do not let us go on making each other angry pray don't he took no notice of her words he occupied himself in smoothing the nap of his hat with his coat sleeve for half a minute or so and then rejecting her offered hand and making as if he did not see her grave look of regret he turned abruptly away and left the room margaret caught one glance at his face before he went when he was gone she thought she had seen the gleam of unshed tears in his eyes and that turned her proud dislike into something different and kinder if nearly as painful self-reproach for having caused such mortification to any one but how could i help it asked she of herself i never liked him i was civil but i took no trouble to conceal my indifference indeed i never thought about myself or him so my manners must have shown the truth all that yesterday he might mistake but that is his fault not mine i would do it again if need were though it does lead me into all this shame and trouble end of chapter twenty four chapter twenty five of north and south by elizabeth gaskell this librivox recording is in the public domain read by marianne chapter twenty five frederick revenge may have her own roused discipline aloud proclaims their cause and injured navies urge their broken laws byron margaret began to wonder whether all offers were as unexpected beforehand as distressing at the time of their occurrence as the two she had had an involuntary comparison between mr lennox and mr thornton arose in her mind she had been sorry that an expression of any other feeling than friendship had been lured out by circumstances from henry lennox that regret was the predominant feeling on the first occasion of her receiving a proposal she had not felt so stunned so impressed as she did now when echoes of mr thornton's voice yet lingered about the room in lennox's case he seemed for a moment to have slid over the boundary between friendship and love and the instant afterwards to regret it nearly as much as she did although for different reasons in mr thornton's case as far as margaret knew there was no intervening stage of friendship their intercourse had been one continued series of opposition their opinions clashed and indeed she had never perceived that he had cared for her opinions as belonging to her the individual as far as they defied his rock-like power of character his passion strength he seemed to throw them off from him with contempt until she felt the weariness of the exertion of making useless protests and now he had come in this strange wild passionate way to make known his love for although at first it had struck her that his offer was forced and goaded out of him by sharp compassion for the exposure she had made of herself which he like others might misunderstand yet even before he left the room and certainly not five minutes after 
the clear conviction dawned upon her shined bright upon her that he did love her that he had loved her that he would love her and she shrank and shuddered as under the fascination of some great power repugnant to her whole previous life she crept away and hid from his idea but it was of no use to parody a line out of fairfax's tasso his strong idea wandered through her thought she disliked him the more for having mastered her inner will how dared he say that he would love her still even though she shook him off with contempt she wished she had spoken more stronger sharp decisive speeches came thronging into her mind now that it was too late to utter them the deep impression made by the interview was like that of a horror in a dream that will not leave the room although we waken up and rub our eyes and force a stiff rigid smile upon our lips it is there there cowering and gibbering with fixed ghastly eyes in some corner of the chamber listening to hear whether we dare to breathe of its presence to any one and we dare not poor cowards that we are and so she shuddered away from the threat of his enduring love what did he mean had she not the power to daunt him she would see it was more daring than became a man to threaten her so did he ground it upon the miserable yesterday if need were she would do the same to-morrow by a crippled beggar willingly and gladly but by him she would do it just as bravely in spite of his deductions and the cold slime of women's impertinence she did it because it was right and simple and true to save where she could save even try to save face it advienne capora hitherto she had not stirred from where he had left her no outward circumstances had roused her out of the trance of thought in which she had been plunged by his last words and by the look of his deep intent passionate eyes as their flames had made her own fall before them she went to the window and threw it open to dispel the oppression which hung around her then she went and opened the door with a sort of impetuous wish to shake off the recollection of the past hour in the company of others or in active exertion but all was profoundly hushed in the noonday stillness of a house where an invalid catches the unrefreshing sleep that is denied to the night hours margaret would not be alone what should she do go and see bessie higgins of course thought she as the recollection of the message sent the night before flashed into her mind and away she went when she got there she found bessie lying on the settle moved close to the fire though the day was sultry and oppressive she was laid down quite flat as if resting languidly after some paroxysm of pain margaret felt sure she ought to have the greater freedom of breathing which a more sitting posture would procure and without a word she raised her up and so arranged the pillows that bessie was more at ease though very languid i thought i should nay have seen you again said she at last looking wistfully into margaret's face i am afraid you're much worse but i could not have come yesterday my mother was so ill for many reasons said margaret colouring you would may happen to think i went beyond my place in sending mary for you but the wrangling and the loud voices had just torn me to pieces and i thought when father left oh if i could just hear her voice reading me some words of peace and promise i could die away into the silence and rest a god just as a babby is hushed up to sleep by its mother's lullaby shall i read you a chapter now i do may happen i shan't listen to the sense at first it will seem far away but when you come to the words i like to the comforting texts it'll seem close in my ear and going through me as it were margaret began bessie tossed to and fro if by an effort she attended for one moment it seemed as though she were convulsed into double restlessness the next at last she burst out don't go on reading 
it's no use i'm blaspheming all the time in my mind wi thinking angrily on what canna be helped you'd hear the riot may happen yesterday at marlborough mills thornton's factory you know your father was there was he said margaret colouring deep not he he'd ha' given his right hand if it had never come to pass it's that that's frettin me he's fairly knocked down in his mind by it it's no use tellin him fools will always break out of bounds you never saw a man so downhearted as he is but why asked margaret i don't understand why you see he's a committee man on this special strike the union appointed him because though i say it as i shouldn't say it he's reckoned a deep chap and true to the backbone and he and t'other committee men laid down their plans they were to hold together through thick and thin what the major part thought to others were to think whether they would or no and above all there was to be no going again the law of the land folk would go with them if they saw them striving and starving with dumb patience but if there was once any noise of fighting and struggling even with knobsticks hole was up as they knew by the experience of many and many a time before they would try and get speed to the knobsticks and coax em and reason with em and m'appen warn em off but whatever came the committee charged all members of the union to lie down and die if need were without striking a blow and then they reckoned they were sure a carrying the public with them and besides all that the committee knew they were right in their demand and they didn't want to have right all mixed up with wrong till folks can't separate it no more nor i can the physic powder from the jelly you gave me to mix it in jelly is the biggest but powder tastes it all through well i've told you at length about this and but i'm tired out you just think for yourself what it mun be for father to have a his work undone and by such a fool as boucher who must needs go right again the orders of the committee and ruin the strike just as bad as if he meant to be a judas hey but father gived it him last night he went so far as to say he'd go and tell police where they might find the ringleader o the riot he'd give him up to the mill owners to do what they would with him he'd show the world that the real leaders of the strike were not such as boucher but steady thoughtful men good hands and good citizens who were friendly to law and judgment and would uphold order who only wanted their right wage and wouldn't work even though they starved till they got em but who would ne'er injure property or life for dropping her voice they do say that boucher threw a stone at thornton's sister that willie killed her that's not true said margaret it was not boucher that threw the stone she went first red then white you'd be there then were you asked bessie languidly for indeed she had spoken with many pauses as if speech was unusually difficult to her yes never mind go on only it was not boucher that threw the stone but what did he answer your father he did not speak words he were all in such a tremble with spent passion i couldn't bear to look at him i heard his breath come in quick and at one time i thought he were sobbin but when father said he'd give him up to the police he gave a great cry and struck father on the face with his closed fist and be off like lightning father was stunned with the blow at first for all boucher were weak with passion and with clemen he sat down a bit and put his hand afore his eyes and then made for the door i don't know where i got strength but i threw myself off the settle and clung to him father father said i thou'll never go peach on that poor clemmed man i'll never leave go on thee till thou sayest thou wunnot don't be a fool says he words come readier than deeds to most men i never thought o tellin the police on him though by god he deserved it and i shouldn't ha minded if some one else had done the dirty work and got him clapped up but now he has struck in me i could do it less nor ever 
for it would be getting other men to take up my quarrel. But if he ever gets well or this clemen, and is in good condition, he and I'll have an up and down fight, purin and a, and I'll see what I can do for him. And so father shook me off, for indeed I was low and faint enough, and his face was all clay white where it weren't bloody, and turned me sick to look at. And I know not if I slept or waked, or were in a dead swoon, till Mary came in, and I telled her to fetch her to me. And now dunna talk to me, but just read out the chapter. I'm easier in my mind for having spit it out, but I want some thoughts of the world that's far away, to take the weary taste of it out of my mouth. Read me, not a sermon chapter, but a story chapter. They've got pictures in them, which I see when my eyes are shut. Read about the new heavens and the new earth. A map and I'll forget this. Margaret read in her soft, low voice. Though Bessie's eyes were shut, she listened for some time, for the moisture of tears gathered heavy on her eyelashes. At last she slept, with many starts and muttered pleadings. Margaret covered her up and left her, for she had an uneasy consciousness that she might be wanted at home, and yet, until now, it seemed cruel to leave the dying girl. Mrs. Hale was in the drawing-room on her daughter's return. It was one of her better days, and she was full of praises of the water-bed. It had been more like the beds at St. John Beersford's than anything she had slept on since. She did not know how it was, but people seemed to have lost the art of making the same kind of beds as they used to do in her youth. One would think it was easy enough. There was the same kind of feathers to be had, yet somehow— till this last night she did not know when she had had a good sound resting sleep. Mr. Hale suggested that something of the merits of the feather-beds of former days might be attributed to the activity of youth, which gave relish to rest, but this idea was not kindly received by his wife. "'No, indeed, Mr. Hale. It was those beds at Sir John's. Now, Margaret, you're young enough, and go about in the day.' are the beds comfortable? I appeal to you. Do they give you a feeling of perfect repose when you lie down upon them? Or rather, don't you toss about, and try in vain to find an easy position, and waken in the morning as tired as when you went to bed? Margaret laughed. To tell the truth, Mamma, I've never thought about my bed at all, what kind it is. I'm so sleepy at night, that if I only lie down anywhere, I nap off directly, so I don't think I am a competent witness. But then, you know, I never have had the opportunity of trying Sir John Beersford's beds. I was never at Oxenham. Were not you? Oh, no, to be sure. It was poor darling Fred I took with me, I remember. I only went to Oxenham once after I was married, to your Aunt Shaw's wedding, and poor little Fred was the baby then and I know Dixon did not like changing from lady's maid to nurse, and I was afraid that if I took her near her old home, and amongst her own people, she might want to leave me. But poor baby was taken ill at Oxenham, with his teething, and, what with my being a great deal with Anna just before her marriage, and not being very strong myself, Dixon had more of the charge of him than she ever had before, and it made her so fond of him and she was so proud when he would turn away from every one and cling to her, that I don't believe she ever thought of leaving me again, though it was very different from what she'd been accustomed to. Poor Fred! Everybody loved him. He was born with the gift of winning hearts. It makes me think very badly of Captain Reed when I know that he disliked my own dear boy. I think it a certain proof that he had a bad heart. Ha! Huh your poor father, Margaret. He has left the room. He can't bear to hear Fred spoken of. I love to hear about him, Mamma. Tell me all you like. You could never tell me too much. Tell me what he was like as a baby. Why, Margaret, you must not be hurt, but he was much prettier than you were. I remember, when I first saw you in Dixon's arms, I said, Dear, what an ugly little thing! And she said, 
it's not every child that's like master fred bless him dear how well i remember it then i could have had fred in my arms every minute of the day and his cot was close by my bed and now now margaret i don't know where my boy is and sometimes i think i shall never see him again margaret sat down by her mother's sofa on a little stool and softly took hold of her hand caressing it and kissing it as if to comfort mrs hale cried without restraint at last she sat straight stiff up on the sofa and turned round to her daughter she said with tearful almost solemn earnestness margaret if i can get better if god lets me have a chance of recovery it must be through seeing my son frederick once more it will waken up all the poor springs of health left in me she paused and seemed to try and gather strength for something more yet to be said her voice was choked as she went on was quavering as with the contemplation of some strange yet closely present idea and margaret if i am to die if I am one of those appointed to die before many weeks are over, I must see my child first. I cannot think how it must be managed. But I charge you, Margaret, as you yourself hope for comfort in your last illness, to bring him to me that I may bless him. Only for five minutes, Margaret. There could be no danger in five minutes. Oh, Margaret, let me see him before I die. Margaret did not think of anything that might be utterly unreasonable in this speech. We do not look for reason or logic in the passionate entreaties of those who are sick unto death. We are stung with the recollection of a thousand slighted opportunities of fulfilling the wishes of those who will soon pass away from among us, and do they ask us for the future happiness of our lives, we lay it at their feet and will it away from us. But this wish of Mrs. Hale's was so natural, so just, so right to both parties that margaret felt as if on frederick's account as well as on her mother's she ought to overlook all intermediate chances of danger and pledge herself to do everything in her power for its realization the large pleading dilated eyes were fixed upon her wistfully steady in their gaze though the poor white lips quivered like those of a child margaret gently rose up and stood opposite to her frail mother so that she might gather the secure fulfillment of her wish from the calm steadiness of her daughter's face. Mamma, I will write to-night, and tell Frederick what you say. I am as sure that he will come directly to us, as I am sure of my life. Be easy, Mamma. You shall see him as far as anything earthly can be promised. You will write to-night. Oh, Margaret, the post goes out at five. You will write by it, won't you? I have so few hours left. I feel, dear, as if I should not recover, though sometimes your father over-persuades me into hoping. You will write directly, won't you? Don't lose a single post, for just by that very post I may miss him. But, Mamma, Papa is out. Papa is out! And what then? Do you mean that he would deny me this last wish, Margaret? Why, I should not be ill, be dying, if he had not taken me away from Hellstone to this unhealthy, smoky, sunless place. Oh, Mamma, said Margaret. Yes, it is so, indeed. He knows it himself. He has said so many a time. He would do anything for me. You don't mean he would refuse me this last wish, prayer, if you will. And, indeed, Margaret, the longing to see Frederick stands between me and God. I cannot pray till I have this one thing. Indeed, I cannot. Don't lose time, dear, dear Margaret. Write by this very next post. Then he may be here, here in twenty-two days, for he is sure to come. No cords or chains can keep him. In twenty-two days I shall see my boy. She fell back, and for a short time she took no notice of the fact that Margaret sat motionless, 
her hand shading her eyes. "'You are not writing,' said her mother at last. "'Bring me some pens and paper. I will try and write myself.' She sat up, trembling all over with feverish eagerness. Margaret took her hand down and looked at her mother sadly. "'Only wait till Papa comes in. Let us ask him how best to do it.' "'You promised, Margaret, not a quarter of an hour ago. You said he should come.' "'And so he shall, Mamma. "'Don't cry, my own dear mother. I'll write here. Now, you shall see me write, and it shall go by this very post. And if Papa thinks fit, he can write again when he comes in. It's only a day's delay.' Oh, Mamma, don't cry so pitifully. It cuts me to the heart. Mrs. Hale could not stop her tears. They came hysterically, and, in truth, she made no effort to control them, but rather called up all the pictures of the happy past and the probable future, painting the scene when she should lie a corpse, with the son she had longed to see in life weeping over her, and she unconscious of his presence till she was melted by self-pity into a state of sobbing and exhaustion that made Margaret's heart ache. But at last she was calm, and greedily watched her daughter, as she began her letter, wrote it with swift, urgent entreaty, sealed it up hurriedly, for fear her mother should ask to see it, and then, to make security most sure, at Mrs. Hale's own bidding, took it herself to the post-office. She was coming home when her father overtook her. "'And where have you been, my pretty maid?' asked he. "'To the post-office. With a letter. A letter to Frederick. "'Oh, Papa, perhaps I have done wrong. But Mamma was seized with such a passionate yearning to see him. She said it would make her well again. And then she said that she must see him before she died. I cannot tell you how urgent she was. Did I do wrong?' Mr. Hale did not reply at first. Then he said, "'You should have waited till I came in, Margaret.' "'I tried to persuade her.' And then she was silent. "'I don't know,' said Mr. Hale, after a pause. "'She ought to see him if she wishes it so much, for I believe it would do her much more good than all the doctor's medicine, and, perhaps, set her up altogether.' but the danger to him, I'm afraid, is very great. All these years since the mutiny, Papa? Yes. It is necessary, of course, for the government to take very stringent measures for the repression of offences against authority, more particularly in the Navy, where a commanding officer needs to be surrounded in his men's eyes with a vivid consciousness of all the power there is at home to back him, and take up his cause and avenge any injuries offered to him, if need be. Ah, it's no matter to them how far their authorities have tyrannized, galled hasty tempers to madness, or, if that can be any excuse afterwards, it is never allowed for in the first instance. They spare no expense, they send out ships, they scour the seas to lay hold of the offenders. The lapse of years does not wash out the memory of the offence. It is a fresh and vivid crime on the Admiralty's books, until it is blotted out by blood. Oh, Papa, what have I done? And yet it seems so right at the time. I'm sure Frederick himself would run the risk. So he would. So he should. Nay, Margaret, I'm glad it is done, though I durst not have done it myself. I'm thankful it is as it is, I should have hesitated till, perhaps, it might have been too late to do any good. Dear Margaret, you have done what is right about it, and the end is beyond our control. It was all very well, but her father's account of the relentless manner in which mutinies were punished made Margaret shiver and creep. If she had decoyed her brother home to blot out the memory of his heir by his blood— she saw her father's anxiety lay deeper than the source of his later cheering words. She took his arm and walked home pensively and wearily by his side. End of chapter 25
Chapter Twenty Six of North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter Twenty Six, Mother and Son. I have found that holy place of rest still changeless. Mrs. Hemans. When Mr. Thornton had left the house that morning, he was almost blinded by his baffled passion. He was as dizzy as if Margaret, instead of looking and speaking and moving like a tender, graceful woman, had been a sturdy fishwife and given him a sound blow with her fists. He had positive bodily pain, a violent headache, and a throbbing intermittent pulse. He could not bear the noise, the garish light, the continued rumble and movement of the street. He called himself a fool for suffering so, and yet he could not, at the moment, recollect the cause of his suffering, and whether it was adequate to the consequences it had produced. It would have been a relief to him if he could have sat down and cried on a doorstep by a little child who was raging and storming, through his passionate tears, at some injury he had received. He said to himself that he hated Margaret, but a wild, sharp sensation of love cleft his dull, thunderous feeling like lightning, even as he shaped the words expressive of hatred. His greatest comfort was in hugging his torment, and in feeling, as he had indeed said to her, that though she might despise him, contemn him, treat him with her proud sovereign indifference, he did not change one whit. She could not make him change. He loved her, and would love her, and defy her, and all this miserable bodily pain. He stood still for a moment, to make this resolution firm and clear. There was an omnibus passing, going into the country. The conductor thought he was wishing for a place, and stopped near the pavement. It was too much trouble to apologize and explain, so he mounted upon it, and was borne away. Passed long rows of houses, then passed detached villas with trim gardens, till they came to real country hedgerows, and, by and by, to a small country town. Then everybody got down, and so did Mr. Thornton, and because they walked away, he did so too. He went into the fields, walking briskly, because the sharp motion relieved his mind. He could remember all about it now, the pitiful figure he must have cut, the absurd way in which he had gone and done the very thing he had so often agreed with himself in thinking would be the most foolish thing in the world, and had met with exactly the consequences which, in these wise moods, he had always foretold were certain to follow, if he ever did make such a fool of himself. Was he bewitched by those beautiful eyes, that soft, half-open, sighing mouth which lay so close upon his shoulder only yesterday? He could not even shake off the recollection that she had been there, that her arms had been round him, once, if never again. He only caught glimpses of her, he did not understand her altogether. At one time she was so brave, and at another so timid, now so tender, and then so haughty and regal proud, and then he thought over every time he had ever seen her once again, by way of finally forgetting her. He saw her in every dress, in every mood, and did not know which became her best. Even this morning, how magnificent she had looked, her eyes flashing out upon him at the idea that, because she had shared his danger yesterday, she had cared for him the least. If Mr. Thornton was a fool in the morning, as he assured himself at least twenty times he was, he did not grow much wiser in the afternoon. All that he gained in return for his sixpenny omnibus ride was a more vivid conviction that there never was, never could be, any one like Margaret, that she did not love him and never would, but that she, no, nor the whole world, should never hinder him from loving her, and so he returned to the little market-place, and remounted the omnibus to return to Milton. It was late in the afternoon when he was set down, near his warehouse. The accustomed places brought back the accustomed habits and trains of thought. He knew how much he had to do, more than his usual work, owing to the commotion of the day before. He had to see his brother magistrates. He had to complete the arrangements, only half made in the morning, for the comfort and safety of his newly imported Irish hands. He had to secure them from all chance of communication with the discontented workpeople of Milton. Last of all, he had to go home and encounter his mother. 
Mrs. Thornton had sat in the dining-room all day, every moment expecting the news of her son's acceptance by Miss Hale. She had braced herself up many and many a time, at some sudden noise in the house, had caught up the half-dropped work, and begun to ply her needle diligently, though through dimmed spectacles, and with an unsteady hand, and many times the door opened, and some indifferent person entered on some insignificant errand. Then her rigid face unstiffened from its grey, frost-bound expression, and the features dropped into the relaxed look of despondency so unusual to their sternness. She wrenched herself away from the contemplation of all the dreary changes that would be brought about to herself by her son's marriage. She forced her thoughts into the accustomed household grooves. The newly married couple-to-be would need fresh household stocks of linen, and Mrs. Thornton had clothes-basket upon clothes-basket, full of tablecloths and napkins, brought in, and began to reckon up the store. There was some confusion between what was hers, and consequently marked G.H.T. for George and Hannah Thornton, and what was her son's, bought with his money, marked with his initials. Some of those marked G.H.T. were Dutch damask of the old kind, exquisitely fine. None were like them now. Mrs. Thornton stood looking at them long. They had been her pride when she was first married. Then she knit her brows, and pinched and compressed her lips tight, and carefully unpicked the G.H. She went so far as to search for the turkey-red marking thread to put in the new initials, but it was all used, and she had no heart to send for any more just yet. So she looked fixedly at vacancy, a series of visions passing before her, in all of which her son was the principal, the sole object. Her son, her pride, her property. Still he did not come. Doubtless he was with Miss Hale. The new love was displacing her already from her place as first in his heart. A terrible pain, a pang of vain jealousy, shot through her. She hardly knew whether it was more physical or mental, but it forced her to sit down. In a moment she was up again as straight as ever, a grim smile upon her face for the first time that day, ready for the door opening and the rejoicing triumphant one who should never know the sore regret his mother felt at his marriage. In all this there was little thought enough of the future daughter-in-law as an individual. She was to be John's wife. To take Mrs. Thornton's place as mistress of the house was only one of the rich consequences which decked out the supreme glory. All household plenty and comfort, all purple and fine linen, honor, love, obedience, troops of friends, would all come as naturally as jewels on a king's robe, and be as little thought of for their separate value. To be chosen by John would separate a kitchen wench from the rest of the world. And Miss Hale was not so bad. If she had been a Milton lass, Mrs. Thornton would have positively liked her. She was pungent, and had taste, and spirit, and flavor in her. True, she was sadly prejudiced, and very ignorant, but that was to be expected from her southern breeding. A strange sort of mortified comparison of Fanny with her went on in Mrs. Thornton's mind and for once she spoke harshly to her daughter, abused her roundly, and then, as if by way of penance, she took up Henry's commentaries, and tried to fix her attention on it, instead of pursuing the employment she took pride and pleasure in, and continuing her inspection of the table-linen. His step at last. She heard him, even while she thought she was finishing a sentence, while her eye did not pass over it, and her memory could have mechanically repeated it word for word, she heard him come in at the hall door. Her quickened sense could interpret every sound of motion. Now he was at the hat stand, now at the very room door. Why did he pause? Let her know the worst. Yet her head was down over the book. She did not look up. He came close to the table, and stood still there, waiting till she should have finished the paragraph which apparently absorbed her. By an effort she looked up. "'Well, John?' He knew what that little speech meant, but he had steeled himself. He longed to reply with a jest. The bitterness of his heart could have uttered one, but his mother deserved better of him. He came round behind her, so that she could not see his looks, and, bending back her grey, stony face, he kissed it, murmuring, "'No one loves me. 
No one cares for me but you, mother. He turned away and stood leaning his head against the mantelpiece, tears forcing themselves into his manly eyes. She stood up. She tottered. For the first time in her life, the strong woman tottered. She put her hands on his shoulders. She was a tall woman. She looked into his face. She made him look at her. Mother's love is given by God, John. It holds fast for ever and ever. A girl's love is like a puff of smoke. It changes with every wind. And she would not have you, my own lad, would not she? She set her teeth. She showed them like a dog for the whole length of her mouth. He shook his head. I am not fit for her, mother. I knew I was not. She ground out words between closed teeth. He could not hear what she said, but the look in her eyes interpreted it to be a curse. If not as coarsely worded, it fell as intent as ever was uttered. And yet her heart leapt up light to know he was her own again. Mother, said he hurriedly, I cannot hear a word against her. Spare me, spare me. I am very weak in my sore heart. I love her yet. I love her more than ever. And I hate her, said Mrs. Thornton, in a low, fierce voice. I tried not to hate her when she stood between you and me, because, I said to myself, she will make him happy, and I would give my heart's blood to do that. But now I hate her for your misery's sake. Yes, John, it is no use hiding up your aching heart from me. I am the mother that bore you, and your sorrow is my agony. And if you do not hate her, I do. Then, mother, you make me love her more. She is unjustly treated by you, and I must make the balance even. But why do we talk of love or hatred? She does not care for me, and that is enough. Too much. Let us never name the subject again. It is the only thing you can do for me in the matter. Let us never name her. With all my heart, I only wish that she, and all belonging to her, were swept back to the place they came from. He stood still, gazing into the fire for a minute or two longer. Her dry, dim eyes filled with unwanted tears as she looked at him, but she seemed just as grim and quiet as usual when he next spoke. Warrants are out against three men for the conspiracy, mother. The riot yesterday helped to knock up the strike. And Margaret's name was no more mentioned between Mrs. Thornton and her son. They fell back into their usual mode of talk, about facts, not opinions, far less feelings. Their voices and tones were calm and cold. A stranger might have gone away and thought that he had never seen such frigid indifference of demeanour between such near relations. End of chapter 26